And we're live. I actually have four crazy people in one room and myself. So this is going to be quite a feat to have together. The behavioral panel. I'm going to start off with and get everyone to introduce themselves with Scott Rouse, since he's just drinking. Good timing. Hey, I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst. I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. Awesome. Chase Hughes. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes, everybody. I teach interrogation, body language, behavior profiling to government agencies and corporations and people all over, and I'm a trial consultant here in the U.S. Mr. Greg Hartley. Yeah, I'm a former Army interrogator, Army interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written a bunch of books on behavior, and today I work mostly with corporations and Wall Street. And last but not least, with the red shirt, because he had to stand out, Mr. Mark Bowden. <laughs> That is correct. Mark Bowden, expert in human behavior and body language. And I help people all over the world stand out, win trust and gain credibility, including uh, CEOs of Fortune 500, G7 leaders, and other ne'er-do-wells. Now, are you a Star Trek fan, Mark Bowden? No. No, I'm not in that kind of... No, no okay, I mean, so I you don't understand the... the red shirt principle then? No. Does that mean I'm going to get shot? Yes. And Star uh, Trek, the one wearing the red shirt, is always the one who dies. Change. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I am going to jump out right away. You guys have an awesome channel, Behavioral Panel, where, yeah. I mean, you just started. It's growing like weeds. It's crazy. And you have now done body, body language analysis. Is that essentially what you call it? Behavior, body language, yeah. 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 Okay. Starting out with the high brow with Carol Baskin. And then you went a little lower brow with um, Joe Biden, right? Or Tara Reid. And even lower brow lately with Prince Andrew. <laughs> so what is... Oh, wait. Sorry. And then you had somebody, whether they were abducted by aliens. Yeah, that's true, though. That yeah, was that fun. Fun. Okay. So what is it... It dictates who is going to be profiled. I can hop out on that one. I think we yeah. do. We just decide, hey, this looks topical, looks fun. The one with the, with the aliens, we just decided we wanted to do something that was less heavy considering the topics we were covering, and take a break, and show that you can learn body language from just about anywhere. And it gives us a chance to comment on that. Was that uh, essentially a safer topic? I think It was something that we were just going to do to um... – it was only going to be 20 minutes. You know, it was going to be something really short. Yeah. We just had to get on there. It was we just always, too funny to go. always say that. Yeah, we, we, yeah the, the Prince Andrew was going to be 20 minutes, the first one. <laughs> so every time we do something, it ends up being, we just end up talking, you know. So we talk about 30 minutes beforehand, and then uh, about 30 minutes after it's over, and then just edit it down to, I guess, one episode. It's about but, 55 minutes of, of Mark talking, Scott. <laughs> Cut that extra hour off in in, uh, in post editing. Yeah, if, if, if you're if you're paying attention, we don't really care about safe. Though. <laughs> We've not made the best decisions if we're looking for safe. Okay, well, I That's mean, true. I didn't know if you went that direction to have somebody just silly. Like one, I one thing I try to do in uh, my group on Facebook or whatever is if I feel like there's a political tinge or taint or some sort of controversy, I'll try to go for the ridiculous. Because if you follow up heaviness with ridiculousness, it's hard to, you know, it's a moving target type of scenario. Yeah, well, we did do some of that. And I'm sorry to hug the spotlight for a second, but we did do some of that intentionally thinking about let's go do UFOs or Bigfoot or something like that. Because, you, you know, you pretty well can rest assured that most of that's going to be a bunch of it. And we figured we would find somebody who was taking it seriously and took a polygraph and all that. And then we'll go after serious issues at another time. It's just, we need a break right then, right? Okay, and one thing I appreciate about all of you, except maybe Mark, is that you're nerds. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> that's, very, that's very kind of you and, and, and totally inaccurate. <laughs> well, you may be a nerd in a different way because you're kind of like, my favorite part about Mark, every time I interview him, he's like, if I didn't have to do this, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Every time, every time I see him on something, I'm waiting for somebody to intro him. And now, all the way from Toronto, Canada, he's from Britain in real life. Here it comes. Right now, it's Mr. Mark Bowden. 
Thank you. That's what I, that's what it looks like. Every time he comes on, it looks like that just happened and they just cut that out like a TED talk or something. Yeah. <laughs> so I can guess, but who's the guilty party? Who wrangled the four of you into? It was, it was it? Uh, Greg's idea. Really? And that, yeah, yeah, it was Greg's idea. And I, then I sent a little video out to everybody that said, Hey, here's what Greg's thinking. What do y'all think about that? And they're like, yeah, let's do that. So it originally came from, but we had talked about all of us had talked about doing something together before, yeah, yeah. you know, cause Mark had brought it up and then Chase, but Chase was always wanting to do something in video on it. So, yeah, no. but, and then Mark had brought it up, but, but Greg said, Hey man, let's go ahead and see if we can, if we can wrangle everybody up. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do what I can do. So I just did a video and sent it. Actually funny story. Chase is the reason I have a YouTube channel. <laughs> no kidding. Well, tell I'm us about that. that. Yes, because last December you called, or no, it was November of 2019. You called me. I was down in Disney, and you said, "Hey, man, let's get together. We'll, we'll get the cameras and we do a video. We need to do a video." I'm like, "Well, I don't really do a video, man." You're like, "Okay, yeah, but we get the cameras. We're local." And I'm like, "Well, I have an iPhone." And you're like, "Yeah, I have an iPhone too." And we were going to do video. Yeah, and so I said, had let's, "Let's get a bottle of wine. We'll, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll throw, throw an episode down over a bottle of wine." Exactly. And then in December, you wound up getting called to Fort Bragg or whatever. You're like, hey, dude, I, I just can't make it. Yeah. And I thought about it. I'm like, well, I don't really want to travel anywhere right now. What if we could do something like a live stream and, you know, your audience, so you get a chance to talk to them, my audience, I could talk to them. And that was it. So you're the cause of this channel. I'm honored. There's, I mean, <laughs> he must not have watched it. No. <laughs> we, we've always well, wondered why people are shooting at him right now, but that's ah, exactly. <laughs> now we, this is how, this now is how I met Chase, though. This is where I met Chase was through through this podcast because I didn't know yeah. him. I, you know, she, pretty much everybody sort of knows everybody, and I didn't. I never. I never, I didn't know him, and then it ended up he was into Colombo, which I'm into Colombo. Yeah, and remember yeah. on that thing we started talking about, I was like, "Holy smokes, man!" So, yeah, and then Scott and I met for drinks in Nashville. Yeah, yeah, not too long ago. And then you introduced me, and Mark and I worked on. I worked with you, Mark, on the book. So yeah. getting off yeah, the yeah. together has been. Yeah, great. and that's how I first ran into uh, into uh, into Scott. Is that I was, uh, you know, looking for some people to help contribute to Truth and Lies, and mm. Scott came up, and and we had a little chat, and 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 I was going, wow, this guy's like, he's as you say, Eric, you know, this guy's pretty nerdy. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, like, it's like it's like pretty nerdy. So you know, he'd send me all these all these PDFs of documents and studies, and like, oh, okay, and he's like, read this, and I'm like, no way, I want to read that. Last thing I want to do is read anything. <laughs> but you if you've agree. read it, like if you've already read it, I'm I, like, you should help me with this book. So so he was, uh, you know, expert editor on on Truth and Lies and along with Greg contributed. And I didn't know Chase at the time because I think at that time, Chase, you were still in the in the military and you weren't publishing much of, I don't think uh, the manual was out at that at that point. No. Um, so, you know, you were a little more hidden at the time. If, if I'd have known you then, <laughs> Um, you know, I'd have, I'd have had you all over the thing like a like a bad rash. But uh... <laughs> well, you speak about that. Oh, I have an off the wall question. How many of you guys are dyslexic or have ADHD? I'm two for two there. No, oh, okay. Yeah, I. Greg, I'm Greg's finding the alpha, that so he doesn't have either. <laughs> it, it's a weird thing. As <laughs> is that an insult? I've just noticed a lot of people in this field have one or the other. And something about it, especially with the reading difficulty, I think you're you're able to memorize and see more details of the world around you. So it's almost like a superpower. Hmm. And I bring that up because I actually follow your site and somebody had a question on your latest video with Prince Andrew. And I thought it was a fantastic question. It would be good to get you all actually speaking and answering it live. And that one is this. I have a question for you guys. If you're down for answering it, it's a bit of a long one. Actually, let me post it in the comments. Folks, I see some questions coming in, but jump in. Um, whoops, that was mine. I have mine. I'll read it. <laughs> I have a question for you guys, if you're down for answering it. How much of behavioral analysis comes from your formal education and how much comes from natural skill in reading people? I know there's a lot of technical stuff involved, 
But could someone with Asperger's syndrome be able to do well in that kind of field? I, for example, have very little natural instinct when it comes to reading the emotions and behavior of others. So I'm curious as to how that can be done professionally. Oddly enough, I think Greg would be the one to answer this since he's the one that doesn't have um, <laughs> dyslexia. Yeah. yeah. So for me, I had this natural instinct for people. If you want to hit that piece for a second. When I first started interrogating, I, I was afraid to learn any form of body language and it, there's not much out there. So instinctively, I could read people. So for me to come back later and learn the right words and figure out this, I don't even use the right words today. I use very specific words that fit the way I, I train. But I've had people who cannot read other people and who have contacted me from, I can read you like a book or one of the others, for example, and said it was easy for them because when you put it into categories and you can build boxes around it, then it's fairly easy for them to learn it. It's just like learning any other language. And when I teach body language, I say the five components are like verbs, adverbs, prepositions, nouns, and adjectives. If you can remember it that way, you can learn it and you can, you can just follow through. I have a follow-up question with, for you, Greg, and I meant to ask this before in our interview. I noticed you talked about horses and mm -hmm. comparing people to horses and things like that. Um, I always had an affinity with animals and I grew up on a ranch. I'm wondering if you grew up with animals and if being around animals and interacting with them actually helped you to reading the body language because they can't exactly talk to you. Right. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make this pretty quick. I live on a farm. I have horses now. I didn't grow up around horses. I grew up around dogs and that. But horses are better at reading body language than any of us because they don't have a spoken language and because they're prey and this looks like claws to them. So you do notice things from them that you cannot get from people. They notice su subtle movements and that kind of thing. So it does help. It does enhance. You have to pay attention to them and you have to notice pain in them. A horse will use their mouth to show you pain. They'll use their ears to show you pain. They can't speak. So you have to pay attention and horses can die from a stomach ache. They're not the best of creatures to keep as a pet. Well, yeah, definitely. Especially if you feed them. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, now I'm going to pick on Greg a little bit. And one thing that I think is interesting is Greg seems to be the one who really likes eye accessing cues. I feel he like the rest of you may not be on board. Stop talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he talks about. I'm kidding. I so how does it. everybody feel about them? Well, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay with them to the extent that um, as as long as you baseline and you and you ha and you know that not everybody is going to be exactly the same as everybody else. You might you may be able to group some people into into patterns, but there is no universal pattern uh, sure. a, a, around that that will apply to absolutely everyone. As long as you're not going down that route, uh, you're going to probably be accurate enough more than inaccurate, which is every time anybody does. You know, Any. that the over that, you know, it means a specific thing, but that, that's the same for all body language. It's yeah. baseline. I, I agree with you 100%. And I, I'm a baseline or even an eye movement, right? And that's something like if you're watching the broadcast right now, you can try that out. If yeah. you go ask somebody, like Greg did in one of our shows, ask somebody, I don't remember what the question was. What's the fifth word of the pr Pledge of Allegiance? Mm -hmm. You'll see everybody's eyes move a different direction. Then you ask them, <laughs> Uh, a, a geographical question, like what is across the street from your parents' house? What color is the house across the street from your parents' house? And and you'll see them move a different direction. But everybody is a little bit different. But when we're recalling memories, we tend to have something that I refer to as home. So we'll look a certain direction regularly to recall memories, but everybody is different. Yeah. And if you just want to use it as a tool, answer the a question. Think of your favorite song and think of four words from your favorite song as you're listening to us and you'll watch your eyes drifting around your head. You're, you're trying to recall information and all a good body language person is doing is asking that question, looking for where you normally go for something that you were recalling and then looking for deviation. That's it. When, when I first started, I learned about uh, eye accessing when I first started hearing about it. And then I met Greg and I, and I read all his books. You know, I was reading his books and I was apoplectic when it came to, um, when it came to that, because I couldn't find any studies that showed that was true. I couldn't find anything that said, yeah, this is what's happening. I found the NLP stuff and it's like, yeah, yeah. And all that. Uh, well, not necessarily, but no, the, I didn't know if thing, you were relating it to the Moravian thing that everybody got wrong too. Oh no, 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 
We'll talk about that too. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. But <laughs> the whole thing where you always look one place for, for stuff. And then Greg said, no, most people will do that. You know, what we're getting is the anecdotal evidence uh, of those things. So I, I, I didn't capitulate to, to yeah, that, that's what happens every time. Or that's where they all are the time. But explain to me by taking me out in the hall and showing me by asking two or three people questions. Because we got in discussion with it. We were doing our, our course, you know, Body Language Tactics. And he said, and I said, I'm not so sure. I, I'm just not with you on that. I don't, I can't find the research on that. And I can't find anything that says it's true. There's a study called the eyes don't have it. And that, that was the, my end all for this is, this shows that that isn't true. But what, but what we do know is you do access us, uh, like Chase was saying, you have a home, you go, you go home. Mine's always over this way for most everything for music. It's down this way, you know? So, but that, that's me. Other people will go up and up and around and all those things. So you got to figure out where theirs are by the baseline, like Mark was saying. And the, the thing that, that Greg lives by is once you get a baseline, you understand where they're looking, how things are going, then you can start basing off that. And up to that point, I, I, I wasn't into that at all. And I'm still iffy on it when it comes to um, accessing the same things every time. I know, I know if, if I'm talking to somebody, they're always bang, bang, bang. Then I ask them something else in a question like that. And they go, you know, and they look over that or their eyes kick up for a minute. Then I know something's different. That yeah, you got to remember as well that, that this this stuff first taught by by Bandler. Bandler's a, a total charismatic, and so people would come out of working with Bandler, and they'd go, "Yeah, no, it totally works." You know, you look up there, and that, and that, and it's like, "Oh yeah, you just spent three days with Bandler, didn't you?" I mean, yeah. he, you'll do you're in a trance state now with Bandler. If if you didn't do that before, you're doing that now because Bandler told you to do that. And my experience of that was. Uh, with Bandler is is that everything just took too long. And I would think to myself, look, the person I'm having a conversation with will have left by the time I've tried to work out what their eye, eye accessing cues were. So for me, and you know, it, for, as a as a young kid, you know, not not being able to interrogate people and hold them in a room for 48 hours, I needed stuff that wasn't that tricky in order to work out what are people thinking and feeling and what might I do in return in order to engage with them better? Because all I was ever interested in is how can I get on with people a little bit better? Okay. You actually have the same thing as uh, Henrik Fexius, who I've had. He became a magician because he wanted to get on with people better. And perfect yeah. thing to, from the audience, tip one, if they can't it's see your not, usually not a, It's usually not a good route, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got to bring in questions from the audience here. Um, Julia Shaw says, tip one, if they can't see your red socks, then wear a red shirt. And I've seen, uh, Mark, you have the red socks? No, no, no socks. <laughs> you don't no want to no see socks. that part. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, and, uh, no fall. socks today. You know why? I mean, I would do normally when I when I when I you know put on my stuff uh, being on video now, which is most of my life at the at the moment. I'm fully in whatever you'd see me in if I was doing a keynote. But I was talking to the guys uh, earlier, and they're going, "Oh, you know, Eric's you know, casual." Usually, these are pretty casual, and I'm like, "Why don't you wear my my jacket and my <laughs> and my." So like, okay, no, I'll, I'll I'll join in. So no socks. I mean, this is me. This is me. How I normally am. Mark, uh, Greg, Scott, and I were all going to put on suits after you agreed to wear a t-shirt. <laughs> oh, that would have been great. <laughs> we decided not to. Speaking of which, uh, while I've got Mark, and we got the next uh, comment. Somebody's very disappointed with you, Gavin Stone. He wanted to know. You said you were going to do this nude. We lied. <laughs> we lied. We lied. Now, Sorry, personally. Yeah. Only one of you has publicly performed nude. Yes, on, on a number of occasions, <laughs> not just the one. Yeah, I'm I, um, the first, the first big. Um, uh, so I was an actor for, for for many many years. So you know uh, that came from my obsession with uh, visual theatre and visual images, and so I got really stuck in. For, good, in a good way, in this area of how do you tell stories with pictures and how do you influence and persuade with moving pictures. Uh, had a huge amount of success around that. And then uh, this kind of standard shows uh, and, and film and TV would, would want some of what we were doing in that world. And so the first kind of really, really big show I had was Six Degrees of Separation in the West End with Stockard Channing. And uh, I was naked for the whole time in the West okay, End for out, about I'm a year. Hold 
<laughs> oh, good. That makes my logo look nice. You can keep that up, Scott. Thanks. <laughs> Definitely a stronger watermark. Gavin, All that's right. just one note. You, you just need to remember not to trust people who interrogate. <laughs> hey, oh. Eric, there was a part of that question. Somebody asked about how much was it due to formal training and your college experience. Mm -hmm. I think everybody here will agree. It's zero percent. That's right. They don't that's teach right. that stuff in college. So none of that is formal college education. In, in fact, the best part of our panel is that each of us come at this from a different angle because we came from different lives. I was a military guy and then a corporate guy. Um, Scott's a music guy and then this. Chase has been a military guy and then all the hypnosis and stuff with that. And then the mark with the acting and this. This creates a different background than you would have if there were a school that you just walked out of and knew everything. What what are the um, strengths that you see in your peers, Greg? Yeah, I think every person, if, if Chase is the best academic guy I know, I, I called him the first time we did the show and said, I love the fact that he cites studies and he's got the details and that piece. Um, I, I will tell you that mine is more broad and you know, I've read studies. I don't remember every study I read. I'm just not wired that way. And it's a beautiful thing that Chase can cite and get to the point and very meticulously detailed in his analysis. Scott has a broad understanding of people from many different worlds, probably has as much exposure to people as anybody and brings a different look. Mark has this big people, this how the world works. And this means this, and this means this, and how it all ties together. Doing the Prince Andrew thing, for example, having Mark on there is fantastic. Talk about British culture and the royal family and all that. All of us have just different skill sets, and I think it, they're complementary. Yeah, and to, to that point of, of, of you know, the dys dyslexia piece, that's just how my brain works as a dyslexic. I've got all this stuff in my head, and it's dotted around, like there's images, pictures all over the place, and they connect up in, in ways that just kind of happen in front of me. And so I just kind of communicate the connections that I'm seeing between stuff that that what I under, understand from talking with people is other people don't see those connections. You, you got somebody like Chase who just, you know, he's, he's there and he goes, you know, I, I have I have uh, monitored the heart rate of the prince. Uh, based I counted, on the, I it's, the like, it's like, you've done what? <laughs> <laughs> and I can just see him there, you know. Counting. You know, just counting beautiful the thing. Thing. It's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. At that point, you just want to go, I just love that. I love that you will that you'll do that. Because because I'm just I'm not gonna do that. You know, I'm gonna do what I do, and and it's it's either gonna be helpful or not. And Chase is gonna do what he does, and it's gonna be helpful or or, or not. And it's just that brilliant diversity of thought which keeps everybody honest and on their toes. But also, um, because, you know, on the whole, we'll have probably read some of the same work. I mean, you know, sure. you, you'd have to. But I know there's experience and books that I have. That there's just no way the other guys have had access to. And I know it's the same for me. There's experience and work that they've had access to. There's just no way that I would know about that. And so you put the four of us together and, you, and, and you've certainly got something uh, quite powerful and 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 entertaining, hope, hopefully, and hopefully engages people, and they go, oh, I I really want to know more about about people. I would say, you know, not so much body language. That's a good entry point. It's more about I want to understand people even better. Why we're picking on Chase? I have to point this out. It's so funny because it, it leads into the cubic feet of research that I think yeah. just about. But um, <laughs> yeah. this is Chase Hughes, okay. I brought up this book. I, I went and dug it out. It's G.H. Estabrooks, okay? It's a hard yeah. to find book. Yeah. And Ch I showed it to Chase, he goes, what? I don't care about that. I went and got his direct research. <laughs> I went to his house. <laughs> right, and then how many cubic feet of research? That's how he describes his research is like, no, you know, we would say uh, X number of papers. He says cubic feet. <laughs> <laughs> you'll never, you'll never live that down, will you? Yeah. That'll, that's going to, that's going on your, you know, on your headstone. He yeah. measured research in cubic feet. In cubic feet. Yeah, I, I could see Chase getting a restraining order at some point. <laughs> <laughs> what I love though is when I met Scott and had Scott on. Scott was like the obsessive researcher, et cetera, especially with his partnership with Greg. And I said, 
oh, I got to introduce you to Chase. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then, then we, we emailed, we emailed a few times and then when was it? I was, I was like one o'clock in the morning, my FaceTime thing went off. What the fuck? What the hell? Excuse me. What the heck is this? And it was, it was Chase <laughs> FaceTiming me. And he's, I'm laying there in the bed. And he's saying, there was, what are you doing? I was, I'm sleep. Probably <laughs> oh, fairly soon. Do you say it at least sexually? We were both. What are you doing? Bed. How are you doing? We were both what? I think we were both in bed. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I was laying there in bed. I was like, what the heck is this? And Everett's like, I don't know. I was like, what's up, can, can we put their hey, windows guys, together so like and get a room? <laughs> don't do that to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, if that starts so, happening with me, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm check- out. I'm out. Like, <laughs> you know, love you, mean it. <laughs> I told you to look at your app. Don't forget I told you to look at your text. So just get it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, anyway. Mark. <laughs> You're funny. you're with uh, three different interrogators. We talked about how your your end is actually really different, especially because of the acting side and things like that. Um, these three have <laughs> all dealt with. Uh, <laughs> what am I missing? <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> I, I can't read anything because there could be something going on behind the scenes. You never know with this much. I was pulling, I was pulling out Mark's uh, favorite book. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you, got, you got a good copy there. That is yeah, there we go. It's is that a paper book? Ah, yeah. 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 That's a signed? that's a that's a rare copy to get. Is it? I yeah. think so. Yeah, the, big... the publishing date on that. <laughs> I what's, what's the pub- yeah, yeah, publishing date? We are going to nerd on you. Uh, here we go. Yeah. Hang this on, is, let me this get... is this is Triad Grande. So this is the English edition, and this would be like nineteen. Hang on a second. I've got this is 1977. Mine. What's your... Hold on. We're burning Jesus. your air looking at books, but <laughs> yeah, well, figures. Chase, we were are. you even born in 77? Nope. <laughs> oh, good lord. <laughs> I, mean, I think I have one of the first editions. I gotta go look. The hardbound. Yeah. You got the hardbound. I See, wow. I got this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You got, and you I got, got... it's a piece of <laughs> It's that's a piece apart. of junk. It's Remember, a piece of yeah, junk. Stuff's coming look at out. The of size it. Of the, look at the size of the pictures in this. That's what's great about it. That's what I, I love about it. Mine. Pictures are so good. I, I thought the hell that is. the army, and I used to force guys to read this to make them uncomfortable. Man watching. <laughs> <laughs> just make them hold it. See, they don't have to read that. it. Just make them hold it up. Look, see, it's this thick, but you can't, but it's just like I love the book. I love it. But I can't find the big, I can't find the big. Yeah, we gotta get we gotta get you a, a, a good copy. Yeah, All right. Well, yeah, well we've got, got, got that. First copy. Robert McLean really likes the depth you guys go into, like right now. <laughs> well, Robert's that kind of guy. Robert's <laughs> always like, talking about that. Like, what's the Robert, publishing day? We can't help it, is the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No <laughs> yeah, Robert's all the time talking about that, though. That's why he's Robert's all the time saying that stuff. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh is he now? That's Mr. Mr. McLean's kid. Oh, well, there you go. Nobody's and we got me. Gavin Stone, and I'm burying a couple of you. <laughs> So do you find there are any certain behavior traits that are more common among particular demographics? For example, rich people tend to do X more than poor or English people do this more than U.S. guys. And he's English. So, you know, he already knows about you. Yeah. Mr. Bowden. Uh, Yeah. So so um, well, certainly. Well, Gavin will know from from uh, English society. There are there are um, certain signals that you might be able to give that would allow somebody to know immediately, consciously or unconsciously, what class you're in, uh, what economic bracket, w- where you're from in the country, what school you went to. Uh, you know, I can usually tell exactly what part of London somebody might be from. So there's all kinds of nonverbal cues that will allow us to understand somebody's values, beliefs, rituals, customs, goals, concerns, uh, and those can be consciously or unconsciously um, uh, delivered. However, the same signals don't mean the same thing in every culture. Like, you know, if you've got four stars uh, in the in the Marine Corps, it's not the same as having four stars at McDonald's, but it's still four stars. <laughs> right. it's, like, it's still four stars. But if you show up at McDonald's and, like, you know, start saluting, they'll think you're weird. Same as if you head down to the Marine Corps barracks and, and ask for a Big Mac. It's not going to, like, it's... You, you you read the signal, but you didn't understand the meaning of the signal. 
Well, and that's a definition of culture. The very definition of culture is controlling how you communicate that. I mean, uh, when I lived in Korea, I can still remember a, an NCO getting into an argument, this officer coming over and scolding him, and his body language went stiff, arms by side, lack of eye contact. In the Middle East, eye contact is overdone. So culture plays into that, and culture changes the way we would normally use our hands and our bodies and that kind of thing. That's the definition of culture. Culture or otherwise, um, is there a particular person or type of person that you find nearly impossible to read or very difficult or challenging? So Chase. my <laughs> autistics are tough. Harder, harder. So yeah. I, when, when, when I taught, I taught for um, some of the lettered agencies and they hired this young woman, Chinese national, right, you know, as a child came over from China really brilliant young lady. I taught her body language for eight hours and then could not read her body language. That was the most impressive thing I've ever seen. What happened? She just, what, she, what, 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 I mean, did she just get flat and give no, nothing, no language? Nothing. None at all. Stoic. It was incredible. Well, well, Chase, that's where you would come in, right? Because there's like the eye tracking tools that it's hard to hide a pupil dilation if I'm correct. Right. Yeah. There's a company out there right now called Converis who has a system that I think is, in my opinion, is one of the most accurate uh, readers in the world. And that's I, I agree with uh, Scott, Greg, that people who are on the spectrum tend to display less emotional indicators on their face and, and their bodies. It does make it a little more difficult. So you really if you're talking to somebody who is on the spectrum, you've got to drill down to pronoun usage, word choice. Uh, chronology of, of what they're saying to, to mm -hmm. really determine uh, what's going on. Yeah, that's where I go with that for sure is, is, is um, my experience of working with people on the, on, on the spectrum, uh, especially in business, because I work with a whole bunch of people who are running some quite large organizations who are uh, neurally diverse. And, uh, you, you know, in some cases I'll look at them and go, I, I you know, I'm looking at you now and I don't, truly understand what you feel about me, whether you love me or hate me, or I just, I don't get it right now. And they will be on it. They will be brutally honest with you linguistically as to exactly what they're thinking and feeling, but you have hmm. to ask them. And when you ask them, they'll just tell you in a brutally honest way, which is often why they need a lot of handlers around them because, because linguistically they can be quite antisocial linguistically. Um, uh, Non-verbally, they're not uh, delivering a great deal of information. I think the jury is still relatively out as to why that might be. There's what, you know, some people go, you know, they don't have the right connections in the brain. Some people go, they have too many of those and they're compensating and suppressing that. I don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is if you're talking about reading, if you're talking about can you get to know somebody who's on the spectrum, yeah, you absolutely can, but it but they can be tough to be around. And so often you don't want to get to know them because they're they're socially tough to be around. Um but so but then at the same time sometimes you know great fun because <laughs> of how brutal they can they can be. Okay, now while I have you, and this is not by any means an implication with Spectrum or otherwise, it's just um, a character who has a lot of movements and I think is difficult to read for a lot of people or maybe is often misinterpreted. I shared them with you um, guys before and beforehand, and I want to play a clip and see if we can um, explore. And essentially it is uh, Bill Gates who's under fire a little bit lately. I don't know if people are, are just misinterpreting him or, or what, but he is a controversial figure. I'm not getting any sound. Are you guys getting sound? Did you yeah, check I your can, apps? I can see just fine, but I can't hear. Oh, yeah. Did you, did okay, you check yeah. your text? Chase, check your text. Okay. Yeah, so... He's right. judging, he, he, you know, he is illustrating doing everything everyone else does. The thing you have to remember with Bill Gates and Donald Trump and these people who are in, 
what I call super typical roles. They're off to the right. They are the, the alpha. And it might not be what you traditionally think of as alpha, but they are the super typical in their organization. They get away with a lot that you normally would not see in terms of body language because no one around them is going to say, hey, you look goofy. Don't do that. They're not. <laughs> so they get away with it and people start to emulate and then they're insulated, progressively insulated, and they get away with a lot of strange body language. You can see it in a lot of these guys. They are different. It's just who they are. Yeah. Chase. For sure. You, you actually, we, we talked about it beforehand and, um, you know, off, off screen, you were kind of like, well, he's sort of boring and yeah. I don't think there's a, a lot there. Do you want to go into what your thoughts are on the, uh, on the subject? Yeah. As he's a brilliant guy. And I think when God or the universe gives you an IQ that high, that something else gets taken away just a little bit. And it's true with everybody who was a brilliant genius in our time. There's maybe not taken away, but they're, they think differently. They view the world differently. And that's one of the reasons he's never had like a killer speech. He's never, he's just kind of a boring guy, but the, the what we're seeing here with this analysis, the eye contact, his eyebrows are going up with the eyebrow flash. This is what some might call masking. But a lot of this behavior is coached from a professional. This is professional coaching, and he can afford that. Okay. You see it in CEOs all the time, even that are not Bill Gates. They've got a communications department. They've got a legal department. They're going to get some coaching. Right? Oh, yeah. Mark, I had a, another piece, and, and you had some thoughts on it. Um, what? Uh, let me see. This is very disappointing that the sound isn't going through for you guys. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on Gates and coaching? I know you had mentioned a couple things that were interesting, and I will be borrowing this later and cobbling it together. Yeah, so the, the, that video that we were just watching there, I mean, I think the one thing that is notable for me is that you see him, you know, leaning back and quite tight, tight in. You also see it in that other video that you showed us where he's a bit more demonstrative because he's been coached to go into what I call third circle and, and lock out his arms to fill the fill the space. Uh, but then he'll lean back and he'll get quite tight. But that that's a behavior that I see consistently in, um, in a certain neural type that I often see running uh, tech or, or running portfolios. I see that a lot in some of the top portfolio managers that I work with. Uh, and, and they're definitely uh, uh, neurally diverse. And you see them lean back and get really tight. And, and most people looking at them will go, oh, gosh, they're super nervous. Like There's something going on there. No, they're just thinking. And they're thinking in a way that maybe you and I don't think some of some of the time and I think Chase is right you know it, well I mean totally accurate actually we only get delivered a certain number of of neurons mm -hmm. and and so if you're going to use your neural capacity in some area it means you don't have any for another and that can cause some uh some interesting behaviors that and just being look he's a tech titan Remember, there's a certain, there's a reason why we call them tech titans. It's the titans even go up against the gods. We, we, we're giving them a, a metaphor there, whereas they, they battle the gods. So, of course, as a titan, he'll have very different behaviors than, than, than you and I some of the time. Scott, I wanted to roll to you on this, too, because you've been around the music world. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a very different personality types that are in there. You also helped a lot of entrepreneurs with their pitches. So I guess there's a crossover. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe the personalities there, let's say, versus what we see here? Uh, the, in the music business, personalities vary. You'll have the shy artist type. Then you have the really um, outgoing type personality which gets along with everybody. Everybody loves them. Those types, Ricky Skaggs, for example, everybody loves the guy. He's a wonderful guy. You, you can't meet him and not, not talk about him every Thanksgiving from then on. He's one of those guys. Whereas Alison Krauss would be one of the, the kinds that are, that isn't um, as she's friendly and, and, and lovable as she can be, but she's not going to be one of those types to, to be out and being, Hey, let's all, you know, where, and on and on and on some of them you have the artist who is a little it's all about them it's the narcissist they take the narcissistic road for some reason and it's all about them 
you know, and I've, I've worked with all kinds of them, you know, everything from the, from the shy artists to the, to, you know, to really high end, you know, artists. And it's, <laughs> it's, that. uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's one of those things where the, the personalities vary greatly, but then you have styles. Cause you always hear, Oh, he's a bass player. You know, so you get a pretty good idea what the bass player. Oh, he's a drummer. You get a pretty good idea what the, what's the drummer. For example, if we were a band, what would we be doing here? Mark would be the singer. Uh, then Chase would be the drummer. Greg would definitely be like one of the songwriters and and the um, and and but but he'd be more directing. He'd be in the band, but he'd be more direct. So he'd probably be the bass player. We're having problems with Greg. Greg, you need to change up. A I would be. Bit. We just don't know player. where to place you. No, no, because he's sort of the alpha the whole thing. <laughs> so it's like he would he would always be like the the manager. Yeah, there <laughs> you know, go. He's the a band manager. manager. So, but but still, so he what would are you, be Scott? in. You know what I mean? I'd be the guitar player. You know, guitar player, not the bass yes, player, yes. not holding no. down the bottom and tying the rhythm. No, no, no. I'm Scott, Scott's guitar a player. very social guy, so not going to be the bass player at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but then you have like Bootsy Collins, who's like as social as you can get. Is that right? Bass player. Oh, There's yeah, a bass player. Him. Well, well, yeah. they broke the mold when they when yeah. when Bootsy came along. Yeah, but yeah. he's a funk yeah. bass player too. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's, that, yeah. That's almost a lead instrument. In his because, case, it is. Yeah, it is. And what a sweetheart, man. And he's, uh, I used to write him letters every day when I was in high school and junior high. I'd, I'd write him letters. <laughs> you know, he and, and Roger Troutman from Zap. I never How heard did you meet him? <laughs> I did a record with him. You know, I was a producer for a long time. I did a record with him in so, high school. Uh, no, 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 no. This is uh, I like love it. Yeah, yes, and cows then, with Bootsy Collins. What a Scott is about stories because of that music background. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then and he and I reconnected a few years ago. You know, so a buddy of my cop said Bootsy's going to be in town. He's going to be at the studio. You ought to come down. They came down. And we so we connected again. And uh, but yeah, so that's how I met him. Was 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 through was through that through Warner Brothers. When I was uh, working there, so see, great. See, Mark, Mark and Scott have those really cool places where you meet famous people. Chase and I, we can't even tell you who we met, and they don't yeah. remember us and don't like us. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Chase asked you, he uses me to get on video, so <laughs> it tells you this. That's right. All right, so we need to start answering some audience questions. This is Jade Simpson Simpson. Hello, gentlemen. This is Cynthia J. Simpson here. As you baseline, how long do you spend establishing that, assuming you are studying a relatively ordinary person? Greg? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm obsessed with the baseline. It's pretty quick. I ask simple questions, just talk to you, listen to your normal. I'm listening to cadence. I'm listening to choice of words, tone, pitch, all of that. And I'm listening. I mean, look, this is <laughs> my number one feature. So I listen as much as I look, but I'm also paying attention to your eyes, learning where you go. It takes just a few minutes. It doesn't take long to get a fairly good baseline. You hear something rushed in cadence, that's an indicator. If you hear something slow in cadence, it's an indicator. If you look at people as a, a whole message, words, body language, cadence, pitch, and tone, it's not hard. It just takes a few minutes. You can uh, Greg, has, Greg minutes. has a very specific uh, line of things he goes down. When he, he does it at the Waffle House. He'll be sitting yep. there. He'll talk to the waitress and go. He'll go. I'll find out. So, and there's a good tick, 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 tick. And he'll tell me where she's gonna eye at, where she's gonna access. I'm like, well, yeah, you're right, you're right. Every time, just nails it. But he has this setup, which we all have our own our own setups when we're when we're doing stuff. But he has these specific set of questions that he asks. And it's the same ones every time, you know. And just like, but you feel, and I'm like, yeah, and I'm I'm not even paying attention, you know. That's how smooth it is when it comes in like that. Of course, you know, you're at a Waffle House and she, she, she's not expecting it usually, I wouldn't think. But it's but I think we each have our own our own ways to to approach that, you know. And let me just say for Cynthia that, that the phase of baselining and the phase of doing something else is not two separate things where there's a cutoff. Great catch. Right. So we're, that's the whole time. It's not like I spend a few minutes and then I start reading behavior. We start reading behavior from the very beginning. And the baseline evolves over time. I may I may get another data point in the baseline 15 minutes into the conversation when I ask them about uh, a book that they read or a, a, how they like their job. Okay, Mark. Now, one thing about you, Mark, I, I always, and maybe I'm I'm wrong for thinking, but I always think of you as more training people how to project body language, and being 
almost on the other end. While you do read, you seem to be very much in the how you talk to people, how you present yourself, how you act among others. It seems to be your specialty. Would that be a fair? Well, I, I put I put it like this: is that what I'm trying to help people do is influence and persuade, and so nonverbal communication is going to be a big part of that. So, if if I look at what I might do around baselining and influence and persuasion, what I might be doing uh, is is working out if I'm very very social with somebody, how social are they back with me? How are they social? How much do they mirror me? How quickly do they mirror me? Um, how quickly but I would say things like that in my in in most everyday work for me when it comes to the idea of reading other people's body language then Chase that's absolutely right you're baselining all the way along and you're trying to pick up verbal cues uh, uh, alongside the nonverbal cues because I mean, here's a good example in the Prince Andrew piece that we did uh, he does these these foot lifts and some of those yeah, counts them <laughs> well, that's a different thing. That's the bounce. That's the little bounce of the. No, foot. I bet he counts the foot lifts his, too. His, his foot will <laughs> will lift, and and sometimes as as uh, sometimes it's a barrier, and sometimes it's it's positive expectation. It's a hmm. sense of oh, this is going quite well, but you only know that when you put it together with the words that he's using. So you can get a baseline as to what does the foot lift look like when he's using it as a barrier, and what does it look like when he's using it as um, a a signal for himself that this is going well. So there's no point in so so baselining happens all the way through. Are you baselining people in order to help them? Like you know, since you're help. Yeah, like when you meet them, is that one of your baselines? It's like, okay, they tend to be shyer here, do this, do that, or have this personality trait that we can work on. I'd, I'd be baselining them to see how much I can help because they won't pay me to to, to hurt them. Well, so. I, I <laughs> that. I think that's different than the rest. Because you and, really and, and quite honestly, you know, if you're reading body language of the people out there, like I just go, why? Like people send me all kinds of stuff and go, will you will you look at this film and 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 work out what's going on? Why? Why? What's wrong? Well, I want to know if they're if this person's lying. Why? What's up? <laughs> like well, they probably are. Is it that important? Like, because <laughs> that's the interesting thing. Once you put money in it, once you go, will you pay me? You suddenly work out. Whether it's See? important enough. <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> I, I mean, what's great about us getting together, that's what's about great about, is, is, is we're just doing it because we like hanging out yeah. and yeah. we have fun, you know. But otherwise, would I want to sit down and watch, you know, a thing of, of Prince Andrew? No. <laughs> There's much better oh, things to do yeah. in life. Yeah, do it and hang out with these guys. That's really good fun. We're nerdy. We're not that nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> but, get, but, get, but being a nerd and get back to the baseline, it's also how, and Mark just showed the perfect example of that if, if, if whoever's watching this will go back and listen, what happens with Mark is, and one thing that I learned a long time ago, when I first started talking to people, one of the things I do, you always hear, you've got to look and you've got to listen and take everything into context with what's going on around you in that situation. One of my favorite things to do is to listen to the way someone talks. And when Mark, for example, and I'm just bringing this up because he just did it and, and, I, and I caught it. Mark drops his his terminal consonants like on look. He'll say look like, and that's and I don't know if that's British or whatever. But when he gets excited and he gets and he's in the flow of things, he'll start dropping those those uh, consonants that that the, that last consonant on on words like that on the terminal consonant. Greg will do that almost like he sounds like he's from Mississippi. One time we were talking, and I, and I notice that on him sometimes, but only like when you're at your house, Greg. That's when you do it. That's when you you did it the most when when. Uh, we, we were out, out there driving around. That's when you were dropping the most. Well, Chase, you know why? It's the air. I'm in the south. <laughs> that's true. That's true. It's just too it, hot. That's true. <laughs> and Chase is, is, is fairly steady. Chase, Chase's vernacular and, and his diction pretty much stays the same all the time. And all those things tell you one thing for Chase, obviously a psychopath. The other two <laughs> things. <laughs> All right. Well, while we're talking about psychopaths, we have an audience question. <laughs> Robert McLean wants to know, do people with personality disorders such as narcissist or psychopathy um, are able to control their body language or do they give themselves away as much as anybody else? And 
so chase go with scott scott had something ready to go oh no it's my psychopaths are my favorite man narcissists are my favorite when the the, the is that psychopath, the musical <laughs> yeah yeah there's some in there too the psychopath and that and that and that, what i call the clinical narcissist keeping in mind as robert harris says who's he's the michael jackson and elvis of psychopathy Father, he's got a great yeah. Book. yeah yeah you've got yeah, he's got a great book called um um without conscience that's a good that's a good one and the other one is um snakes in boots that's what's the hair with. test well. yeah, yeah. yeah. the guy came up with that yeah i mean the, the psychopath test and um so what you'll see is what they found was with psychopath paths or what i call the clinical narcissist when they would get be put in prison they were trying to re you know to do what do you call it when you re um what's the word greg you re what somebody you re what I'm sorry. I'm rehabilitate. Sorry. Rehabilitate. When you're, they're trying to rehabilitate them, and what they would find out was they were as they were trying to rehabilitate them, all they were doing was showing them how to act normally, because psychopaths don't know how to act normally. When they they don't most of them when they first find out they're psychopaths, they're in their early twenties. They don't even realize they're psychopaths, and once they realize it, they don't realize that's what they are, and it doesn't bother them. They don't. They know something's not right, but they don't know. But it doesn't bother them enough to go check it out because obviously they don't have the the um, equipment to, to worry about that and make them panic. Then go, oh, we gotta, I, I gotta look into this. Something's wrong with me. I gotta, right. I gotta check this out. They, they sort of discover it as they, as they, uh, they go along. There's several different ways they discover it. I'm, it, it take me 20 minutes and I'll get off on a jag there because that's my favorite subject. But, um, but they, they'll try it once they figure out what makes you comfortable and what kind of behaviors you like, then they'll mold to that for that specific person. You know, they'll have their overall things they do because they know humans like these things, like to see these behaviors in general. But then when you start getting down to specific people, then they'll, they'll like we all do in a way, we're all sort of chameleons. These these are these can chameleon right to it, almost like that Terminator guy who's all silver can become the cop and he can become this and that. So they will become that person you want them to become. So they will they'll connect with you or marry you, whatever you want them to do. And then things obviously change from there. But I, I could go on for hours about that. It's my, my favorite. But, but I, I would say the body language piece, I, the, the ones I've dealt with, their body language is no better. They just mirror better. They understand what other people want for some reason. And then they're not empathetic at all if you if you listen to hair. But the folks I've that I've interviewed in my life, their body language was still there. If you look back at Ted Bundy, you'll see he does that glossy thing, that hyper focus where he's paying a lot of attention to you and mirroring more than normal, but it's still the same body language. Scott, you agree with that? Are you seeing yep. something? Yep. I'm totally with you. I'm totally with you. I, I, I saw that as well. Chase, no thoughts on psychopaths. Yeah. So if, if, if we're talking about interrogation or deception here or doing an interview of some sort, you're more likely to catch a psychopath using linguistic methodology than nonverbal. A lot of the nonverbal deception stuff that you read online, there's no body language for deception. It doesn't exist. All we're looking for is stress, which is typically mm -hmm. absent in, in that type of psychology. So if we're just looking for stress and it's not there, we're more likely to catch it using the verbal signs of deception. And so there is still a way to do it. But the whether or not you can catch somebody out with deception with a psychopath is not up to really your ability to read questions as much as it is in your ability to ask questions and, and direct your questions a little bit more pointedly. And there's one fundamental problem with them. The reason you don't get the fight or flight that you would get. So if Chase and I are talking and I'm afraid I'm going to hurt his feelings with something, I feel stress from that. But if you have no empathy, you don't feel stress from what pain you're causing other people, then you don't find it. When you ratchet up the stress on a psychopath or a narcissist, is when you're attacking them and they feel some kind of personal extinction threat or that kind of thing, they still show the signs of fight or flight because that, that organism is still going to try to protect itself. Stakes. Yeah. 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 I would agree. Uh, here's the thing I would, I would say with the psychopath is, uh, you know, are they any good at lying? Yeah. The, the really good ones are and the really not good right. ones, not so much. Um, just like you and I, you know, uh, sometimes we're really good at lying and sometimes not. It depends as, as the guys were saying about the stakes around mm. that. Um, a really good lying psychopath, you'll have married them and they'll have killed you before you ever work out that they were lying. I mean, that's what <laughs> the really good ones. But, <laughs> is this, yeah. is this from working with world leaders, Mark? 
Uh, I, I wouldn't like to say the word psychopath <laughs> and next to the world. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to do myself out of a job. Um, <laughs> like I haven't come here to lose money. Uh, now, that's where his diction, now, now listen to his diction, how, how clean it is right in there. Once he got a hold of what he's going to say after that stutter part, then he's like, here's something to say, boom, got to be really clear. That's what I'm talking about when you, yeah. when you baseline someone. Yeah. So, and he was under stress right there. So, it was a perfect example of that as well. <laughs> That's the first time I've seen Mark kind of pause. Yeah, you got <laughs> it. Thought. Yeah, I paused. I looked off there. I went, <laughs> why did I come on this show? <laughs> Again. I worked out it was Chase's Mark. fault. Oh, oh, yes. Send people around. People will be you visiting go. you, Chase. Well, that's perfect for the next audience question. <laughs> um, how much do you watch your own nonverbals when communicating, knowing what you know now? Zero. Well, when, when we're doing our show, we could all watch each other, and we all don't bother. We just do what oh, we do. Oh, come on, you do. Yeah, oh, you do. Oh. We do. There's oh, too no. many people to watch. I, I'll tell you what. <laughs> at first... When you first, I'll change the pronoun. When I first start learning body language, it was exhausting because I monitored myself the whole time. And it's so exhausting that I said, I don't give a crap. I'm just going, I'm going to do whatever. If it comes out, it comes out. I agree with you, Chase. When you first do it, you're so conscious of every little twitch and tweak and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. I wake up one day and go, I'm honest. I'm being honest. And when you interrogate, you're lying most of the time. So you have to trust that your body language is good enough. I've lied to people many times in an interrogation room and think, you believe that? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, you're an actor. Isn't that lying? Uh, no, no, it's not lying at all because you're on the program or you're in the credits. It's not a lie. I mean, it's a, it's, that's, it's, it's, it's a controlled um, uh, you know, kind of uh, delusion whereby you're already telling everybody I'm going to be lying. Now, if you there are some people out there who'll tell you that they're able to read your mind. They won't say, I'm a magician. They'll say, no, I'm actually reading your mind. Well, that you go, you're lying because right. you can, there isn't a human being on the planet that can do that. You're conning me right now. So, so that's that kind of person, you know, that kind of Yuri Geller, uh, and I will say, you know, oh, Yuri Geller you <laughs> is a liar. He's just a liar because he says, oh, no, I'm in touch with angels. And, and no, 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 you're not. You're doing a magic trick. And Actually, ironically, John Edwards. I don't know John Edwards. Uh, well, let me ask you this, Mark. Let's well, both of them. Do you know someone whose name starts? Do you, is, there a, is there a Patricia in your life somewhere? Is the name Patricia? It not does. A, not a, see not a. Okay. Not a not a Patri not a Patricia, but um, a but a uh, P. Um, yeah, she wants the, you to call her. You should call her. She wants you to call her. <laughs> so, you know, I I once went I once went to a uh, to, to 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 see a medium do the whole hmm. the whole thing. It was fantastic. It was a brilliant brilliant show, brilliant brilliant show. Um, and the guy I was with, the medium went when I'm getting a. I'm getting a, a signal and and there's some there's some something that you were meant to do in the house and you haven't got it done yet. <laughs> he was like Mary, really? like yeah, yeah. Um there's some shelves that need putting up. Go back. Yeah, there. yeah, there's some shelves right that need putting up. And and you've lost somebody? You've lost somebody. He was like, Yeah, yeah, my 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 grandmother. Yeah, she says she says it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's okay. Anyway, that's Mark, that, they're doing exactly what we do. They're giving you permission to be stupid. Absolutely. <laughs> let, let me Absolutely. tell you something. That's I've always said this, and that's where I'm going after this. Just so you know, when you see the commercial with me on there, I'm gonna be a damn dog psychic. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, Ash, just what's the problem? Let me ask you a question, Mark. Is you, what's that, Patches? Do you feed your dog <laughs> food that's is it listen to me? Does your dog food brown? Do you feed it brown things? Yes, yes, always. <laughs> don't do that. Don't he doesn't like, like it. Patches doesn't like his guy's stuff. Doesn't like you it. don't know it yet. That's your interesting you see, because she was yesterday she was feeling a bit down. Yeah. So yeah. that's interesting. Call Patricia. You, you is your dog named Patricia? Patricia? called Patricia and she wasn't Patricia, but there was a character in a show called Pat and called Pat, and I used to like that show. I'm out. So I think it's that. I win. <laughs> I think it's that. Anyway, uh, 
<laughs> on to the next. We've got another topic. question coming in. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank the Lord. When did you? Uh, when did each of you first discover your interest in the subject? This is from Grant Merle or Morell. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> I'll jump in. I, I got mine in Sears School. I was I got forced into an interrogation career. Kind of a weird twist. Um, I became an interrogator after learning to speak Arabic. The army wanted me to use it somehow. So I went to um, interrogator school and straight into, from there straight into SEER, where we're teaching operators, Delta Force, Marine, Force Recon, Navy SEALs, Chase, how to resist interrogation. And they would try to lie to you and you can't help. It's screaming at you. So you have to start to put words to it. That's where mine started. Cool. Chase. I'm glad you started wrangling this and calling names, Eric. <laughs> hey, I, I, this is not a professional operation, obviously. <laughs> I got mine with some very specialized military training, and I made all that up. It was actually, <laughs> I was trying to read girls better when I was like a 19 year old. I wanted to understand how to tell when a girl is attracted to me or, or is interested in me. And it, that got me started before I started the whole interrogation stuff. Scott. Was that before or after you started giving handsome lessons? <laughs> that was long before. Right. Okay, long before. I, I got mine when I was a little kid uh, from my dad being a doctor and watching him um, figure out what people were when they were when they weren't being honest with him because he would take me to the hospital with him sometimes when I was a kid. And uh, I would watch him talk to people and he would say, that guy's not being honest with me. And I was like, well, how do you? And when I was six or seven years old, how do you know that? And he would explain it wasn't like what we talk about today, the specifics of it, but just things they would do, how they couch things, how they would word things and the things they would talk about around that, uh, that deceptive part. So that's what the really thing is. like, um, if they, he would ask them, so, um, do you drink a little, uh, about how much, uh, two a day. And he'd write down six. Uh, well, it's <laughs> sort of, it's, 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 um, no, it would, but actually one of those things about the the about drinking too much came up as well. I don't remember that, but I remember that specific situation when I was little, but I don't remember what the outcome was. I remember asking about it, but I don't remember what he was telling me about it. So that, yeah, you did hit on that. That, that was good. Is, are you psychic? <laughs> uh, yes. Your dog yes, I'm psychic. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mark. Yeah, so uh, I was so not very good at uh, reading and writing. And so the only books that I read were were comic books, just full of pictures. And I just loved pictures and pictures of people and the interactions. And I just got very good at, at being obsessed with the patterns and and the images of people and how they were interacting. And I think it, it started from from that. And that's what got me into visual theater um, and, and film and television and and then I kind of went, well, how am I going to, you know, really make any money uh, around this? <laughs> and found out that people in business were on the whole, there was just such a low, um, uh, you know, a, uh, I guess a, a low ability at being able to communicate really well. And I had a lot of skill around that uh, and, and skill because of technique. I'd really learned technique. So so that's where I got into the techniques of how to use body language to influence and persuade. Okay, I have to put this in. I'm going to jump around because I think this is hilarious. Grant Morell says, I see Greg as a Roger Waters style bass player. <laughs> Greg's too nice to be Roger Waters. <laughs> Roger yeah. Waters is not, yeah. Not, not a nice guy. You haven't seen what Greg's capable of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. A good point. that's a good That's a good point. You see, you good see point. the show, Greg. You see down. the show, Greg. I you see the show, Greg. Don't worry about show time. It's a different shows. Greg. Yeah, if you, if, yeah, I've got some visual evidence on TV shows that might differ with you, Mark. <laughs> right. We have a comment. Um, I love how the behavior analysis community are all great friends. None of you are in competition with, you, with each other. And you all have different angles in which to fill in the gaps of behavior analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. That's a fine statement. All right. I love this question. <clears throat> what is something in the area of body language that surprised each of you that was the opposite of what you initially thought? And don't say arms crossed. I'm bored of that. That was my go-to. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to use. I was going to use that as well. It's a, I think the breaking eye contact, breaking for me is breaking eye contact. Is that yeah. what you're going to say, Greg? 
Yeah, I was going to say when you first start, it's those maxims, the breaking eye contact, the scratching your nose, all the crap you read that's body mm -hmm. language. If you touch your nose, you're lying. If you break eye contact, you're lying. All those basics that you learn when you're looking and from that's, out. That's one of the things that sort of bonds us is we don't, we're not absolutists. As right. in, when you, I got a huge nose, so I, I just moved my hand. I accidentally hit it. So when you scratch your nose, it means this every time. <laughs> when you cross your arms, it means this every time. Yeah, you're right. Or when you, so when you do things that that are are just because people will say, and you see all those news shows, they say, well, he went like this, so it means that. We can say it suggests something or indicates something, or there's an issue there with that, but you can't say for sure that means that every time. So I think Jay, Chase was saying at the top that, but that's the sort of thing we we that sort of bonds us. I think is there are so many people out there that that go down that route because, and here's where I stand on my nerd soapbox for this stuff. They don't re do their research. They don't know where this stuff came from, and they don't care. They just read it like that Albert Moravian thing we were talking about a few or earlier. You asked it about the seven thirty eight fifty five rule of communication. Never has there been anything other outside of the JFK assassination that has been a. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Nothing, we have range. Been, what, no, yeah. that, that's range now. We got it yeah, all the way from Grassy Knowles to the Moravian principle. Yeah. So he. So it's <laughs> it's one of those things where. Everybody believes it's believes one thing because that's what they're told over and over, and it's wrong from the from the top, you know. So that th that's one thing that sort of bonds us is, is I don't think we put up with the with the bullshit that come that that most people do that will just when you when you're out training somebody or you're training a group or talking to a group and you can tell them anything you want to, I could go out and tell them, I could show my brother how to how to do how to be an expert and not give him any information just to say certain things. Greg wrote a whole book on it, on, yeah. on how to. So, and which I read too, but that's, that, that's one of the things that, that bonds us is that thing where we, we don't take any of that, that we, we know where our, our information came from to the, to go to the matrix on it. For, and and every people. one of us baselines, we may use different techniques, but all of us, you know, Chase will say I'm obsessed with baseline and he's right, but so is he, we just use it in different ways. It's, we are looking specifically for deviation, every one of us. And the stuff we first learned, if you first picked up the book, it said when a person touches their nose, they're nervous. When a person does this, they're nervous. Well, that's not always true. Some people are just weird and do this all the time. Greg, I'd say you're very into Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. My driving force. My driving force. <laughs> and Chase is into digital flexion <laughs> and authority. The thing that I learned... <laughs> that really shocked me that I learned wasn't really true. I thought body language and behavior and psychology was about science. Mm. And I mean like a hard and fast where there's an equation and an exact outcome. And I thought I go, I go into learning about human behavior and I'm like, holy crap, we're just chimpanzees with no hair. And that's basically what we are. Shave apes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is it you always say, Greg? Um, we're like, uh, was it like you're in a group with a bunch of chimpanzees and you realize you are yeah. one? Actually, Mark gave me a great line. <laughs> I, I'm actually a chimp who thinks that I'm Jane Goodall and still the other <laughs> <laughs> That's it, Jane Goodall. All right, next question. If someone is talkative, but only when you ask questions, what does it mean? In other words, they will never be the first one to ask or initiate a conversation. I think it would be a stretch to say exactly what it means because it could mean many things, right? A person can be very shy. They might not want to open themselves. In other cases, it might mean they're bored or disinterested and they're polite. Humans are complex creatures and we're kind of like a little onion, right? When you're two, you're this little person and you just keep adding layers and layers. I often say you add hair and scars and turn it into what you are as an adult. So, and yeah, if, if that, in that situation, if you'd like to figure out a little bit more, take a look at their body. Are they making more eye contact? Do they breathe through their mouth when they're around you? Is their mouth open and, and relaxed? Is their body language relaxed? Do they look at you while they're speaking? Is their body Gender language difference. internal or external, right? So here's where I go with that is, is when, when people generally ask me those questions, which, which seem like they're, they're trying to be very general, but my guess is, is the person asking that question has somebody in their head right now that they're thinking of. And so my question is always, so who are you thinking of right now? And why is it so important to you? Because of the, because like, I can't 
and you know you could actually answer the question right now in the in the chat because we can't get to that person right now and 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 baseline them and look at them but you're live and really here and and clearly it's something on your mind and that for me is the most interesting thing rather than somebody who will never meet what I call the ghost I often call it coaching the ghost it's like we're going to talk about something that we'll never meet anywhere which is a real live human being who who you probably know and so you know I come to this thing of of a lot of the body language that we end up reading is not us particularly but it, us as humans in general, it's a better indicator of how we're thinking and feeling than it is of the other person, how they're thinking and feeling. And I think what we're often trying to do as, as experts in this area is, is try and be more uh, objective about that and try and see the picture uh, devoid of our biases or our projections onto it. And you hear that in us being broad because we can't see what you see. And it, you know, sure. if you ask me in, in my experience, a lot of people I talked to didn't want to talk to me and would not do anything but answer questions. But that was because they were in handcuffs. There's a big difference in those two, right? Well, there is that. And it also could be a gender question, too. And, and it could right? be. You know, like maybe a, a crush or flirting or, or something. Good. This, which is why you want to go. So what person, when, where, who, who exactly are you talking about right now and why? <laughs> like that's the interesting thing is, is, is why? And, and, and is there a better question? Like, like if you had this opportunity, because this <laughs> is amazing, you know, four people and, and you want to talk about this thing here, narrow it down, and and we could get somewhere. Well, next question, because we're tighter on time. Uh, this might be a Mark one, too. I don't know. Have you seen people permanently change what they desire in life, how they interact with others, et cetera, their character, emotional sets, et cetera, when they permanently change their body language? And it sounds almost like a CBT question. You know, the whole Yeah, so at that point, you're, you're, if, you're going to, if you change your body language, do you change your your persona or your character or your value system or uh, no, you, you might see elements of yourself, which is built up of their various facets. You might see elements of yourself become, have more volume and project more, but would you change your actual core? Uh, no. no. I can give you an exception to that. I can give you an exception to that. Chase and I both have been through that. And as you yeah. were, yeah. That that whole establish an alpha. Now we're back to Maslow again. The whole establish an alpha <laughs> to emulate that alpha is basic training or boot camp. Yeah. And it mm. does fundamentally change how you move, act, and think. Right. Yeah. So I, but the only proviso I would have put on that is there are some ways that you can do that to people, but on the whole, they're illegal. Right. Now, yeah. my guess is, is when you, when you joined or were conscripted, where you, you guys would have joined, you signed some documents to say, okay, you can do what you, Yes. what you like whatever you play yeah, yeah what's whatever. called basic indoctrination training yeah so <laughs> so and that and that happens over time and also that was that was social as well you know you're doing it with with your colleagues so there's there's yeah. social training going going on there to do it quickly it tend the ways of doing that quickly to my understanding are illegal they're not you can't the geneva convention says no well, we had a couple of guys. I've done two TV experiments where we had people sign up for it, one for British TV and one for the History Channel. Some people are just not swift about signing up and signing away their rights for things. Chase and I. <laughs> hey, Eric, there's a, a great question here from Z the Boxing Cat. Uh, oh, good. Good. <laughs> uh, well, we uh, got to have a cat. Is there one uh -huh. specific universal thing that screams liar? I thought this would be great for everybody. I think pod, being a politician, right? Yeah, evidence. I mean, you know, if you got if you got what we call you know sensible fact, which is something that three or more people can sense and they know it to be true, and then you have somebody else going, "Oh no, that isn't correct." That is my that screams to me liar because it's like, no, we got three people who know it's a sensible fact, and you're telling me. But even then. It's like maybe they they don't see it. Maybe they're delusional. Maybe I mean. No. I think I think what the mixed martial arts tiger is looking for here is a a body language indicator. 
Yeah, that's tough. Body language is tough. What I will tell you, if the story is way too complicated, it's way too complicated. Uh, there's a great example right now of a, of a woman who drowned her son in Florida, and she says in the story that allegedly pushed her. <laughs> uh, she she confessed. Oh, okay. So they said they said she said that someone pushed her off the road with a car and then asked her for drugs and they kidnapped her son and said when you get the drugs come back. That sounds awfully convoluted to me. Why not money so I can go and buy drugs or something else? When I hear that, I immediately go, okay, there's a red flag. What you're not going to hear from any of us is it always means liar, but red flags in logic, red flags in anything that doesn't make sense to you, look out for those. Your brain's designed to find that. A statement analysis, a good approach. I've heard that from uh, Lena Cisco, that uh, a lot of times she'll go right to statement analysis when it's she's trying to detect these things. Yeah, because you need that because you need evidence. Because because we're we're not in a world where you have just kings who, if they think you're a liar, get to slaughter you. It's like you've got courts of law and there has to be evidence. So so I mean, has any has any have any of us here got a fail safe way to spot a liar non verbally? Anybody? Bueller? We all lie, hundred percent. So what I think <laughs> If we were just to say, what's what do you think is the most reliable body language indicator of deception? For me, it, it's yes. facial touching. It's what? Facial touching for me. Facial touching. Okay. For me, it's eye lock. And according to research. I'm just going off. Is that because of the stress that you're touching because of the itch or whatever because the blood is flushing to the surface? Or there's, there's three different pieces of research that suggest it. Um, but one is about blood flow. One is about self-protection. The other one is about like your body manufacturing an itch to fulfill an impulse to cover your mouth because that's a, that's an impulse that we have. But I, I'm not sure what it, what it's for, but academically, as Greg said, I'm obsessed with that stuff. That is the most common deception indicator. So in, in mine, mine around eye contact, way too much eye contact, the hypnotic eye contact is a go-to for me. It doesn't mean they're lying, but it certainly gets my attention yeah. very quickly. Me too. Yeah, mine, yeah. Mine's, mine's for, I, I'm going with the uh, not breaking eye contact. When somebody looks at it and they keep talking and they keep adding, they, and they don't hush, you know, they'll tell you the answer and you just sit there a minute and, and they start talking again. That's one of the cues that makes that makes me go, makes me want to ask more questions because you really can't tell from one thing. So you have to, you have to know how to ask questions and what questions to ask. So that's that's one way for me. Well, the follow up, uh, Sarah Van Diver says in uh, Chase's training, he says not to call people out when they do lie. Is there a time that you should call them out? I say not to call them out, not during interrogation training. I say this is during rapport building. I'm, I'm trying to develop a relationship with somebody. Like, hmm. hey, you're in lie detection. You're not, not going to go to your friend and be like, dude, you did not pay that much for that car. I can tell you're lying because yeah. this, this, and this. It's usually a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. So how, many, how many times have we been in a situation where you know the person you're talking to is not being honest with you, but you keep that information and you learn what their things are when you know they're not lying. And when it starts at the very beginning, you'll know what, what's happened with that, with that person. Why would you let them, why let them know? But spotting the lie is one thing. That, that's, 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 that's great. But you need to know why they're lying. So if you call I, I, them out as soon as you see it, then you're then you're you're losing out. You won't find out why they're lying. Well, it, accepting a lie is an important social skill, just as lying. If you can't lie and you can't accept a lie and you can't tell the truth and you can't accept the truth, then you can't get on socially. The the key is knowing when to do it in order to be social. You know, if I'm if I'm telling a story, you know, and everybody <laughs> jumps in and goes, well, that's pro that's not accurate. I can tell that's not, you didn't give an accurate number there. I'm going to be like, yeah, because I'm trying to tell a story. I'm, you know, it's just better. It's just better if it's 100 people rather than, than 73, which is the accurate amount of people. You know, it's just a better story because we're trying to get on here. You know, we're trying to trying to get on as human beings. So we have to be able to not call people out as liars sometimes and then sometimes you got to be brave and go i think that's not true well i'll tell you one of my better interrogations that i was proudest of is breaking someone simply by pointing out i would say okay i'm going to ask you some questions i've been watching you long enough now i'm going to ask you questions and tell you when you're lying and i would say so sarah whoever i'm <laughs> talking to <laughs> i would say 
okay, I know you're lying here. I know you're lying here. I know you're lying here. Now there's something I didn't know whether the, she was lying about or not. And when I got to that point and I said, so why don't you finish this one for me? And it's another, Chase, this is another we know all. I didn't know what she had done, but she told me it worked out. Mm. So as long as you can tell them that you know when they're lying, they'll finish out the sentence for you. There's a, a right time to do it in the interrogation. And if I'm in interrogation, I usually do it a really not a nice way. I'm a very, very nice interrogator. So I say, I would say something like, Greg, I've been doing this for a really long time. And if there's one thing I can tell when I'm talking to somebody, it's when I'm not getting the full story. Yep. And that, then I'll just kind of launch in and. Well, you're, you do the Columbo thing. You, know, you like the Paul, <laughs> the Paul McCartney of interrogation instead of the, the, the Roger Waters. Of, <laughs> oh, I'm just being pleasant. You know, just a pleasant interrogation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to close out with this question, which I feel leads um, as a perfect closeout. What products do you guys have for sale, classes, seminars, etc.? Essentially, this is to wrap it up. I'm sorry we can't get to all the questions, but time to plug. we got to plug. Greg, this question? Greg, you got to hold it down. You have 11 books. We can't go through all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so if you're looking for a business book, I've got the most dangerous business book you'll ever read. I've got a ton of books on just pop culture stuff, liars and that kind of thing. Um, and, and even a dating book for women. And then Scott and I have Body Language Tactics, which is a group of micro courses we did together. And we're doing more things like that. And we're working on another book. So, yeah, get product out there. And you go to bodylanguagetactics.com. And we're having a sale right now because of the COVID okay. thing. <laughs> Usually it's, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding with you guys. It is on sale, but I'm not going to go down that road. Mark, I'm going to pick on you next. Uh, yeah, it should be obvious. <laughs> what? Should, uh, I, should I don't know. Oh, what? I don't know. Is it's that not, not obvious? Anyway, just head over to truthplane.com. The shed loads of stuff over there. Fill your boots. And Enjoy I'm yourself. Good. I'm going to finish off with Chase because Chase has an announcement, I believe, about a book that maybe dropping anytime. Yeah. And one thing on truthplane.com, it's not just a shopping cart thing. You can go in there with a ton of free stuff. Yeah. That yeah. I've personally downloaded before I've ever even met Mark. And I just didn't tell him when we met each other. So. <laughs> <laughs> but if you just go see my name down here, it's chasehughes.com. There's a lot of free training. There's body language interrogation training all for free. There's courses on there. My book is called The Ellipsis Manual. And we have a fiction, oh, I'm sorry, fiction book that just came out called Phrase 7, which drops out on Kindle Sunday morning. Very cool. And The Ellipsis Manual, right. there will be an audio book coming out in the upcoming months. Yes, narrated by a guy named Eric Hunley. <laughs> wow. I've seen that guy. I know that I can hook you up with him if you need to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget the behaviorpanel.com. That's a place. Yeah. 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 Oh, geez, okay, everybody. Everybody. yeah behaviorpanel.com, which leads to our YouTube channel, the behavior panel, which is, I think, one of the fastest growing channels I've ever seen. Cody, yeah. it's, it's, it's ballistic. It is. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> but Eric, really quick, Tim Strake, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Had a quick question, just round the table for 10 seconds each. What do you suggest to people wanting to improve their understanding of body language? So what what's what's the book that, that did the most for you guys? Mm, cool. Mm. Besides your own. Well, what started me was The Naked Ape, getting your brain to think about humans differently. Very simple book. It talks about us as apes and gets you to think differently. The biggest thing is in terms of books, don't look at one, look at many. And not just mine. Even if if I could sell you every book I have, I would tell you, read other Well, you people. have enough to be an assignment. <laughs> read other people's work, too. It's important <laughs> that you mount. Yeah. Scott? I, I've got so many that I really like. You know, I always go back to, uh, I can read you like a book, which is one of, of Greg's books, and then Joe Navarro's book, What Everybody Is Saying, anything by Desmond Morris. Um they're just so I, I can't nail down to one, but I can give you a group of them. I can make you a pack of them. I had to do I had to put that in this. I had to put references in this in this book I just wrote for uh, Callisto Media. And it's it's I think it's going to be called Everyday Body Language or Understanding Body Language. And I had to put a, a just some some books in there. And my list was way too long. 
So it's it's I, I can't just say one, but I can say a group of books, but I can't just give you one. I would start with those, with those three or four right there. Yeah, I, I would say start with start with Desmond Morris because it helps your understanding of of human beings as a social mammal and grounds you in that. Uh, got a shout out about uh, Joe Navarro's uh, dictionary of body language, which is kind of a crazy title because body language isn't a language; it doesn't have any of the factors of language. But still, um, you know, the title dictionary it actually functions pretty well as that. And and Joe is great at being kind of just accurate, being trying to be as accurate as possible and no nonsense. So uh, it's a good book. He's, he's also got a book that that's for um, poker players called 200 Poker Tales or something. That's a fabulous book. I don't even know how to play poker. And I love that book. I mean, <laughs> I've, I've read it four or five times. It's a wonderful book. Sorry. Thanks for telling us you don't know how to play poker. I um, don't. Because yeah, well, the math is really important. Gathering. No cameras, <laughs> just tables. Seriously. <laughs> but, so, I don't know. But if you, if you want to get together, you can teach me. We can try. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's but sandbagging there's you. There's I can tell already. I really don't know. Chase. Okay, sorry, Chase. Yeah, so these guys are giving you books if you want to become a freaking super nerd on this stuff or you really want to get down, <laughs> way down underneath skin. But if you want to get started, what really helped me at, at the beginning was a book by Barbara and Alan Pease called The Definitive Guide to Body Language. When I had it, it had a purple cover. I don't know what it looks like now. But it's very approachable. It's got really good pictures in there. But if you get that book, you're going to make a mistake that I made and took me about two years to, to recover from. As you're reading about body language in the beginning, it's, it's almost immediate for your brain to imagine all that stuff as still images instead of moving images. So we, we get used to like, oh, I need to look mm. for a guy going like this, not a guy going like this, like not the movement of the behavior. I need to look at these still pictures, and it's I'm, you're looking around like I'm not seeing all these people just standing still. <laughs> Wait, can you hold that post for me? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great the, point. The one tip. But your brain is wired to read this, guys. Relax, pay attention. You'll see a lot of it. You know, you okay. want a lot of training. Well, folks, thanks for coming on, and to the audience, my shameless plug: hit subscribe. It's down below. Hit the bell. Please. Right down here. Yeah, down, down somewhere. I, I don't know how to work the camera here, but mm -hmm. please subscribe. There's a lot of cool people. All of these guys have been on, and hopefully you'll be on again at different points with different mixes and matches. And all of you, thank you so much. This is a blast. Thank Thanks. you, guys. And we are live. Everybody is back again. The uh, behavioral panel rides again. So let's do... Uh, Quick introduction from everybody again. We'll start with, I'll just go alphabetical order because I'm lazy. Mr. Bowden. Lovely. I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, even some of the leaders of the G7. Stand out, win trust, gain credibility. Excellent. And what's that t-shirt? You don't have a red shirt today, Mark. No, nope, Hawaii. Hawaii. Much of this room is from Hawaii. So uh, so I'm wearing the T-shirt as well. Okay, fantastic. Jumping over to Mr. Hartley. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written a few books on body language and behavior, and I spend most of my time in corporate America and Wall Street today. And Chase. I'm Chase Hughes. I'm a body language and behavior expert. I also spent the better part of 20 years in the U.S. military and developing tactics and techniques for the U.S. government and intelligence agencies. Yeah, and I see a book behind your shoulder there. I guess that's doing really well. Oh, yeah. This is uh, Phrase 7. <laughs> new uh, fiction book we just got out, and we're very hopeful that it will very soon be a Netflix series. Excellent. I think you have some people possibly cast for it already, right? We do. We do. I can't talk about it. There's a lawyer involved. <laughs> <laughs> so then moving on to Mr. Rouse. I have a book called The Ellipsis Manual. <laughs> I have actors writing for this book as well. Page 134. That's what we've been fussing about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm Scott Rouse, and I'm a body language expert and analyst. I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. I'm also a trial consultant. 
Fantastic. Okay, so we're back again. Uh, already see a lot of people coming on. I'm going to just jump right in. I have a question here. Simon, question. Which person from the past or present would each of you most like to interrogate and why? Remember, we'll know if you're telling the truth or not. We've learned from the best. Hmm. I'll go. Jeffrey McDonald, the Vision Quest killer. I, I want I want to talk to him. He's still alive. He's still around. I want to talk to him, and I want to hear that story. That is, it's one of those long mysteries, and it's related to my past world, Fort Bragg. If you don't know the story, it's a wonderful thing to go read. Horrible story, but he's still around. He's in prison, I believe, in North Carolina, and the it, it is it ties all the '60s together. So it's one of those that I'd love to go talk to him and understand what he actually is saying because I've seen bad interviews with him and all that. Hmm. Mark. Yeah. Um, I'm a big Charles Darwin fan. So, I mean, rather than interrogation, uh, I just like a conversation with Charles Darwin. I think he uh, has radically changed the way that we see biology in the world around us and, and, and to the extent that the way we think human beings function. So I'd quite like to sit down with him and just have a bit of a chat conversation, a beer, a cup of coffee. I, I don't know whether he was a drinker or not. Was he English? Was he English? He was a drinker. <laughs> he, was, he was English, so yes, he may well have been a... That's a good, it's a good bet that he'd like a beer or a port. Mr. Hughes. I would like to interview a person who's still alive today, and his name is Sirhan Sirhan. Oh. He was the guy who killed Bobby Kennedy, mm -hmm. and there is a mountain of evidence that suggests that he was a Manchurian candidate. And I think that could very well be true. I specialized in creating those kinds of scenarios for a very long time. I teach that kind of thing. And I would love to interview him. I had it set up. He's in prison in San Diego, California. I had it set up and uh, I showed up to the prison and he wasn't feeling well. So mm. it didn't happen. I'd still like to <laughs> still like to go do it. And that probably takes some work, <laughs> especially when people know what you do. Mr. Rouse. I would want to talk to Nikolai Tesla. And I want to ask him what really happened when he was a kid. Because he tells this story about how when he was a little kid, he had this vision of how um, electricity was first made. So I want to talk to him about those types of things. That's where my, that's where, I'm, that'd be my interest. Would be well, it would be short and sweet, but I just have a few questions for him. Yeah, whatever works. All right, jumping forward, um, let's see. Question for Chase. How did your knowledge of human behavior influence the way you developed the characters in your novel? I wanted the characters to be believable. Thanks for the question, Valerie. But I, want, I, I knew that certain things trigger people. I wrote a really cool article that's free. You can go look it up. It's, it's called How 50 Shades of Grey Targeted the Female Brain. Mm. And why could a book that's crappily written make 11 to 20 million women sneak off with their Kindles into a, a, a hiding place somewhere for several months? And I specifically wrote all of those character, characters to be psychologically compelling. And I, the whole time I'm writing a book, I am actually imagining you reading the book and getting an in Instagram notification on your phone. And I'm thinking whether or not you check that Instagram notification is going to be based on the quality of my writing. That's a high bar. That makes me wonder, have you guys read about the uh, Microsoft research with the Nigerian scams? Never Ooh. in my life. No. I'm only bringing it up because you had mentioned about how does something crappily written become so popular. They actually researched the Nigerian scams. And if you've ever received the emails, I mean, we all have, right? They're horrible misspellings. The grammar is just garbage. Um, formatting is weird. It looks wonky. Kind of maybe looks like something, but it's not. That's actually deliberate because they're self-selecting people who are weak enough to fall. Huh. Makes sense. And, yeah. So the art of, I used to work with a, with a, con artist he was particularly good and and he always said you can only con a greedy man and and mm. his idea of the con was is what you're trying to do is make the mark very confident you, you're giving them confidence 
Uh, and one of the ways you do that is to lower your status so they feel a really high status. So he would say, you know, the one way to get not get conned is, is be careful when you're in a situation with somebody else who you probably don't know and you're thinking, I think I've got this person. I think I'm about to win really big on this one and they're an idiot. The moment mm. you're thinking, they're an idiot and I'm really smart, that, and, so, and also, so interrogation, you really so value Columbo. interrogation 101. It's Columbo. Yeah. 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 It's, it's like interrogation 101. Give you permission to do something stupid because you think I'm not going to notice. Mm. <laughs> That's all it is. That's true. And I think, Chase, uh, reaching back when I interviewed you before, the hardest people to control or manipulate are the ones who are uncertain. I think we fell upon. Yep. Absolutely. Because they couldn't come up with the decision at any point. And I've talked to other people who do social engineering and it screws with them because it breaks their timing. Because they're like, yeah, well, sure. uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe I should call somebody. Uh, what do I do? Yeah. And then what? not only do you have to give them confidence, you've got to give them certainty, which harkens back to my favorite quote. I open every interrogation training with this quote from The Art of War. It is, build your opponent a golden bridge upon which to retreat. Yep. That's a, that's a great one. I, I still think all this, go back to Maslow, when a person belongs and you make them feel safe enough that they feel comfortable, that they figure where they fit in the in the triangle, that's when you get people to tell you what whatever it is. And I think that's exactly what you're doing, Chase, is that that golden bridge. It's we all have said before, this is permission to do something stupid. I, I think most things are that. That's the reason. And somebody all somebody's going to screenshot Greg doing this and make an Illuminati. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was what I was laughing about was uh, Greg talking about uh, the OK sign and going, and I was thinking, oh God, he's going to be white power, Greg. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's the problem. People look for everything. They're going to find a connection to something. You know about that meme, right? The yeah, I just, saw actually got... I just saw it recently, and it was like I saw something where there was a mm -hmm. person at a football game or something doing that. Yeah. yeah, and they actually shut it down, went into a full-blown investigation at West Point because of it. Yeah. And it all came out of a 4chan joke saying, hey, that, that's white power, guys. That's a P and a W. Yeah, no. That, no. It, you know, if, that OK sign has been around forever. And, you know, when the military use it, sure. you know, that kind of thing, it, when you're doing hand signals. When you're working in the field and you're actually doing military operations, there's a whole lot of hand signals that mean something to us that don't mean mm -hmm. to other people. And we can signal each other. Trust me, that was an okay sign in my whole army career. And I spent a long <laughs> time doing it. You'd go, you know, I see three people Eggman, walking. We could talk Eggman with would call Eggman would call that an emblem, of course. Yeah. 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 Or gesture yeah. is what I yeah. I, yeah. I mean, the the signals and emblems can mean different things in different places. Like I always what say, is an know, emblem? Four, four stars is four stars, and it means one thing in the Marines, and it means another thing at McDonald's. Culture's everything. Culture's everything. Oh, in yeah. the Middle East, you give them one of these, you get your hand cut off. Or one of these. <laughs> well, it's culture, right? Culture is everything. That's if we always see Trump doing that, you know, putting a fine point on something. It's not an okay sign. And yeah, if you watch people around someone, you generate your own culture and you can even introduce new emblems, gestures, and they'll pick them up. So you can tell when people have been insulated, when we captured prisoners and people would say, we well, don't know each other, but they're, it's like flashing gang sign. They're using some strange, strange hand signals that only they're using. That's incriminating. You know that they're connected. By the way, that Trump thing you just mentioned, um, Simon Lancaster, who I met based on your video and Mark Bowden bringing him up, mm -hmm. mentioned in the interview that that's actually Trump saying he's signing what he said. So every time he does that, he's actually signing off that this is in fact what I think or I am saying. Mm -hmm. And if other people do, he doesn't do that same thing. I thought that was fascinating. And there are other people around him you see doing the same thing because I he's, he's the ignorant gorilla. That. When he does it, he comes down like this. He's not writing anything. He's pinpointing. Yeah. I, yeah, it's, I it's a dexterous gesture. It's to it's to show look look how big my I mean he's not doing this consciously, but essentially to do that really fast takes a lot of neocortex power. So, you know, his brain's really firing once he's doing those OKL gestures. And also it sparks up, up other people's minds. It gets people really excited when he does that. So it's more, it's more about being dexterous. I think there are things that he 
gestures that he does, which are sign-off gestures, but I don't think the OKL is a sign-off gesture. It's one to show, look how dexterous I am. It's opposable thumbs, look. I'm, I'm no, <laughs> no chin. I'm no I'm not a small hand a Bulgarian. <laughs> Remember how he hates anything with the small hands? So I don't know if that's a, look at my masculine-sized hands. <laughs> I don't know. We'd have to ask him. Get him on. Yeah, get him on. We'd love to talk. Get him on. Oh, absolutely. I have a question from Twitter earlier. Um, Dennis Whale wants to know, what is your go-to behavioral tell for someone wearing a mask? Everything happens in the – I mean, you could do three days from the, the eyebrows up. Mm -hmm. As Joe Navarro calls this, the billboard for emotion. Mm -hmm. So you've got the eyes and you've got the, eye, and you've got the brows and the eyebrow. You can tell a lot about what's going on in there. Like when you'll notice when somebody smiles at you, all you'll see is that their eyes will go like that. If you know the differences in a real smile, a fake smile, and the Duchenne smile and all that, yeah. then you'll be able to tell you what's going on. But I noticed when I was I was in Target today because I left my microphone at my parents' house when I was uh, visiting <laughs> them. So I had to get a new one. And so when I went to Target to get this little microphone I'm using, um, there was this little kid in, in the basket. And his mom was pushing him, and he was looking at me. And he and he had a little mask. And I saw his little eyes going mm, like that, and so I did mine back at his. And I thought I could be doing anything under here, but so, you know. And he would never know, but he saw my eyes go up, you know. And then he started waving. So you can tell you can tell a whole lot that, that that's going on just just from here from here up. And that's the first thing you see from across the room. It's one of the first things you see when you're trying to when you enter a room. And Greg does a whole lot of, uh, of that in one of his books about when you first enter the room, what you're looking for. And one of the first things you, you're going to notice is the eyebrow. What, what, what is the flash? What, what, what's flash. happening up here? Are they, are they happy, sad, concerned? Are they, you know, wondering about something? You can tell so much just about just from there up. You can see a whole lot. Well, and don't get me started on eye movement. I'll leave that one off. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Well, and Mark, do you use that um, for presentations or, or meeting people? I know um, Jordan Harbinger, I think, some of you may be familiar with him, talks about how he practices with a post-it note on the doorway that every time he's going to go through the door, he puts his head up, looks at the post-it note, opens his eyes, and it comes through into the room. Hmm. Well, yeah, so, so I would say just generally what I'm looking at or training people to do is use the, the bigger mass of their body to make some kind of impression as, they, as they're in a room. And certainly I, I will try and read the bigger mass of the body uh, simply to see where's the center of gravity facing, because wherever the center of gravity is going, I don't care where their feet are going and their hands are going, wherever that center of gravity is going, that's where they're going. Everything follows that. You may want your head to go over there, but if your center of gravity is going that way, the head can't go in that direction. So where's the center of gravity? And then what's the rhythm and cadence of, of the physical movement? What's its, what's its rhythm? Because that you can see in quite a big picture. You can take in a thin slice of a big picture of lots of people in a room and go, what's the general atmosphere here? Rather than, because, you know, with lots of people in a room, it's very difficult to, to read everybody's eyes or everybody's eyebrows. But yeah. the big picture you can read immediately. And we'll all be doing that unconsciously anyway. I guess if there's, if there's a fee attached, I might be doing that more consciously. You know, for sure. Yeah, I think the energy of a body, all of those things, you can see so much. I think all of us will have points, but you can see so much. Face is part of it, but there is a hell of a lot more going on in your body than just your face. Well, yeah. Navarro loves the feet. He's always saying, watch the feet. The feet tell you everything, where they're going or what they Find the door. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of Joe's work, came, as he says in his books, he says, look, you know, this is from me watching people during interviews and interrogations for a career in the FBI. And so you, you could you could quite imagine he's got a lot of people sitting down and, <laughs> and, there'd be, and there's a table. And what can he see? Well, maybe he can't see the, talk, the, the center of gravity so well, but he can see, um, you know, the legs moving, the legs shifting. So, so his, his lens has come from, from that. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't quite agree that the feet tell you everything. They may well right, be, right. be a brilliant thing that other people would miss when people are sitting down and not realize, well, we can see their feet. I remember um, uh, uh, Chase pointing out in the Prince Andrew interview that we did that he could... He could, he could oh, Chase was counting. From the <laughs> because of the, 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 the artery in the leg, it pumps through a hell of a lot of 
blood and, and it was bring the, I thought that was well that's brilliant that's brilliant that, that's genius you know that's similar to like a flush or something right it's just blood being rushed to the area and having to deal or cope with it is that a fair well, it, it analogy seems a little bit more than that in the in that you can you can see the pulse of it whereas in a flush my understanding is you can't see the pulse you're seeing that that moment of when skin is taken to a specific hmm. part of the body for a specific reason a lot of times people think of like when, when somebody's getting ready to swing at you somebody's getting ready oh, to start fighting you you'll see him be a little flush but then you'll see that go away and that's when that's when the that's when the trouble's coming because all the blood is running to their muscles and, and getting them ready to uh to come at you on the nostrils or mm -hmm. yeah. See, yeah, I yeah. before that for the lowering of the center of gravity and and when they could you know when people are being aggressive but they've got their chest high and they're also pointing to their chest and opening out of the chest like nothing's going to happen and even if it does people are going to hit parts of the body that don't get damaged very easily but Chase, the moment the center of gravity drops and that's looks amused drop, then he just looks like, amused oh, about okay, all this i don't know if he agrees or well, no no the thing is chase has some great training on this chase Yes, yeah, yeah, we we have a whole course in violent behavioral prediction, and that was a result mm -hmm. of nineteen thousand hours of body cam, police body cam footage. Yeah. But that's one of those things. A lot of those, a hundred percent of the behaviors that we identified, are not affected by somebody wearing a mask at all. Mm. And I think all four of us. I don't want to speak for anybody, but. If we were all paid to do an analysis of somebody sitting in a, a cross examination or sitting in a courtroom, somebody has a mask on, it doesn't make that much of a difference at all. Well, For me, this is the thing you control the most in your entire life is your mouth. Yeah. Or at and least most of us. <laughs> There's some I just, people. I just got finished with, <laughs> or we're in the middle of the, the, the first federal case being tried in Tennessee during the COVID thing. And yeah. Everybody in there has got a mask. Well, for the first half of they got a mask on, they start taking them off because they feel safe and all that. You know, they get used to being there. But you can tell, you can still tell a lot. Like we, when you look at the jury, you try and decide. Once the jury's chosen, they're put in the box. You try to decide who's going to be the foreman or the, or the four woman, whoever's going to be the four person. And I nailed that one. I, I was, and we talked about that the other day because we could, t I could tell it wasn't just in the face, it was the whole body what was doing. And the guy had been in um, the military. And, and having known that, though, you can you can uh, see the way he's sitting and see those things. But he showed everything of being the alpha and he was going to be the one in charge. And this was from day, you know, from day one. We didn't find out especially who it was until till toward the end there. Is it based uh, on him, Scott, or or the way people around him or was, her defer was, to the person? It was based on him, on, on the way he was acting, because it was the, it was day one. And there were no other, there was no, not, it's not the alpha gets the gig, it gets that every time, but you could tell this guy, he was, he'd been in the, in the uh, Air Force for a long time and he was out now. And you could tell he was the one that was going to be in charge. You can, you can just see it on him. By the way, he's sitting, the alpha usually doesn't move a whole lot. He moves the least during, um, in the group, what's happening. You'll notice when you're also looking at him or when you're trying to find out who's in the group and Chase has talked about this before as well. You'll notice they're, all their their feet will be toy, be pointed toward that person, and a little bit right. of their torso will be be pointed toward. Not a lot of that going on in this situation, but just by his mannerisms when it when it first started. So that was, that was one of the people when we were cho when you go through voir dire, which is when you choose a jury. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to keep that guy because I knew from his from his background, knowing because we ran find out who all they are and what all they do. Found, I, I knew he would be honest about everything, and he would be the least one that would be manipulated by the other side or, you know, or whoever's going to try to manipulate him. And he would be the one that, that would be solid. And I, and I was really happy with that because, because I actually scored on that one really big, you know, it was, uh, one of those things that I can't believe he guessed that, but if he broke it down and said, here's why they go, Oh yeah. Okay. That makes sense. You know, actually, you you, my, my funniest story I ever had for body language was on a plane with an attorney and big, big name guy. And I said, so what do you do with body language? He said, you know, let me give you my best everything that happened to me. It was a murder trial and I was there and I was pretty sure I was connecting and closing with this woman and she was crying and I could see her nodding her head. And then they found the guy guilty. And when it was over, I talked to her and said, what was going on? She said, I was crying because I was wondering how you could, how you could defend that bitch. Who was, <laughs> who was that guilty? So there's a real easy and, and Mark and, and, and Chase and Scott doing this, 
probably more than anybody else, you would say, there's, it's really easy to misread too. You got to be careful and not project onto those folks. Mm -hmm. Your question, Eric, about people and proximity is a good one. I could tell you what rank somebody was in a compound in, in the first Gulf War by standing in a tower and seeing how much space there was around them. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's really easy. Humans are, we That's stay with people who can make us miserable. Yeah, but so, so, so I, I always say uh, people follow the strongest, clearest signal in the room. That's not the best signal or the most intelligent signal, just the mm -hmm. strongest, clearest. In order to be a leader, you must be followable. You don't need to be smart. You, just need, you, you don't need a good idea. You just need to be followable. And so, you know, when we talk about this example with, with that Scott was telling us, my guess would be is you've got somebody there who's easy to follow. And so the other human beings around, which are just trying to economically find a leader, will, will start to squ very quickly mirror their movement, join in with their movement. And when they say who's going to lead this, it's going to be very obvious to them on an internal, unconscious level who's in charge. Perfect. I got a bunch of questions to go. Well said. Let's get in here. Uh, Dana Ellis asks, Chase, I am Sorry, K-Files. Yeah, Chase, you're just adorable. By the way, he's um, Chase Hollywood. We're going to start calling him because a lot of comments are his fans. Uh, Chase, I am K. I don't know if there's a code in that. Uh, files and photos that you obtained from Colgate University. One, how have you used that information and have you made it all public? Two, what is the most useful information from the research? Dana? Uh, the, the files I obtained from Colgate University were written by a man who was part of MK Ultra. His name was Dr. George Estabrooks. He was in constant communication with J. Edgar Hoover, Baylor University, and Milton Erickson, uh, Aldous Huxley, Margaret Mead. A lot of the people that, that we associate with the, with the Times, most people don't know that Erickson was involved. Uh, I, I use that information to bring, because... If we just consider the telephone that Dr. Esther Brooks had when he wrote that paper in the 40s and the, the iPhone 12, 11 that we have today, I want to bring persuasion to the same level. We should, we should be evolving persuasion and influence at the same rate as a freaking cell phone. So I evolved that to kind of upgrade his program. But one of the most useful things from the research was his plan uh, which, which I'll post on my website. I'm, I'm happy to do it, but I haven't made it public. His plan to J. Edgar Hoover to hypnotize and program a German submarine captain to hmm. take his boat back to a German harbor and torpedo all of the ships. And I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Was that and the first Manchurian wrote, candidate? Sorry? Was that the, would that be the first Manchurian candidate example? The first example was a U.S. Army officer. He he split, they call him Officer Smith, probably a fake name, that they would send him over enemy lines with this alternate personality. And then he would be carrying this secret information, no matter what happened, supposedly in a torture or something, this other personality wouldn't come out that had the information. When he got to the other side, the other guy would say, the moon is clear tonight or whatever. And that the, this other guy would pop out. And that's that's kind of how that stuff works. But he never published the mechanics of it until those papers. And, and mm. those are the papers that I, I found and dissected and wanted to update the, the training. And, and now, you realize, Chase, that I'd say what is today, Friday. I'd say by this coming Tuesday or Thursday, you're going to be on the front of like one of those uh, Star Magazine. And you're going to be involved Perfect. with your hands to hands. <laughs> you're involved with Oswald. <laughs> There's Fred doing that. And yeah. Mark and I are just sitting there going like this the whole time. I don't know what to say. But but I, I, you'll be on the front of one of those. Right? Here's the guy. We found him. You're going to be part of all that crap going on in those things. Yeah, you're you're you going to be the toast of the town. You're going to be every one of those shows. <laughs> or at least toasted. If you guys will allow me a 60-second segue here, that if I can do that, if there's people with multiple personality disorder and one of them has clinically diagnosable glaucoma and the other one doesn't, proven fact some of them have clinically diagnosed diabetes and the other personality does not these are actual facts you can go google it look it up and there's been two cases reported where one personality was blind to the point where their pupils didn't respond to light 
So if, if that is possible, what could we do with somebody with depression or somebody suffering with extreme anxiety or phobias? If one of, if we can, if diabetes is possible from a psychiatric standpoint, what's possible from a, a helping people standpoint where it's not a disorder anymore. It's actually something that helps people. So that was the angle think- that I initially approached it. At. All right. Now this is for Greg and Mark. What do you think he's doing to us? <laughs> do we really want to do this behavior panel thing? Or I, I, don't, I don't speak until he gives me the command. I'm waiting for the command. <laughs> I don't. You know, you can't stop me. Once he gives me the command word, you can't, you cannot stop me. I'm unstoppable. Oh, yeah, we can. <laughs> I lost my jacket in the mall. <laughs> Guys, uh, we live in the same area. And notice I only do video things with Chase. That's funny. <laughs> probably safer all right roxana r asks hello gentlemen is part of what you do instinct yeah i'll hop on that one first when i first started doing this all i had was instinct i just knew it i would feel how someone was responding and i was really afraid to learn body language was afraid i might break that and some of that is just when you talk about instinct it's your ability to sense what somebody is saying to you with their body and that we all are meant to read it we all are meant to know when something's gone. We've just blunted that, in my opinion. And I say always, we're shaved apes. We're not naked apes because we're embarrassed to be monkeys. We all are meant to signal. And if you don't believe it, you can understand that from a distance. When I roll my eyes, I've excused you. We all have known most of this stuff. We just put it to sleep. And we're just trying to give it back to you is what I think. I think I think you're right. And I think what happens is there are two. This is the part that gets horrifically boring, but I'm going to get into it anyway. <laughs> the fuse form gyrus is that part of your brain that collects all those little things you see in someone's face moving around to let you know what's happening. Then you have the mid temporal gyrus that, that gets all the big movements and things. And then those things, as they collect them, send them back to this little thing about as big as a BB in the back of the, the base of the brain uh, called the locus ceruleus. And that's where you get your gut feeling. That's where you get what men get is a gut feeling. What women get is, is unquestionably the most potent uh, power in the world, which is women's intuition. And <laughs> that's what gives us that gut feeling. And I think it starts when you're a child and then it sort of gets dismissed as you go along. No, that's not, that's not what they're thinking. The smile means this, this means this, and all those things are sort of wiped away. So I think that instinct is, is comes, I think you're come equipped with that as a human, most people anyway, and I think it grows from there. And then the reason we would be so into it is it's still uh, into behavior uh, because it's still, makes us go, wait a minute, I'm seeing this and nobody sees this or I'm feeling something here and nobody else feels that. My mom's like that. She can, she can nail whether someone's good or bad. So can my wife, Amber can just nail if somebody's good, a good person, or they've got an intent that isn't good, you know, or whatever they're in, it could be good, could be bad. My father's great at that as well. But I think those things come with us. I think we come equipped with those. And then since they're not nurtured, as in uh, our empathetic side and our sympathetic side sometimes isn't nurtured as we grow up. So obviously, or sometimes you become what's labeled as a sociopath, which you really aren't even the mostly psychopath, but, but uh, which is a whole other story. But I think that, I think that's what we're seeing there. So I think that that's correct. I think they're, th- well, I think we are, we're all equipped with that when we show up and we come online. I think we've got all that with us. It just gets dismissed and, and, and watered down or dulled. Yeah. So, and I'll give you a quick 10 second example breathing is an instinct that we hopefully carry until the day we die well literally <laughs> we do because you die literally <laughs> so it, it, there's still ways that we can bring that into our conscious awareness to really improve our mental health our physical health and to, into bringing breathing into something that we do on a conscious basis instead of unconscious and that really does change the game to bring something from unconscious instinct to conscious, sharpened information. So I would say this, when I'm working, I'm trying to suspend my instinct because my instinct, just like yours, is biased. Our instincts are biased towards a negative. Your instinct doesn't care about accuracy. It wants to be safe today, to live, to be accurate tomorrow. So it has a, has a, a bias. Uh, just like when, uh, when you see uh, a fast-moving object in your peripheral vision, you don't think about it. You step back immediately. Now, you thought you thought that was a vehicle. It actually turned out to be a paper bag blowing in the breeze. But you didn't take any time to actually work out. You went for the negative bias. 
first off. And that's why if you're trying to professionally, you know, like charge people money for your idea about behavior, you have to suspend your judgment or you're just like everybody else out there, just using their very, very biased instinct. It's not that the instinct isn't good. It saves your life on a daily basis. But we're, we're trying to, certainly for me, I'm trying to work out what is closer to being accurate rather than what feels right right now. You know, Mark, that's, that's a great, I'll tell you that when I started this, like I said, I was afraid I'd lose the ability to sense. Mm -hmm. It actually made it much, much, much better because now I can go, okay, oh, yeah. is that accurate or not? And it is, it's not just humans, all primates, identify threat where there is none. It's the reason you see forms in clouds, the reason you see a bear instead of a rock, because if your ancestors saw a rock instead of a bear, they didn't reproduce, right? Yeah. That's just the way life works. No, um, really quickly before we jump back in, but how do you baseline? Because that's a great point. Um, I, I have you know all kinds of cognitive bias going on. When I look at somebody, I'm going to look for everything that agrees with my opinion naturally, confirmation bias. How do you control yourselves for that? You make a big point of it saying, hey, we're just calling it like it is, whatever. How do you call it like it is? Well, I'll tell you, negative reinforcement's the best thing possible. And so if you're a military guy and you're learning, I can speak to Chase's training and my training for sure. If you, they intentionally set you up in all of your training to make that bias mistake, to try to burn your hand and remind you not to do it. It still, the rest of your life takes a conscious effort not to jump into. I had a conversation with someone last night who was talking about people and he used the word them. And I'm like, what does them mean to you? When he's talking about a group of people and uses the word then, I don't know how to even talk to that because people are all different and all the same. And that's the only way you can look at it. Culture affects how we think. It affects our opinions of others. And you have to constantly, every one of us, I would guarantee you, is constantly stripping away at that daily, trying to constantly think, why do I think that? Why do I think the rock is a bear? Right. Hmm. So, so I use a critical thinking technique, which is simply to you put the word maybe or perhaps or yet after the judgment that I've made. So, so you'll be I'll be baselining, and I'll get a there'll be an instinct. There'll be then me suspending the judgment against the instinct, and then I'll add the word maybe. So it keeps me curious, and I investigate more and more and more and more and more. But you can't do that if you're about to get run over by a bus. It takes, right. it's like it's, you can't, you know, if you do critical thinking when you're in front of somebody with a, with a weapon of some sort, then, then chances are you're going to get killed. So you sure. either get training or you use your instinct, but you don't use critical thinking. Well, and don't waste your time on things that don't matter. If I learned yeah. from my Navy SEAL friends, it's, yeah. I don't think about how to shoot. I think about whether I shoot. Yeah. Yeah. People say to me, well, you know, um, can you tell if this person's a liar or not? It's like, why would I be bothered? I don't know. Like, what's what's what does it matter? Like something right. if you're going to use critical thinking and suspend your judgment. Something has to matter enough that you take the time to do that because you're using up so much brain capacity to do that. And really quick, the way that I teach is. Every human being you speak to is absolutely has to be the hero of their own story. Mm. And you have to identify how they are viewing their own lives and get into their bias. So I'm sitting inside of that person's judgment, inside of their bias instead of my own. And that really helps me to get to the other side of the table. We're like, what is the story this person is telling themselves to make them the hero? Of their story. That's actually Kafka. Did you know that? I knew the quote was somebody. I, I knew that you guys are smarter than I am on that. So well, he is, has, that's what he's the hero of his own story. Critical thinking. It's what we call perceptual positioning. So it, yep. it, only human beings can do perceptual positioning. There's no other thing on the planet that can go. I wonder what it would be like to be that thing over there. Not even crows. Not even. Not even crows. They're damn smart. No. Crows are scary. No. Do you think a, a, a crow's? Do you think a crow does a piece of perceptual positioning and then has a conversation with the crow next to it about how it just did perceptual positioning? No. Like the best. <laughs> no. 
you know, it's that classic of thing. At the did, did a crow invent the internal combustion engine? I mean, and, and you can you can go well because it doesn't need to. It would if it could. It's hard to do without <laughs> Trump. Could it would have done it. <laughs> Moving forward, um, Brett M. He would love an interview with Scott Peterson. Would be interested to see that one from you all. Okay. But yeah. think when we when we do doing those things, we already know what the outcome is. Right. You know. Yeah. And so, like when we did in McCann, so many people are under the impression those people like killed that kid, and so I don't believe any of us had that impression. Uh, so that was that. interesting because it was so that, the we're to the because we're, we don't know, you know. So who knows at this point? I mean, I believe we got a pretty good idea, but I don't think. I mean, people saying, "Oh, they're lying here and there," and I don't think we saw. We saw a little bit, just a, just a tiny bit, when they were lying about something. They were asked to lie about about the police. They or not lie about. They're just holding them for you know, yeah, the yeah. knowledge. Just hold that it, information back. Okay. Isn't that relevant though? Whether hold somebody's on, lying mean, because they may feel guilt about something they did, but it may not oh, be the murder yeah. or whatever. It's just I'm a crappy parent, or I'm an uh, you oh, know, yeah. I, I feel yeah, terrible cool. about blah blah but blah. Honest but, about the guilt. And guys, yeah. we're looking for symptoms. What we can't do. The, the cool thing is we're looking for symptoms. What we're not doing is reading their thoughts. And what I think is fun about what we're doing is we're looking at things that nobody can know the answer to, like the UFO lady. Um, well, the one, yeah, not so much, but the Jane Green story. We, we want to know what they saw and what they think they saw. That's why we're doing this. And then the same thing with once you know somebody's guilty, then we can show you all the signs of lying that led up to that. But it's not nearly as fun. Yeah. And there's a buddy of mine, Terry Hurd. <laughs> I hadn't talked to him in a long time. And then he asked me, we were just texting back and forth, and he said, How's your mind reading business going? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Speaking of minds, Charlie O'Malley wants to know different drugs can lead to different bodily behavior, you know, LSD, cannabis, meth, et cetera, and legal medicines too. But do you think um, without knowing you can spot what a drug or which drug when interviewing them? You talk about which drug or that they're I, I guess it's a couple. Uh, there's two questions I can see coming out of this. Number one, can you tell what drug somebody is on when you're talking to them? Number two, does that affect your reading? Well, you can't do it if they're all, if somebody's doped up, you just got to say, okay, we got to do this later, yeah. or you can't do this right now. Yeah, I used to work with a lot of that risk. questions you ask me that are they on some kind of value or something like that. Because if they are, it's, you, can, you can't, how can you go forward if somebody's not in their, in their in your, if they're not, don't have their faculties? They're not able to access everything the way you need them to access. So their hey, behavior is going to be different. Scott's coming from a legal perspective here. Mm -hmm. In my world, if I know somebody's on a drug that makes them paranoid, I will capitalize. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course, Chase. When, when you interrogate people, you'll give it to them like you chase them. And <laughs> I, I agree with you, Chase. If you know it makes them paranoid or if you can poke on them and you can make fear yeah. of, that, that's just another a ploy, another Pro. Or comfort, depending on you know what what's going on, or what what they have for sure. Yeah, look, a, a, a doctor will know, will have a pretty good idea if somebody's on a drug or not, and and the same with with us, we may have some understanding of, of met a lot of people and known the drugs that they're on at the time, and therefore know the behaviours. Uh, I certainly know what what you know heroin usually looks like. I know I know like cannabis. You can like, you can smell it. It's really it's like the smell comes in the room. It's like okay, and somebody um, doesn't have a cold when they have the stuff. LSD is pretty, <laughs> you know. Is there's there's a lot that you can you can pretty easily tell. Can you get it exact? You know, some of them some of these drugs do some of some similar symptoms, but yeah, you can get close. And for me, the thing is, when we talk about interrogation, you talk about that's a different setting. You know, I spent all my life the past twenty years getting away from the actual interrogation portion. And do you deal with people who are using some kind of drugs? Hell, I work in business. Alcohol is the number one drug. And there's plenty of that when you get people going. Mm -hmm. And we always said back in my interrogation days, the best truth serum in the world is alcohol. You can get people to have poor judgment and suspend all their inhibitions with just a few drinks. It works wonderfully. And then you use quid pro quo. I tell you something that sounds like it matters. And you tell me something that does. <laughs> the elicitation techniques work wonderfully over drinks. I get more information that way than I'd ever get in an interrogation room. Well, while we're there, there's, there's some interesting areas which people often mistake um, alcohol or, or, or drugs for what is actually insulin. 
an insulin shock, diabetes, yeah, sure. that happens constantly. Mm. You see somebody sure. on the street, ah, they're, they're drunk. No, they're diabetic. They're in diabetic shock. You know, yeah, that's, why, why, that's why they're in a pool of urine. It isn't because they're drunk. It's because that's they're diabetic. Listen, I, I'm reading these old these old chat things over here. I'm sorry to do no, this. Make me want to look. There's one over here by this guy, Iron Sky, or this girl. It says, "Are there any other body language channels that are legit?" I think they mean YouTube channels. And it said, and it also says, "How bad is the analysis of some of the bigger body language channels?" I think that's a great question because okay. that asks. You, you Where, see, how do I get the chat? It's, it's, open, 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 it's not private. 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 But anyway, oh, so man. that covers when we when we yeah. get all these. We get a lot of, of, of comments that say you need to say see so and so's thing. You got to take into consideration some of these people. They're they're. I don't know how to say this so it don't sound like an. Uh -huh. No, but, but keep going, Scott. Keep going, keep going, Scott, and then and then we'll get, <laughs> we talk about it. Please do. Name them. Name Some people name just name Scott. Some people just no. Some people just Google their information and they have no research for it. They, there's nothing behind it. They've just read it and they see it somewhere. There's this one I've seen where this lady says she can tell whether in court whether you're going to tell the truth or not by the way you hold your hand up. If it's held back, you're not oh, going. And, I was, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So, in answer to that question, you have it's it's tough to find the the, the right places to get valid information and i always have a list of books i give and it's uh, these guys books is, are, are of course the top of that pile but there it's so when you're trying to learn the truth about what's happening with human behavior and and what someone is doing when you present them with something uh, you say something or what or how you see them acting at a distance when there's a situation happening You've got to find, you've got, to, that's important because it's tough to find the valid information. It's tough to find uh, people who've researched what they're telling you about. Anybody can go out and be, can be, can be an expert. I can find, I can get somebody off the street. Any of us can. And we say, you say this, 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 and yes. this, and you've got an hour yeah. of stuff and yep. there you go. But when so, you start asking them questions about that, there's no, they can't say like Chase can go, and there's all the research for that. I was talking about damn one page 134 in this thing. Holy <laughs> so two, two things are anyway. coming out, guys. If you see a person who is analyzing body language and reading down the list, be suspicious. Be very suspicious because they've prepped a bunch of stuff. And they're Tell what the, explain that list. Explain that. So I, okay, I run down a list. Um, adapters, barriers, illustrators. I'm looking at literally looking at a physical list. You, you can tell when somebody's looking at a camera and looking at a list. If you ask one of us a question, you see us scram scrambling around in our little brains and going, well, I think it's this. We are, I think you said it best two days ago, uh, Mark. Real expertise is when you can change gears in the middle of what you're talking about and not have to prepare. So you can show us something and we'll say, I'm not gonna be 100% here, but here's what I'm gonna tell you. And we're gonna use what we know to apply. There's a big problem. The whole 10,000 hours makes you an expert thing. I've had people challenge me, well, you didn't have 10,000 hours there. I interrogated 10,000 hours, come on. I, I didn't sit in a classroom for 10,000 hours, no. So I always yeah. look at people and go, Okay, there's lots of ways to learn this. I don't use the same words an academic will because I learned to do this a certain way. I will tell you that when you go out there and you start seeing absolutist, I scratch my nose, it means I'm lying. Turn that channel off right then because they don't know what they're talking about. That's old school. You know, somebody made up something 100 years ago and they believe it. Here's what you should be looking for is people who are trying to apply context. People are looking at the mechanics of how it works and they're talking using similar language, but it's not constantly repeating the same thing over and over and over. It's- uh, I mean, uh, You get into the absolute. Somebody get into the absolute. Is, oh, sorry, dude. Sorry. No, no worries. How about instead of worrying about the channels that aren't good, are there any that you can say, yeah, yeah they're not bad? <laughs> so there's a lot of sensational. Let me just leave it at this. There's a lot of sensationalism. If it sounds like you're getting a show, you're getting a show. I hope when you watch us, it's not a show. I hope that when you watch us, you hear us talking and chatting. Guys, let, I'm going to tell you a piece of truth. This is for us. We're having fun. Yeah. We're glad you like it. But this is for us. We're having fun. We're but talking we're, to each other. And at the same time, we're not saying, like, we're the only valid thing there. No, is. not at all. We're not not at all. But we're not going to analyze other people. They, yeah. they, guys, there, there are a lot of people out there. I mean, we know all – you hear us say you hear us say Joe Navarro, Jack Schaefer, who works with Joe. Sure. I've worked Tanya with Ryan. Driver, we, Tanya Ryman. We've had Lena Sisko on our show. There are a hell of a lot of good people out here. I'm, so don't take it from us that we think we're the pinnacle of no, oh, yeah, everything. No, these are good people and who have a long track record doing this. There are a lot of people who sensationalize it and make it into if you do this, you're doing that. Yeah, 
stay away from those guys. That's yeah. all I can say. That and that's again, that's what the absolutist will tell you. Just because when they do this every time show their shoulder up real quick, it means this every time. So it just could be a part of them thinking you have to be able to separate that behavior you're seeing. So again, and again, we're not saying we're the best one there. We're not at all. You know, go look at Joe Navarro. The cat gets like 37 million, you know, views on like one 14 minute. Joe's show. an institution. Yeah, so, man. He's the guy. He's like the, the, uh, He's the Joe Navarro of our body language. He's up there with He's that. the Joe Navarro of our Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, Navarro's up with Ekman in terms of kind of legendary. Yeah. Yeah. He's on the on the Mount Rushmore. Those are the two first yeah, two cats I mean, on there, man. It's Eggman and then Joe Navarro. Desmond. Still, still. Yeah. Oh, Desmond yeah. Morris, yeah. Still, still. Yeah. Hot I'd love still for us to get him. him. Kind of, like you said, Chase. Well, this is a, a hey, moment. somebody asked a question. Uh, yeah, I've got. Uh, somebody asked a question. Like him, there. When you first start, when you first start questioning uh, to baseline, what are your go-to's? Non-pertinent information is your baseline. Hey, I, I might do this. Hey, Mark, what did you do yesterday? Uh, there you go, Mark. There's his baseline. Right? <laughs> this is normal for Mark. Yeah. And what I do is then I'd say, okay, so last Tuesday, or talk about something you have in common, sports. When I go into a corporate office, guys always got pictures on his wall. I call it "I love me" wall. All I do is say, where's that golf course? And they go, uh, 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 and do what they normally do. And I baseline them in 30 seconds. Then I start asking questions. <laughs> All right. This is a big moment for the channel. So I've got to put this out here. Um, somebody just uh, put in a super chat. Hey, guys. And I don't know how to get it on the screen. That's very weird. They just read uh, it. Uh, Joy 1411 just said, Dalon, hey, guys. Thank you very much, Joy. That's uh first time I've ever gotten a super chat on this channel. So I have to very cool. Say love that. It. Awesome. I love it. So, yeah. I love being super chatted too. <laughs> um, <laughs> Johan Diedrichs, what is the most hilarious body language read you have done on a serious analysis interview slash interrogation slash training? Huh. Hilarious. I'll go first. Hey, please. So this was the most amazing indicators that are also very funny to me are a guy named Colonel Russell Williams. The killer in Canada? Yeah. He yeah. Can steal wow. girls underwear and then go and kill them. And, yeah. you know, he goes into the interrogation room. He wants to examine all the evidence really close, never makes a denial. It's, it's the most textbook. It's and beautiful. I've seen a lot of interrogations, a whole lot, uh, as much as anybody here. And I'm telling you that video is one of the one of the best examples of how to speak and how to the cadence and the attitude of the interrogator. That interrogator does a great job, but and the and the confession that happens at the end uh, is is fantastic. He just finally said the interrogator's asking, "Look, well, we need to know where the body is, Russ." And he goes, "Do you have a map?" And that was just that was it. That was just. Well, it and he's resistance trained. It is clear to me. I, yeah. I can't yeah. point out what he's doing, but he is resistance trained. It's clear, and the interior gets around it. That's a beautiful yeah. interior. But he's for my money, he's come in with such a level of arrogance. Yeah, that's yeah, just what I'm that gum chewing from moment one. I'm going, oh, you you got to be joking. Like you've they haven't even been arrested, and you've decided to come in for questioning. And yeah. you're chewing gum. It's like you're already in trouble because you think you're better than this. And well, the guy that's doing right. the interview, the guy's doing the interview is just he's not even that old. He's not usually you see the old guys coming to go dang dang dang. This guy is awesome. He he just goes right down yeah. the list and just keep he just keeps bringing him in and bringing him in. And he's like, Okay, yeah. oh, it's it's and the we, we, we gonna, what are we gonna what are we gonna do, Russ? What are we gonna do when he goes along? It's a great. That was a, that's a great one. If you've never watched, yeah. it, it's boring. We're, we're interrogator geeking on you. I'll guarantee you because you don't want to watch an hour of this. But for us, it's beautiful. It is. It's well executed. Every one of us knows it. It's it's a wonderful interrogation. Yeah, yeah. It, um, the funny part. The end. The funny part, Eric, when you talk about interrogations, people leak information when you're talking to them, and usually it's not body language. It's funny. It's something stupid they say, and I I always tell these guys. We named everybody in an interrogation room. You, people get nicknames because that's how you remember them. You, yeah, you don't remember the person's name, you know, when you're in a, in a prisoner of war situation. And they all come up with names. And I, Scott, I always think of brilliant mind. Brilliant mind. 
we were doing a TV show for the History Channel, and it was nine expatriate Americans trying to hide information about something they had done for 24 hours. And we knew they couldn't because they didn't expect what we would do. And this one guy who was very smart, and he's 22 years old and a, a lecturer at London University, pretty impressive. We pushed him and pressured him about how weak he was physically. And he screamed out, oh, I have a brilliant mind. <laughs> we told him the rest of the time to mock him. And he had told everyone, I'm going to beat these guys because I'm smarter than they are on tape. We didn't know that. And when, mm. he, when he surrendered to a, the oldest trick in the book, good cop, bad cop, we got to see that he was, he thought he was smarter than us. And he later said, well, I guess I'm not as smart about what they do as they, and he had to eat a little crow to your crow point. Awesome. Hey, I like crows. We're going to jump forward and I'm going to start with Mark on this question. Um, Anne Marie Greenslade. I would love to hear your opinions on the queen's body language. She is so famously poker faced and gives nothing away, but I wonder if she leaks any emotions at all. Watch her when, take this one. Sure. Watch her when she goes to the races. Okay. When she goes to the races, she's a different emotional being. So she she, she loves she loves the horses. Um, mm -hmm. she's a, a you know been a breeder, and and that's her passion is the horses. So if you watch film of her watching her horses, you see somebody completely different. Especially her back in the day when her mum was alive as well, because her mum was into the horses. And, and you'll see her get so excited and rush over to her mum and go, Mummy, Mummy! <laughs> cool. She's like, a, she's like a, she becomes a child. Uh, she again. rides at 90 plus. It's, yeah. 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 So, so I think, you know, there's, there's an interesting cultural thing there because obviously she has been culturally tr trained. And by culture, I don't mean just trained, British trained. I mean the culture of the aristocracy. And not only that, royalty. This, this line goes back and has been managing... Uh, Europe, essentially, for millennia. So there's there's some cultural training there that that nobody else gets. I, you know, I'm British, but I've never been trained as one of the one of the aristocracy or royalty. So you've got you've got that. But does that mean she's emotionless? Because you see that when she's being that royal face. No, you only need to watch her at the races, and you go, it's a kid. And I mean, that's an interesting thing as well. Is you know, within persona theory, we hold these personas for a lot. You know, there's still a 16 year old inside me. There's mm. still an eight year old. There's the version of me that went to college. They're all still inside me. And there are some elements that that kind of bring it out. You know, and then some. You know, sometimes somebody else, somebody said the other day. Um, you know, was calling me middle day, middle aged, which is true. Uh, you know, and and inside, I was going, "Hang on, but I'm still 16 inside. There's still that version of me." And <laughs> so, you know, and the key is, is can you elicit that from from somebody? Can you ask the right questions, do the right behaviors, so that facet of them comes forward? Human beings, they're just fascinating, including the Queen. Awesome. Uh, Next one, lovely. Um, Vince SZ, I don't know how you say it. Um, question Would you do a live baseline in on Eric? I already did it. <laughs> you hear it? Uh, sure, why not? Put everybody okay. Greg, Greg can do demo of that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Greg, Greg's the oh, you know, I movement exercise. I'll do that for you pretty quickly. And we run down baseline. With it. So, so, Eric, uh, tell me where you're from originally because I don't know a whole lot. Take your glasses off too because there's a oh perfect. boy, here we go. Perfect. <laughs> Tucson, Arizona. Okay. Uh, I, I lived in Sierra Vista. How close to Sierra Vista were you? Um, I believe Tucson's about an hour away. Okay. Which road would you take? I-10. Yep. There you go. Good. Um, did you see that? Did you catch yourself? You're, I already got your your uh, 10 percenter, so you're going to move that way. But let's ask you a few more questions. What's your favorite song, Eric? God. <laughs> I don't even remember. Um, I'll do an album, Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking. Okay, what's the last thing you said to someone before you came on the show? On this show today? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Are you guys seeing where he goes for his baseline for memory? He's going to the right. And so in that, that's just eye movement, guys, just for this. And so all I'm doing is looking at where he's going for information that he's recalling. In his case, most of what he's doing is visual accessing there. That when I asked him about questions, he went through a little catalog about, about the places there. He also has a resting face that you can see there. He's a little amused, and I can see the amusement in the sides of his face. But his eyes are at a certain amount of open. If something gets more 
in, interesting to him. He's going to open his eyes and lean in more. I've been watching him as, as he finds something interesting. He's leaning into it. And he, he's just genuinely trying to engage with whoever he's talking to. And wherever he's looking on the screen is dependent on where we're at. We all do that. That's Eric's base. So now if I start pushing him and I start seeing a grimace instead of a slight upturn, or I see his eyes break to the right, or I push on something and his chin drops instead of up the way he does when he's talking to you, there's a change. And that's just the first part of baselining. These other guys are going to see something else. Those are just a few things to look at. His cadence is contained. He's more telling in many cases than asking, to your point that you use, Mark, in terms of when he's talking about a topic. If he if he's not certain, then his lilt to his voice changes. But he's got a pretty constant cadence. To use your loping term, Scott, he's got a pretty constant cadence when he's talking. When he's thinking, he slows down and navigates, and his eyes drop down left. Watch him. Boom. That help. So, but as we, as while we're talking about that, Chase, talk about the home, the the eye accessing in home. So that that would be Eric's home, yep. because but explain what that is. Yeah, a memory question and, and different types of questions. So that would be Eric's home would be to his up and right, so those little movements, and you could probably get some different ones in there, Eric. If you want to just uh, look at the camera here, as if as if my okay. face was your camera, and mm -hmm. say like, how would you describe the sound of your your personal car horn? Um. So mid, we saw mid -range. Even, even him accessing an auditory memory here. We saw yeah. little. We saw a lot of forehead movement, which was a billboard of his confusion and like a weird <laughs> question. Interpreting but a question. We, we yeah. saw even though I asked an audio question, when people say audio, people will look horizontally. That's not true. Everybody's different. We saw him go home again, even though I asked the same uh, or a, a completely different question that wanted him to recall the sound of something. Not just words somebody said, but actually a sound. And he okay. still went to his home base. Okay, now watch, watch this. Hang on, watch this. Right. I so, got right. Let's let's talk about let's talk about this. When you uh, let's let's talk about a couple of things. First thing, let's talk about your first car. You remember your first car? Was it sure. one of those, was it one of those cars that when you open the glove compartment, was it locked by itself, or did it have a key that fits in the glove compartment? I have no what idea. What kind was it? What what was the color? Was it the the uh, the 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 car, the seats. What color was the interior of that car? There you and go. You, what, you know, Eric, you, you you remember your first dog? Sure. What happened to him? Well, she um, lived to be a ripe old age. Oh, how, how what what happened though? I don't think I was home when she passed. Um, she was torn up by coyotes a couple times, but really, I've been Tucson. <laughs> was that your was that your first dog? Yep. What was your name? Sunshine. So let me give you a really good visual cue. This one will hit you. So we don't know where you live. <laughs> give me directions to the nearest Wendy's from your house coming out of the driveway. And at every turn, give me a landmark. So did you just see him take that big breath? And when I asked him about the net, he looked down and got that shot down for the emotional part of it. Then he just now took a big breath. So here's what I want you to do is play back the video, play back the video, because I've been mirroring Eric's breathing all the way through this. I know his breathing rate when he's relaxed, and I know when he's under stress now. Relaxed, he's in, out, in, out. The moment he starts getting questions, he's in, out, in, out. It's like your, your breathing rate goes way up under, under stress. And I'm reading it off of his top button. You can see the top button just moves up and down slightly. It's got a big chest area, but the top button moves it moves up and down. Enough okay, that's the rate, Chase. You can count. I'm sure you counted it. <laughs> I did. <laughs> but what this is is just kind of a, a primer, a little tiny, yeah. tiny sliver of what a baseline development process would look like. And guys, it doesn't need to be contrived. I, like I said, I walk into an office. The guy's got a "I love me" wall. I want to ask him about things on the wall because he's going to give me his normal cadence. And thanks for playing along with that, Eric. It, okay. It's not a good feeling when people yeah. are doing that to you. But so no, I mean, you just have four of the top people in the world doing that. It's a delight. But it, it doesn't have to be contrived. What we want you to know is it doesn't have to be contrived. You just say, hey, what were you doing? What's the best restaurant in town? What's your favorite thing on the menu? Those are normal questions. And, and then, as you remember, I kept asking you, I'd talk about one thing that I'd move on to something else, the lock and then the color and then your dog. 
Mm-hmm. That way you've got you've got to jump from one to the other instead of saying, I'm ready and I can look right at the camera or do what I'm doing. So you can go from the other one. You actually have to think. So that's what the, the, the psychology is behind asking you questions like that. So I kept waiting for that that look down. I think, what do you say? What do you see? Two of them? Is that what you got? Yeah, yeah. Emotional. You were emotionally accessing, looking down right. Yeah. The other the other down is, I'll, I'll give you a math formula or a math equation. Figure it out quickly for me. What's 15% of 980 and don't round? It's not a math you're not going to remember it. You're looking up in your head for times tables, and that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 well, I suck at math, so. But just try it. Try it for a second. Eighty percent of nine eighty would be. Uh, I'm blocking times nine. <laughs> yeah, oh, math. Yeah, it 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 it's, 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 well, you see your eyes fifty on left, but you eye blocked because you need space to think. There he goes. Adapt there. There you go. <laughs> so, and then he, uh, then he, then he, uh, then he. Explained himself when you asked. There's him, a blush. Oh, back a little back. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my grief muscle. Grief muscle. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I even do this muscle? Right. <laughs> Good times. Ah. Uh. Now, how do I duck out of this and get a good question? <laughs> Too late. Eric is. Yeah. Here we go. There's a good comment. Eric has learned paranoia is real. <laughs> And uh, yeah, Thanks, I, I'm not going to play poker with the group. Which is poker? Is that the cards one? One of the cards? Yeah. yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah. I've never. Yeah. I, me either. Uh, I suck at yeah. cards. I only got I a couple of grand. So I, to, I know it's money in there. We could. Who? Anybody want to show me how? I, I've got some money. I'm willing to lose. To me too. It. Yeah. Somebody. Somebody will uh, uh, back me. I'll, I'll just borrow their checkbook. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll base off of that. While we're having fun picking on people. I actually have um, a couple clips for you guys to do a quick decipher on. I, obviously, we're not going to do a long one, but everybody is interested in what's going on with Mary and uh, Donald Trump. So I'm just curious what you guys Let think. Let me ask you, Mary, about something that you said in an interview um, with The Washington Post this week. You talked with Ashley Parker yeah. at The Washington Post, um, mm-hmm. and, and you said there was, she's quoted you saying there was knee-jerk anti-Semitism, knee-jerk racism in your family. Um, the Post quote she was saying, growing Sorry up, it was sort of normal to hear them use the N-word or use anti-Semitic expressions. Uh, I just wanted you to, to expand on that. Do you mean just generally within the family that was an accepted thing? Or do you mean specifically you heard your Uncle Donald use this, that kind of language? Just generally um, with the older generations, um, as if it were perfectly commonplace and ordinary to say such things. Um, I had the benefit of living in Jamaica, not Jamaica Estates, and going to school in Forest Hills. Uh, So I didn't share their ideas about uh, race and and, um, Judaism at all. Um, But, you know, when you grow, grow up, with that uh, being perfectly normal, then you don't really think twice about it. She had the answers early. I mean, the questions early. Okay. Well, guys, guys, for me, the thing that I immediately jumped to, forget content for just a minute. Turn off the sound, go look. There's a lot of down eye. I just showed you what down eyes are, right? Down eyes to the right or emotion, down eyes to the left or internal conversation. And, you know, it, the old kinesthetic plane from the NLP stuff. You know, we talk about people working in the kinesthetic plane, meaning they're down here, they're not in the upper thinking quadrants of their brain. This is not the Brady Bunch. I mean, guys, families are messy things. Who knows what truth is behind this? And I'm not going to sit here and throw rocks at her or at Donald Trump because that's not what we do. What we're going to do is tell you what we see. Sure. Families, families are messy things, and you can see it. You see, when she's asked a question, she's accessing memory, and then she goes into emotion, a lot of emotion. She's down right, down right, down left. How do I address this? And then she hits the older generation. No smoking gun for me saying she's telling the truth or not. What I do see is a lot of baggage and a lot of whatever there is. And that's not because I, that's when you hear me say there's a lot of baggage. I'm not attacking her personally. She's a psychologist. I'm sure she understands this as well or better than we do. But when you have feelings, they show. And this has got a lot of feeling to it. Does that make sense? Okay. Eric, you got to call on people. Or we're going to. 
Oh, I'm at the end of the uh, questions here, except for. Oh, well, let me, let me I'll give mine the, for the. <laughs> I agree with Greg. There's a tremendous amount of baggage here. Can't say truth or deception because it's so emotionally clouded. The question, a good couple of follow up questions would have given us some really good stuff to look at. She was more emotional about the school she went to, something Woods. I, I've never seen this clip before than anything else that she was talking about. Something about that school is a really big deal. Okay. Scott, any th thoughts? Yeah, I think she's she was loaded early. She had the questions before before she asked them. And you can tell that because all she's doing is remembering her answers, not just in general, but I, and I haven't watched any of her stuff, but I, I'll you know, bet you a hundred bucks. You, she'll say almost the exact same thing when that same question comes up because she may have had questions she suggested they ask her. I'm sure when they had their, their conversation together, um, because I, I haven't really watched any of that stuff. But that's what that's what I, that's what I would think because those she was almost rattling those. She was talking in groups as she went. Gr uh, this answer here, then she'd go to this answer here, and it wasn't she wasn't loping what I call when you start talking about things and you start and it's just a really smooth thing. It wasn't that they were all jumpy a cluster of words and a cluster of words and then a cluster of words it really wasn't she hasn't said those answers outside out a whole lot when she hasn't written them down but she knows the answer that that's what i'm seeing in there so inconclusive is kind of where you guys are all following i i think it's clear there's emotional baggage between this whole situation is what i see in terms of is she telling the truth I agree with Chase. I, I would not go down the path without controlling the conversation to say whether something's truthful or not when somebody has emotion associated. I, you've all seen the thing where you try to count the number of passes with the basketball between people and the monkey walks through the room. You don't notice if if that can cloud your vision. Trust me, emotion can. When we interrogate people, we have to figure out their state of mind at the moment something happened and all of that take into account what's fact and what's so not attacking her story, not, not defending his side either way, just saying, I can see the emotion there. I would want to know uh, how many times has she done an interview like this on TV? Because what I'm seeing is, is freeze state of fight and flight. So I, 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 it's hard to kind of, that's the baseline for me is somebody is super rigid. The mouth is already super rigid. The breathing is, is high. So, you know, I, I, if, if this, if she's already done this 20 times, then, then there's something really up with the answers. Right. If, if she's been on, if this is a third, fourth time on, it's like, okay, she needs to get used to the idea of being on network, primetime network TV uh, before she gives these answers. Also, there's something interesting there, I think, that she wants us to know that she was brought up in a whole different place with a whole mm -hmm. different bunch of people. And therefore any idea that she would be affected or infected with racism or anti-Semitism has been put to one side. I'm part of this family, but I'm not part of this family. So therefore I don't share those same traits. So there's, I think she's already worked out that she needs to distance, at the same time as saying, I can write this book and I know what I'm talking about because I was part of this family. She's going, but don't think I'm part of that family, by the way. Don't think I think I've picked up any of those traits. So there's something interesting going on there, I would say. Yeah, really That's what Mark does the best. He sees this angle that we three don't don't, don't even think sure. about. Yeah. It yeah. Up. And we talk about it, Mark, just so you know before you show up when you get up, when we get when you get off with this there, how your your take on it is a lot different than ours. You know, in a lot of ways, not from interrogation angle or the angle, you know, the side we come from, but from that that world. I don't know. I don't know. What would you call that? I would call that plot, story, and character. Mm. Yeah. 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 Of, of, of course, Chase Nance. It, it's for me. It's the best part of what we're doing, guys. All these coming from different angles. Chase is masterful at putting a name to things. I mean, behavior panels his name, right? Yeah. Chase is great at that and pulling up the academic and, and nailing that. Mark has this big sweeping. I'm always listening, yeah. like, where's Mark going to come from on this one? Because yeah. view. <laughs> and Scott and I, you know, different approaches. Scott's done his entire thing with civilians. And then mine being military, I've got a little bit of that hard ass personality thing to go with it. And so we all bring something different. And my resistance background makes me 
constantly look for that in a way that maybe some of you don't. So in all of our lives, Scott from the music, Mark from Mark, you come in from your background with all the acting and with politics. And Chase, I said the other day, you still got the freshest juice of all of us because you just came out of the military <laughs> from this thing. Maybe so. It does help. It does help. All right, very quickly, um, just to get the other side, and someone's asked to. You know, the, the hardest oh. I've ever laughed, like we do these behavior panels, and I, that's the best part of my week. I'm never <laughs> recording any of these for anybody else. This is for me. Like I, I love this time that we have together. The hardest I've ever laughed on one of our episodes is when Mark, uh, one time, he's like, I won't do the accent. <laughs> do, do, it, it. Like, do it. Do it. Yeah. What this reminds me of is if uh, the guy's been playing music all his life and then somebody says, hey, can you do a song about flowers? No, I don't have any songs about. Well, you know what? I'll just make something up. I'll make you a song about flowers right now. Yeah, that was Bob Lazar. I don't think we've ever had more negative comments oh, than no. on Bob, Bob Lazar. Maybe, well, maybe on the... That's cognitive McCann. dissonance. Either if, yeah. if I am believing something before I watch the video, either I have to say mm -hmm. I have been wrong all this time, or it's easier just to say, oh, these guys are, are crap. You know, they have no yeah, idea. Yeah. It's so tough. to it's save, tough. save their own psychology, that, that makes total sense that they'd say... It's so much easier to say, oh, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, but we both, we, and here's the thing. They say, well, you don't believe in UFOs, so you came with a bias. However, the very next thing, we find this woman that we're just looking at going, oh, my God, she's truthful. Yeah. She saw a UFO. <laughs> she saw yeah. something, for sure. Yeah, yeah she, whatever it was, I like I, I kept saying, like when we talked about, I think during Bob Lazar. Was it Bob Lazar where I said, I saw this woman on the Netflix thing? Yeah, and that's she, what it started. Yeah, yeah, man, I, I think she's, yeah. Anyway, so we know that. I, I believe she's telling the truth on that. Well, let's go and um, slam through a few more questions um, on this. Um, are there any red flags during an interview that indicates the person is a pathological liar or is a psychopath slash sociopath? I, well, there's I would go list. straight to Scott on this one. Sorry, Greg. Oh, yeah. There's a list, and and you there's a way to determine if somebody's a psych is a sociopath. I'm always careful to say that body language means somebody, and then Scott, I'll let you go into depth. Uh, my only go-to when somebody is looking at at me and overly focused, and I call it glossy, then I start to poke and try to figure it out. But for for me, body language alone can't tell you someone's a psychopath. It's got yeah, to there there's there's a there's a, the psychopath test. The the Robert Eric, Zier, uh, yeah, it came up with the, with the psychopath test or the list of things you check off when you go through deciding if the person is a psychopath or not, and. The thing is, everyone thinks, oh, a psychopath, they're impenetrable. You can't get it. It's all an ego. Yeah. So if you can get in and you know how to how to just brush that ego, you can get it back in that horse back in the barn just by patting over here and patting over here and, <laughs> and aiming it that way. I know it, it sounds, yeah, it's, it's funny sounding, but that's that's the approach because what, what you're dealing with in there is someone whose brain isn't set up like your brain. And someone can say, this person has done some really horrific stuff. How could they do that? Their, their brain doesn't see why they shouldn't do that. They don't have that. The amygdalas are either missing, something's wrong with them, or you, know, or you can see them, they've been damaged. And so you don't have that, that empathetic um, part of them. It doesn't exist. So that doesn't exist. And when you can ask them questions, like Greg, it always gets shits and giggles when we talk about when you talk to a psychopath, because one of the things you need to find out if they're glib, you can't just be asking, because, hey, are you glib? You can't <laughs> like that. I wish you would. Don't be yeah. to go around and to go I got a checklist. Are you glib? Or are you yeah, yeah. I got the test. I got the hair test. So you got to you've got to approach these questions in a, in a specific way, not in a specific order usually. But you can. It takes a while, you know. And you can't you can't uh, diagnose a psychopath right there. Sometimes it takes six months or a year for the pros to do it to find out. You know, and which and the scary part is what they used to do was they thought they were rehabilitating these psychopaths. All they were doing was show them how to act normal, and then they let them loose. Yeah. Oh God. Well, anyway. Well, and, and the worst part of the whole thing is, if you're looking for whether you're being worked, that's probably what you really are asking, because psychopath is a very specific clinical diagnosis. If you want to know if you're being worked, I call it glossy. If somebody looks and feels too good to be true, be cautious, because people aren't like that. If they look like an eight by ten glossy of themselves. And, you know, I always say shit doesn't stick to their fur, then you should be concerned. Yeah. 
And most people think the psychopaths, if you were to, to give a psychopath a knife and send him to a room, we start stabbing everybody. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, some of these guys are the most charismatic, funniest people you ever meet. You love them. Absolutely <laughs> love them. The, 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 there are two or three that I've been involved with that, man, when you meet him, you just go, it's like meeting Mark or something. You go, I love that guy. <laughs> Mark's yeah, probably not a Mark is looking a little glossy today. <laughs> yeah. But, but that feeling you get in, you go, geez, that, are you kidding me? This, I love this person's awesome. But that's that's a lot of times that's what you'll see. That's how they'll get to those different stages in businesses. And, uh, you know, and they're always trying to put themselves in a, in a position of power, be it anything like uh, Hare says, from the bellman to the cop, to the priest, to the whatever. They always want to be in a position of power. So and and part of that is is understanding uh, the way the human the, the way to treat humans, for example. Usually when psychopaths find out they're psychopaths, they don't they don't realize they're they're that a psychopath till they're in their mid twenties. Mm. And it goes down something like this. Let's say if one lived in Nashville, they'd probably live downtown on second Avenue. There's a lot going on, probably get like a loft or something up there. Cause a lot of action down there. Right. And then they'd come outside and let's say it's a Friday night or a Saturday night. And they, and before they leave and they don't know they're a psychopath yet. Right. Then they, they'll, they'll say, I think I'm going to have Chinese. I'm going to do Chinese food. So they'll come down second Avenue. And as they go down second Avenue, they see some lights and stuff, see a couple of police cars and an ambulance and people standing around. And as they walk toward what the scene or whatever's happening, there'll be a, let's say a, a little child has been run over and the, and the child is obviously dead. It's a semi gory little situation. The mother is weeping over the child and, and they're trying to pull her off and, and get the child covered up. And this, and this person will look, the psychopath will look at that and he'll say, he'll know something or she will know something important's happening. But that's all that, and they'll go, you know what? Feelings. I think it's going to be sweet and sour chicken. And they'll go get sweet and sour chicken. Then they'll come back to the house. They'll eat the sweet and sour chicken. Hour, 90 minutes later, they're in the bathroom trying to mimic those expressions they've seen on that woman because they don't understand what's going on. They'll, they'll be in the mirror trying to do that. That's an exa example of what they, they may do. But And it won't bother them like something's wrong with me. They'll say, I need to blend in better with this. What are they doing? I don't know how to do that. I'll learn how to do that. That's when they start mimicking your emotions or, or what you show as an emotion. For example, there's a guy that I knew that I'd, I'd been dealing with and I didn't realize what I was dealing with until we were talking about taxes once. I think I've told Greg this story. And as we're talking, I said, damn the taxes, man, they want, you know, you work all this stuff and they want half of what you got. And, and I said, these very specific things cut to, Six months later, and I said it to this guy, to a specific person, cut to six months later, and there's a place here, a restaurant called The Palm. And when I was in, they had these booths in part of The Palm in the bar area. And we were in, and I heard somebody behind me, and somebody said, damn it, taxes. I can't believe I have to work. up." And this guy said everything I said, and it was the guy I'd been dealing with. And I said, well, there's a big red flag. And then yeah. come to find out you've been doing, which, which isn't funny, all these really horrible, horrible things, which I wish I'd caught, I'd, I'd, you know, been aware of earlier, so I could have helped stop that. But um, now this cat lives. In, well, that's being dealt with right now. But anyway, so uh, <laughs> but, yeah. But it was, all he, space. yeah, he did some. He did some horrible. I mean, if, I'll tell you. We'll talk about this later. But just horrific things to 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 make a long story short. But had I had I seen that earlier, I would have been able to help fix that problem a lot a lot, a lot quicker. But yeah, so psych psychopathy shoot. I'll talk three hours about it. I'll shut up. <laughs> I'm going to roll through because we're running tight on time here. Um, just different comments. Rowan Mayfair said, "Please do Jada and Will." Who is that? Uh, that's the people Will that want to get sued yeah, by Jada the uh, Scientologist. I think, isn't it? They'll come after us. Huh? No, yeah. no I, I don't know if Will Smith is a Scientologist, but yeah, it's a uh, Will Smith and his wife. Um, you are all delightfully entertaining. They already thanks, know Roxanne. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no boy, Muchaba Alam. I have two. Chase, are you going to upload the MK Ultra documents? And Scott, during the conversation about big channels, you mentioned having a list of books. Do you know where I can find it? Yeah, good bibliography be handy. Yeah. All right. Yeah, just go to. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what. Go to scottrouse.com. It'll say um, an email. You know, just DM me there, and I'll give. I'll give you a list, or I'll put a list up on my. My blog at scottrouse.com. Give me till tomorrow and I'll have you a list up there. S C O T T R U S E dot com. Yeah. Cool. Chase, MK Ultra. I, I do release some of them. Some of them I, I don't want to get out. I even took the original. Hmm. So. Okay. And uh, 
Rowan Mayfair, by the way, by the way, thanks, Scott. I now use looping daily vocab. Loping, loping. I think you mean. Loping. Yeah. Oh, loping. Okay, yeah, like it, of yeah. course. Okay. Oh, yeah. cool. Nice. Uh, all downhill. What's it like for your wives slash partners? Being with a body language expert must be challenging. I, I can speak for mine. I, I, people ask, can you turn this off? You can. You learn to turn off looking and analyzing everybody you come in contact. My wife will go and say, I think this guy's full of it. Go talk to him and turn on everything. So she's she has a natural tendency to be able to, to adapt to it. I, and I've never baselined her eye movement or any of that in 20 years of being together. It's probably why we're still together. She's it's a patient. It's a video that might disagree with your statement you just made. <laughs> 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 Don't you, Scott? I, I think you had a, a little statement of some funny noises about, can I turn it off? Oh, yeah. that I did a video on whether you can turn it You can't. You can turn it off. You have to turn it off the house. You, you, you intentionally off. turn it off is what you yeah. have to not look. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you're at a party or something, and I, I'll use Greg's thing when you're and somebody says, and everything's great, you're with your friends, you're hanging out. Oh, sorry, am I on now? No, you're on, you're on. Okay, and then when you're hanging out and, and with and you've been there for a while, everything's fine. And then somebody says something weird, then everything goes ding, 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 everything comes on, and you're like, okay, and then you'll say something like, wow, really, tell me about more about that. And then everybody always goes, stop it, don't, What's that? <laughs> because he knows exactly where it's going. You know, but of course, I'm I mean, in my situation, my wife's a private eye, so she's way into this as well. So, I there's not you know, not a whole lot I can goof off and get away with, but <laughs> she's, got, she's got more on you than you've got on her, I think. Yeah, yeah, I figure of all the things Dina puts up with, this is the least. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dirk here has a very important point don't forget to hit that like button and hit subscribe while you're there, hit the bell. Um, moving on, let me see. There are so many more that have jumped back in. Uh, Dennis Waywell, how do you choose your subjects for the behavior panel, and what's next? It usually goes like this. What are we going to do Tuesday? We yeah. do them on Tuesday. And we've all got a little WhatsApp thing we go back and forth on. Is What are we doing Tuesday? What are we doing Tuesday? And we're like, I, I don't know. What do you all think we ought to do? So this last time, we didn't have anybody to do. So that, so we started doing – we've been talking about doing these um, – prepping everybody for the presidential debates yeah, mm -hmm. that, are, that are hopefully are, are coming up. So that's what we've done. These are actually shorter. Every time we get on, start doing something, we go, let's make these 20 minutes because, you know, being an hour and a half, two hours yeah. is too long. You but did that one today was 12. Yeah, well, that's the one. But the thing is, that whole thing is like an hour and a half long, and I just chopped them up. Right. So, uh, that, so that's one session of those that we did. I just, I just more lessons, it. more lessons coming out of that about oh, – yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. just the intro, and there are more to lessons talking about what an adapter and a barrier looks like individually. So yeah, we've got five or four at this point that I've. That are are you going to release them on the week, or are you going to do? Um, I think there's evaluations in between. Those are going to come out on Tuesdays, and we'll still do our our regular things come out on Thursday. But okay. sometimes I release it a little bit early without us saying anything, so the people who are subscribed get those before anybody else. There you so, go. Hit like on their channel, guys. Subscribe. Which I behaviorpanel.com. That take you right to our, our channel. Yeah, definitely. So you know what it is. All right. So, what is your favorite part of the interview style? Poking, my personal fave. Digging, etc. Uh, okay. What's your mine <laughs> is the uh, mine is if we're talking about interrogations. I'm just assuming. If we're talking about interrogations, this is the first few minutes uh, when they think they have control. Yeah. I, we're, I, we're building a baseline. Mine is the scattergun approach, and these other guys are going to going to echo the same thing because we're all Columbo fans. It's that I, one more thing. Yeah. One more thing. Once they touch the glue board, they're stuck. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a scattergun guy myself too, so I agree with that. Well, Scott just did it to me earlier. What's yeah, the, uh, the color of the handle? Wait, what's the color of the seat? What? That's like uh, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out the first question. Yeah, sorry, man. Because I'm slow. Okay, question for uh, Chase, because we're rolling here to the end. Can you show us what a teeth suck is on the behavioral table of elements? Yeah, teeth sucking is a dismissive gesture that's only been researched within the last 12 years and only by, for some reason, westernized countries. But that's when a person is we're in dialogue with each other or Greg's interrogating me. I'm the suspect. And he's asking me a question. And I go. And I mm. do that, that little teeth sucking gesture. It's kind of dismissive. 
and contemptuous. It is contempt then. Okay. I can't really do it because these are all plastic. I don't actually have any. They all my teeth have been knocked out. Tell them what happened, Chase. Well, you. I told you guys that we fight all the time. <laughs> <laughs> How it hurt. But that. But Pretty that teeth hot. suck is kind of contemptuous or uh, looking down on another person. Dismissive. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, awesome. This has been just amazing, folks. And I hope you guys come back. I mean, obviously. There's so much traffic coming in here. Maybe in a couple of months we can come back to some more clips or something of that sort. Yeah. And great fun. Thank you. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah. Thank thanks, so much. thanks, Eric. And thanks yeah, everybody man. for watching. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, thanks so, so much. <laughs> and we are live. So let's kick things off. We'll start with the bottom right. Mark, tell us about yourself. I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they speak, including some of the leaders of the G7. Up to Greg Hartley, who has a mute button. <laughs> we'll go down to Chase while Greg fills in. figures out technical. Can't hear you yet, Greg. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I'm a behavior expert. I'm number one best-selling author of a book on persuasion, influence, and behavior profiling. I train the government and the public in how to persuade people. And I've even trained some of the leaders of the G14 classified countries. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Greg, you on there? Not yet. Scott. <laughs> I'm Scott Routes, and I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement, military, and interrogation and body language, and sometimes members of the G19. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Greg? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> train Greg on technical. I don't know how we lost you. Yeah, yeah. we had you. We lost you. Oh, you're mute. Yeah, it says mute. It shows mute. On your Kick screen. Ass. Kicking ass, fellas. <laughs> right. Well, we're starting out. First thing I want to do is I have a new member, Samantha Schofield. Thank you very much. Keep trying, Greg. Um, everybody who's a member, that's up. awesome. I'm plugging them on. And before we get started, I really want to congratulate you guys. 100,000 subscribers, which is pretty freaking remarkable. <laughs> I crossed 100,000 views today. I'm stoked. You have 100,000 subscribers. Well, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. man. Except we don't have we don't have 100% of Greg, our, Greg, our thank you as well, but Yeah, from, yeah. You, Greg is Greg, on, you, on the you system. Run back in again, Greg. Greg, Go you're on, on mute man. on the screen. You're muted on screen. Your mic isn't connected. Hey, we can't hear you, Greg. <laughs> it, it flat out says that I can't you, unmute you because your mic is disconnected. So try leaving and coming back in. Yeah, leave and come back in, Greg. Let's see if that works. There he goes. God, I thought All he'd right. never leave. There he goes. I thought he'd never go. <laughs> We're back to the board of square. Can't get rid of him. <laughs> All right. All right. All so the intelligent. camaraderie yeah. is here. And I can tell you already, people are going to want to talk about the debate. Of course they are. So, of course they are. From the jump, what did you guys think overall? I'll start with Scott. Um, it was like uh, two, just like eighth graders fighting in a slap fight, and nobody was really stopping it. There was just some other kid yelling, "Stop it! Stop it!" Right in the middle of it. It was really, uh, really unprofessional. I think all the way around. Okay. Yeah. Chase. Unpresidential on both sides. And we saw a repetitive use of memorized, scripted, and surgically calculated techniques to put the other opponent or put the opponent off balance. And we saw a moderator who didn't do much moderating at all. And we talked about that on our newest episode, which will which will probably come out tomorrow. No, it'll be out tonight. As soon as we get off here, I'm uploading it. So get ready. Cool. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Who are you? Okay. Mike, who are you? This mic is a pain. I think I'm going to do a commercial against it. It does yeah. it to me occasionally. It just dumps me. So who Sorry. are you? 
<laughs> yeah, I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written a bunch of books on body language and behavior. And today I spend my time on Wall Street and in corporate America. Oh, right. Okay. And uh, what did you think of the debate last night overall? Uh, dumpster fire. <laughs> yeah, I, okay. I, did, I mean, I have not seen many things that I would be embarrassed to be part of. And I've been in a lot of things in my life, but I would have been embarrassed to be part of that production. It's a shame it went that way. Um, I think there was a methodical process that Joe Biden went through to be prepared. And he thought he was ready for a fight. He might have been ready for a fight, but he wasn't ready for that fight. And I think... <laughs> It cascaded. I would say Trump's always ready for a fight. Trump started to surgically take the left away from him. And then he showed his, you know, he, he showed them exactly what he thought when he went, don't use the word smart with me. And that put <laughs> Biden on his heels and in fight or flight and it cascaded out of control from there. That's what I saw. Mark. Yeah, I love, that. People. I love that. I, I like a good, I love a good argument. <laughs> and that's, and that's what I got. It was, it was wholly argumentative. Um, it was too long. They always are. They're too long. I was pretty much exhausted after about an hour. Oh yeah, watching it. It's like oh, I, I, I probably, I don't think I have any notes on the last section of it because <laughs> I was like, I'm out now. I can't. I can't lots of material. It. We got lots of material. So, so much material in it. It was great. Um, yeah, I mean, my my main takeaway from it is that it was it was set up badly in terms of its physical structuring for the moderator to have stand any chance of being able to control those two, and and were I be able to lobby for changes, which is what you know, in my experience of of, of working debates like that, you mm -hmm. you on, on behalf of your team you lobby the broadcaster and you say, here's what I want for my for my client. Um, were I able to lobby, I would be lobbying for a more controlled, uh, an environment that's easier for the moderator to control those two, especially if I, was, if I was not on Trump's team, if I was on the opposing right, team, yeah, I'd sure. want that guy. Right. I would create an, an environment that would shut him down. That That is the question. They're, they're actually talking about giving the moderator the ability to mute the microphone. And obviously, a lot of people like that, but isn't that problematic in its own way? Of, yeah. Yes. You're now shutting down because a lot of people could say that, boom, if something can be said and then you mute the microphone and it's hanging out there. Yeah. And you, nobody's you, allowed you, to. Defend. You lay yourself open to, to conspiracy theorists going, oh, you know, they were shutting down the mic. You know, the mic has a certain algorithm and it won't let certain words out and all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. It's, it's, like, it's, like when the, it's like when the guy's dying on his deathbed and he says to his son, the gold is is in the it's in the, <laughs> it's the same vibe. I think they should have a light, a little light bulb that lights up on the podium when that person should be speaking. <laughs> and for every time you speak when your light bulb is not on, you lose a point. And it would it could be like the uh, Drew Carey show. I forgot the name of it, the improv show where the points don't matter but there's still points in the end and the media are going to jump all over the points. Well, the media jumps over points now, even if there are none. So it's right. Just, I don't yeah. You, you, you do electrodes on the nipples <laughs> and the car battery. And every time they go, wait, over wait, I thought you were not an interrogator, Mark. I, I, well, I thought you'd love that one, Greg. That was, who are you? Deal. I had you in mind. <laughs> who are you? Train. Who are you, Bowden? You guys he work in a U26. <laughs> you mentioned preparation and precision in this and i did want to ask you you know a couple of things like one i did find it curious that biden was continuously talking to the camera and i feel like he was coached to focus oh, yeah. on that camera and maybe i'm wrong but it at points did it come across as insincere or terror like i'm not looking at this person who's yelling at me because he's really bothering me was yeah, it a I, screen I, or was it strategic from my angle, he's the evangelist. That's, you know, mm -hmm. he's you talking to the people. That's the best way to put it, I think. Yeah, it, it's not, it's, here would be my coaching on it, is, is it's not a debate. There aren't two people in the room. You're not, you're not changing the other person's mind. So it's, it's a nonsense that you say it's a debate and you even pay any attention to, the, to, to, to that other person. The only people to pay attention to is the swing vote down the lens. That's the only thing. And, and if you get a good 
comment down the lens that will get played again and again and again and again and again, you've you've won it. So you forget about anybody else in the room. It's for the audience down the lens. I think that we saw a lot of rehearsed stuff there, a lot of coaching. But one thing you'll see, especially with Biden, is this eye blocking behavior where he closes his eyes while he's talking. Trump does it too in the debate where they're really proud of something, but they want to be humble about it. Like when your neighbor gets a full electric uh, solar panel system for his whole house installed and you're like, oh, hey, I noticed you got that new solar system. And they're like, they talk with their eyes closed and they're like, oh yeah, well, it's, you know, it's good for the environment and it's not a big deal. Not my neighbors. <laughs> it's like South Park. Have you seen the South Park with the guy as a Prius? I got a oh, Prius yeah. because I'm doing my part. Yeah. Yeah. Just doing my part. It's not a big deal. <laughs> but we see the eye blocking on both sides when somebody's got a really good message about themselves. Yeah, it was just for me, it was if you had just said instead of pretending that they're going to have the opportunity to talk, if you just let them ramble at each other and go at each other, it would have been the same effect. That was Ooh, yeah. Well, I want them all to be on Joe Rogan. I mean, I'm sorry. I would love that. Somebody did ask this in the uh, comments. Did you guys see that? Who was he talking to when he was saying what, what? Because he wasn't looking at the moderator. He wasn't looking at Trump because Biden didn't seem to look at Trump at all, hardly. No, there's very little eye contact and there's a lot of conspiracy theories come out of that kind of thing, right? Now, I, I'm not saying whether there, there was an earpiece or not, not my issue. But certainly when a person does that kind of thing, then you start looking for reasons. And when they go slack faced, when they're looking, you certainly, Scott, I mean, you, you've worked with people a lot in that kind of thing. When they go slack faced, that's usually a sign of listening. So of course people are gonna fill in the blanks. When something's odd behavior, they're gonna fill in the blanks. Is there evidence? Don't know, haven't seen the evidence. But there you know, have been a lot of people who come out and say absolutely there was nothing. And then other people will come out and say, yes, there was. You're gonna get a lot of conspiracy around this. I always say, at the end of the day in this debate, you probably don't care. The people who are voting are probably don't care one way or the other whether you had a, an earpiece or not because they're voting on ideas that are dramatically different. So it's where we're at today. Okay. And what was it? <laughs> yeah. Mo yeah. Mo <laughs> most people aren't. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, somebody mentioned this. I, I guess that's true. Biden ignored Trump's fire, keeping his head down often. That's one thing. I don't know if they rested him up really well or what, but mm -hmm. Biden, you know, he held up a lot better than I expected. Yeah. Well, he went the distance. Yeah, he went the distance. He, yeah, he, he did get in quite a fight. I think, I think by the time he got to about uh, certainly the last round, I think he was very tired. Round before that, certainly tired. Uh, Trump's got a lot of energy. Uh, I was oh. uh, I was pretty yeah. impressed by how he kept on kept on going. Yeah, Biden tired as far, as far as I was concerned. I think Trump was having fun or maybe I'm reading that wrong. I think he I got think frustrated. He enjoys it. I think he got frustrated once in there and you can see the body language. We'll talk about it on our on our thing as we pull up videos, but the the for me, I think he got frustrated once or twice, but he's a master of putting people on their heels. I mean, he, he did it for a generation in the business world. If if you've ever worked in the construction business, he's the last guy you want to go to negotiate with because he's really good at that. Okay, well, overall, strategic-wise, do you think it was possibly effective? And I'm a um, previous guest of the show, Robert Barnes, who's an attorney, is claiming uh, somewhere that I listened to him, they essentially Trump won the debate in his mind because while everybody says a dumpster fire, they couldn't stand him, that's not really who he's going for. He's trying to get the blue-collar base up in arms and they actually enjoy the hectoring. Well, when I say dumpster out. fire, when I say dumpster fire, I'm not talking about him. I'm talking about the entire event, the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm not attacking Trump. The whole thing is nothing to be proud of, is my point. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know enough about what the swing vote is here. Who needs to be activated in this election to know whether somebody would have won this or not? Because what I want to know is. What did, what did each one need to achieve in terms of their numbers? Can we look at the numbers? Like I've, I've worked elections where we can look at the numbers within an hour of the debate finishing and we know whether we did the job right or not. So I, 
you know, we we can make kind of judgment calls on I didn't right. like this or I didn't like that, but ultimately you need the data to know whether this did what it was meant to do for each of the candidates. Well, I would imagine he's got a, he had an objective. If it's slice off Bernie voters, you know, something like that, that would be an objective that he would be after and try to go hard left, you know, take the hard left off. And I'm sure that Biden was doing the same thing, trying to take centrist off him. And I'm sure they both were after that. But it didn't seem like it with either of them. It seemed like they were going at their base. Well, Trump well, Trump went after that left side when he Pardon. made that comment about taking over or going after big pharma and bringing in uh, prescription drugs or giving governors, sorry, the right to go to other countries and bring in some prescription drugs there. I think that was very calculated. He also tried to get Biden to deny a couple of things that he had promised Bernie, the thing around um, around healthcare and that and around the mandate. He was trying to get him to say, I'm not doing that because then you lose Bernie voters. And, right. and he did get him to do it. He got him to say that. He got him to say Bernie was a loser. Remember yeah. that? He's like, I am the Democrat. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering if some of that, it's hard to see in the noise, but that was pointed out by Barnes too. He got it. Essentially, he sent got um to say Bernie's a loser. He disavowed Medicare for all. He disavowed you know so every Bernie plank, like three of them, he got uh, Biden to essentially disavow Bernie completely, which will piss off a lot of the Bernie support. But but I think home. I, I say this all the time. I have friends call and say, "Hey, who do you think I should vote for?" And I'll say, "Are you are you crazy? Why would you call a guy who influences people and persuades them to do things he wants them to do?" There's a, there's a guy named Jeremy in the comments who just had a great question, I think, for all of us. Okay, here we go. This one? Nope. Same guy, different comment. I know, there's a lot of comments, dude. <laughs> uh, Did he ask if we're getting paid? Maria is asking, why is Mark not looking in the direction of the camera? I think his screen's off to his left. Uh, it's, oh, it's, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got a screen off to this side. So I got a camera down here, okay, which right. is over like a third of my monitor. And then these guys are all over here on the monitor. Now I could make it a little bit better. Yeah, keep in mind, we're talking to the guy that trains there Zoom. Go. There's Mark the Zoom Evangelist there. here. When he's, he's, got a teleprompter. Here. He's, he's being fed answers. There we go. That's, <laughs> that's, but you know what? You know what? I'm, I'm kind of here. I spend all my day doing this and trying to look down that that lens. And now I'm like, I've put on a T-shirt. I'm just watching the other guys. I'm relaxing. But, yeah, I could do better. I could look down the lens more at you. There you go. This is only the second time I've ever seen you in a T-shirt. And I don't Me know if too. I like this or not. I don't no. feel comfortable. Third time. <laughs> we feel I didn't like comfortable because we're always used to you all. You're what? I, I like seeing them in the, in the T-shirt. It's definitely good. This, this used to be your flag. <laughs> yep. And then we got better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we made our own because we're rebels. There you go. All right. I hope this is the right Jeremy question. I think it's a good one, though. If you guys were coaching both of them for the next debate, what tips would you give each? Try to go with Scott. What would you say first? Yeah, good. I would say, I would say, uh, for Biden to get rid of those pins. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I I think you would you would tell them to to, uh, to pay attention to what the other one's saying, so you can have a real answer and you can have a real question. Wait, wait, you know, and try not to be such a. Um, and I'm talking about both sides. Try not, you know, just shut up and answer the questions, you know, and 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 give the feed your you know give the answers, feed your feed your thoughts. That's what people are waiting for and waiting to hear, is what you're thinking and how and. And how you think things are going to go? That that's what I think. I know Mark's got like a fourteen minute diatribe on right. that. Right, hold on. Mark will be last. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank God I didn't go first on that one. But yeah, it's simple. Just just answer the questions and let's hear what the next guy says. Chase. So I would say it's okay to step away from the podium. Number one. Number two, you've got to pay more attention to that camera and Chris Wallace than the floor. Trump spent a lot of time looking at the floor or who knows mm. what off camera. There's some lady holding a cat or something off stage. But third, presidential behavior means composure. 
I would say composure is the number one ingredient, according to Chase Hughes, of, of what we would view as a presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. If somebody's interrupting you or someone is being rude, wait mm -hmm. your turn and then address it during your turn as a president would and be respectful to another person as a president would. We're looking for people who want to set an example for our kids on how to behave and how to act. So do that. Composure, respect, and cadence. Have that nice, confident cadence, but when it's your turn. Well, you like the person who look like an idiot. That's okay. I'll pass you it over to authority, Greg. Right? Yeah, so, so for me, the same kind of thing. The most powerful thing on earth is silence. If you're an idiot and you're rambling and you're ranting at me and I stop and I look at you and I go, Chase, I'm sorry you're upset. What can I do to make you feel better? After about 30 seconds, it's a public display of stupidity is all it is. And that's how you control somebody who's ranting at you. It always works. Never had a time it didn't. So if I were in the position where I feel like the guy's ranting at me, I would do that. If I'm in a position I feel like I'm being wronged, I would point it out with numbers, facts. We all do that in our interrogation world. Bump, 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 bump. Point out where somebody's at. So those are two very different things. If I were Biden, I would stop chuckling like a woodchuck that he does through the thing. And I know it's a defense mechanism for him. Somebody should have get to him and say, stop doing that. If I were, if I were advising Trump, there are two things I would tell him. Stop being so boisterous because you come across as a bully. And the best thing, I, I'd say this always, I'm not attacking either of them as candidates, saying you shouldn't vote for either of them, but the best thing Trump could get for Christmas is broken thumbs because Twitter's not his friend. And, you know, <laughs> he has a hard time problems. with self-control. Well, his daughter said the same thing. You know, He is a, a force of nature. He does his own thing. And I'm not attacking him personally. I'm just saying people don't like that. And so you lose the opportunity to pick up some people, and Biden loses the opportunity to pick up people too with that chuckling and all that stuff he does. So they both have some weird body language things going on. And I think Trump, of all people, should know that stoic, slow moving is perceived as authoritarian. It just is. The less you move, the more powerful you appear. Mark. Yeah. So I would tell Biden to go into symmetry, be in symmetry as much of the time. He is unstable where it, when he's asymmetric. All the times that I saw him trying to do a set piece that he rehearsed and Trump would get him off balance would be when he was asymmetrical. He'd hold it for longer when he was symmetrical. I would say to Trump, just look down the camera. He was too involved in having an argument and he didn't really contact the audience directly. And so I think we were voyeurs. We were observers of Trump, but he never spoke to us. Mm. And so he missed an opportunity there of really looking. I mean, he does that a lot. He, he, he does, he's very easy, I think, to get engaged in an argument with and get him away from what his objective should be, which is to deliver his message directly to the person at home. Because they're sitting there in their home going, talk to me. And he never really did talk to the audience. He had arguments with everybody. So a bit of a failure there on, on, on his part. Uh, Biden, who had got quite good at that, was easily knocked off and he could just be more stable and do that more directly. Okay, that brings uh, another question, and I'm going to tag on it too. Do you believe Wallace is truly neutral or favored one side more than the other? And I would also say, what would you have him do next time? Because I think Wallace could stand some improvement too, maybe. I don't think he's going to have it next time after that. Yeah, I think that was it for him because he really handled that poorly. All the way around. Yeah, we. Uh, I, I would say Wallace has already publicly said that he's he leans a little to the left, but yeah. as far as what he could do for his his personal authority, I would leave that to Mark. Mark had a brilliant insight on this on the video that we just recorded a couple hours ago about. Yeah. That. So um, first of all, shout out to Gav who put that question in. Yeah. Gav, thanks, Gav. Thanks, Gav. So, uh, good to see you here. Um, yeah. So I think ultimately what needs to happen is is that is that he has no authority. And, and it's because the environment doesn't give him any authority. I think Greg was, was very perceptive as well today in an earlier conversation that we were having, which will be in our, on our YouTube, which is just the, the media, that the anchor has no authority. Eric, you probably have more authority than, 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 than you know, that's the reality. 
You can turn off our mic. <laughs> well, it depends on which yeah. live stream, uh, well, if we're being honest. <laughs> yeah, so the media, the me the traditional media doesn't have the authority anymore. They'd set up this guy who doesn't have an, any authority more in a uh, subjugative um, situation. They had height dominance over him. They need to be, if I were lobbying for this, I would get them sat down around a table. I yeah. would, I would. <laughs> I would nail their feet to the ground. Uh, I would have him standing without a, a lectern or a podium so he can move, uh, the, the, the moderator can move more, and that way he'd be able to control the situation better. The environment was badly set up for this. Okay, and got a super chat from Jamie Beaumont. Thank you. What does the next moderator specifically have to do more or less of? That was it. Yeah, and, yeah, well, I would add, he's a little accusatory in his style. When he starts off, he kind of picks a little bit of a fight before he asks a question. Just ask a question. You don't need to frame it. The guy already knows what you're going to say. For example, you he starts off with Trump, and he says, you have been in office for four years. You've taken apart Obamacare. And, well, why don't you say, what's your health care plan, and why don't you share it? You don't start off in that rock throwing contest that and he did the same with biden i'll give him credit he did both but he's accusatory in his style i think that could have saved him a lot of headaches he wouldn't have gotten that back and forth with trump for example you know that yeah. was a, that was one of those kind of super questions that came in and somebody seems to have paid like four pounds yes. nine for that and, and so yeah. i just think they're not part of the biden or trump team. jamie if they are J jamie if you're part of the biden or trump that was that was really a, inexpensive advice that you just got there for the for the team. <laughs> <laughs> that would have well, thank you. Like, you know, Thanks, five Jamie. <laughs> but that cost you four four pounds ninety nine. That was amazing. But, but Jamie, Jamie, listen to me. Eric, thanks you. <laughs> Eric, thanks you very much. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Eric definitely needs all the help. And we have um, from Samantha, who was a member. Um, I don't know much about American politics, but Biden seemed like he was attempting a semblance of order. And I thought he was quite dignified, to be honest. That's his sell point, right? As he's been in, he's been in this his entire life. And think about Trump came in with one sell point. I'm here to drain the swamp. So mm -hmm. that's his whole point is I have been here for 47 years. I am dignified. I am presidential. That's his sell point. That's the big smile, the, the right suit. Mark, Mark can talk to this more, but the right suit, the right hair, all that stuff. That, that's his sell point. So of course he's going to try to be more dignified. And Trump is a brawler a New York brawler, and you heard him forget about it kind of attitude, even flew him off with his hand, like, go away. It's it's just a different style. Mm. I mean, I, th I think, you know, Biden, Biden in comparison was maybe more stately, but still he was the state's person that got pulled into the bar fight and was there <laughs> saying, you know, shut up, you idiot, you clown. Right. Um, Are you racist? I mean, yeah. His I mean, actual it, terms were probably worse. Than Trump's. Trump hectored more, but Biden actually said more biting remarks. I've never heard anyone call another candidate a racist directly like that. Sure. I mean, or a yeah. clown. Or clown. Yeah. I mean, admittedly, that's what, you know, many people might be thinking, but it doesn't mean that you want to, as the politician, call that one out. Uh, I think the, I think the one he shouldn't have done was tell him to shut up. Yeah. Hey, Shush. Man, shut up. Shut up. Man, mm -hmm. that was. Well, that, that was an, an that was evident to me. His thinking brain was off and his reacting brain was starting to function. Mm -hmm. Well, that was something that Barnes was saying earlier, too, though, is that Trump was hectoring him and goading him to get him to say that type of thing, because then it knocks him off to where he doesn't look like the stable, steady person necessarily, that he can get just as nasty like Trump, because Trump already knows everybody thinks he's nasty. So maybe he was dragging Biden into the mud with him a little. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. No <laughs> doubt about it. Yeah, it was always ready for a fight. It's how he's wired and it's how he's gotten to where he's at. It's what he does for a living. So what would you recommend for Biden if Trump's doing that? I mean, do you actually see Trump doing that again next round? Or can you see him changing up? I'm he's going to change. Yeah, he's a closer. Remember, that's he's going to get you off balance, make you over prepare. Remember, tr at this point, I think was it first that Hillary soundly defeated Trump. If you remember, everybody thought, "Oh yeah, great job by Hillary." And then the next time he came back in, and he shifted gears, and he's he's a negotiator, and he's a strategist, and he's thinking forward. 
All right. Like him or not, he's got he's got some strengths. Whatever you think of him, he has strengths that work for his style and what he does, and that's his thing. Well, Mark, what are there any other world leaders that you've seen or worked with that are in that same line? Like uh, maybe a Boris Johnson. What is he like in comparison to Trump? Uh, Boris is a is has some similarities to, to Trump in that Boris is an incredible entertainer. I mean, just wonderful to be around, can tell incredible stories, has this brilliant kind of bumbling character to him. Um, I've, I've seen him do a, do his keynote where where what he does in his keynote, I mean, this is before he's prime minister, is he lit, he comes into the event late. And he's and he's and he and he does this whole act of of of, of where, where am I? What what event is this? And 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 so you see this person who clearly doesn't know what's what's going on at all. And he scribbles a few a few kind of notes, and he comes up with this bumbling piece of paper, and then and bumbles around for a bit, and then delivers an incredible set speech. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> but he, you know, he's done, basically you just go, this guy is an idiot and then you go oh, he's really quite smart that's so one good entertainer. understand he, he started off really the public the general public knowing him from being the 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 bumbling editor of the spectator who would be on uh, a, a a comedy show called have i got news for you and he mm. was the butt of the joke <laughs> every time and so but this is the same guy had always said he was always being set up to be to be prime minister you know, he was uh, he was head of Cambridge debating, president of the debating society, and oh, wow. already on that trajectory. So brilliant entertainer, who everybody looked at and went, you know what, what a bumbling clown. But he's now prime minister. Are there some similarities? I think there are. That's right. oh, by the way, that you brought up Colombo. I have an announcement. I meant to say it earlier. I found out today. That you can stream Colombo for free on Amazon Prime Video. Perfect. Brilliant. I know. Yes. I know. Yes. <laughs> and it's how about the box DVD set? <laughs> I have a DVD player? Oh yeah, you probably got something else. My kids, got, my kids have an Xbox. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Stick it in there. Okay. I don't got it. I've got, Send it back. I've got that echo, that that big echo two thing, you know, it's a screen, the uh, yeah, you know what? I I, say it when I when I get my next check from Soros there. or the McCanns, I, I may go buy one though. You got to get you one of those. Man. He Coke sent brothers. me one. I thought you got it. Yeah, Coke Brothers. <laughs> yeah, no. You know, we're on, you're on payroll. Go go read the comments. We're on payroll for uh, the McCanns, Soros, Trump, Biden, and Satan. Um, Hang on, let me let, let me address this, please, <laughs> just for a second. Let's get this straight. Who's doing what? Yeah, uh, Greg is a Nazi. <laughs> uh, Mark is a devil worshiper, and then me and Chase are on the uh, payroll. I'm on Soros, and I think the McCanns are the one that's paying Chase. Uh, McCanns, yes. Well, and Scott, yeah. you lead your own tribe of. Um, I, not yes, I do. <laughs> Scott, Scott oh, has the best man. nickname of all. So we're. I think that's going to be our yeah. Halloween costumes when we do our thing. Is we'll put that as our names across the bottom: Nazi, Satan, oh, or man. Soros Ooh. supporter, and then mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, yeah. That's a rough. That was bad. That was bad. <laughs> you definitely should. And to close out the debates um, speak, I'm going to bring up one more Barnes thing that I thought was interesting. He said that he has a methodology for when he's betting. And I'm bringing him up because he's a guy who won over $500,000 on Trump in 2016. Mm -hmm. And he said the way he judges candidates is he looks at them and he determines who would people feel – more comfortable asking to lie for them. <laughs> it's a, I've never heard it, you know, said before. And so, so is the guy who lies that you, that you feel more comfortable with, that's the winner? Right. The, the person that you went to and you say, I need you to cover my butt. Uh, oh, I got you. Who, who is going to be a more convincing liar for me to another nation, to whatever, Mm. is the person that he would pick as a winner. So I'm just curious, overall, you know, uh, just a, a narrow, it's not a judgment, which one would you think is the better liar? Mm. Well, that, that, making that selection is the same as I did in high school when we picked somebody to go buy alcohol. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> exactly. Who's so gonna, who would you who's have? Gonna buy the buy the beer? So who's yeah. going to buy the beer, Chase? I, I, 
Granted, that's illegal. I'll make a disclaimer. Yeah. Shouldn't I'm be done. She's chased. I'm going to assume you never got picked because you must have looked like six. He, he looks, looks like he's, he's 11 now. now. <laughs> you look like he's 11 right now. Why I moisturize. I moisturize, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Chase, when you get my age, Cougars are still going to be hitting on you, man. <laughs> Mark my words. I think I'd pick Trump. I'd, I'd pick Trump because he'd be like this. I'd say, listen, man, you got to go tell those dang Canadians. I got a buddy over there at that so-and-so and so-and-so. And he'd go, I got you, boo. <laughs> well, he definitely and has I'd more street. About I, it, there's a lot more street to him than there is to, to Biden. You, you look at Biden, and Biden's been in this business since he was 20 something. He's, I was, my, I think he's second, the second youngest senator ever. Mm. So he's been in this since he's in his 20s. So he's been in that polished, got to do the right thing, behave the right way. And you know, we've all seen video of Trump, you know, dancing at Mar-a-Lago and that kind of stuff. So it's just, it's a polished versus a street kind of guy. And if you're thinking that way, you'd think you'd go with a street guy. There's some research actually suggests, I think it's Kierkegaard in 96, 97, 98, one of those years, the most popular kid in every high school that they studied, I think it was over 100, was also rated as the best mm -hmm. liar. Hmm. And there's a, uh, yeah, this is well that. known, I think it's very Googleable, but this, this charisma and likability yeah. was directly correlated to somebody's ability to lie to other people. Mm -hmm. Or their ability to be Psychopaths are good liars. Yeah. Like you've got to be able to lie. If you can't lie, you're never going to get on with people. If you can't tell the truth, it's Social the lubricant. Yeah. 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 Most people don't want to hear the truth. Not really the truth. So, Mark, who's going to buy your booze? <laughs> no, we, we lived in England. Like <laughs> You're poor and you got money. I think okay, well, when you're in England, it's like four and a half. In pubs where we were 12. There was nowhere else. <laughs> to go. I, and you would get served. You would honestly get served. There was never a problem. You would absolutely get served. Not a problem. All right. I <laughs> like I can dance out of that one. So eloquent. All right. So moving on to another one. This is a question from Mark coming from, oh, this is Ellis Frazier. Mm -hmm. Fraser. Question for Mark coming from a theatrical background. Do you feel it would benefit actors to learn basic body language in order to deliver a naturalistic performance? Yeah. So having trained, you know, spent years training other actors, um, I'm not sure whether, it depends what you mean by basic body language. Um, I, I think the most important thing for performers to learn is to extend their vocabulary. We kind of, we tend to be set in our vocabulary because we are who we are, we grew up we, where we grew up, we've mirrored our, our primary caregivers and we, and we end up with a set with, a, with some patterns. And therefore, if, if somebody comes to you and goes, will you perform this other character, this other person, which is character is just a set of choices under circumstance. Well, your body will only do what you would do, not what that character would do. So one important thing is for you to um, uh, practice or, or, or work on performing behaviors that you wouldn't normally do so that you've got a bigger range of, of behaviors. That's my answer. What do you guys there were more than two people on earth with that same name, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I, I had to share the comment with Chase. <laughs> Scott, you've been in the um, theatrical realm, or at least in the music industry. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, body language would do you well? I think Chase is very handsome. I'll say that. <laughs> we all think Chase is handsome. Yeah. Uh. I don't get to see these come in live ever. So you get to see my face turn red or whatever color the hell it is. Yeah. Ours too. It's great. Thanks, Scott. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, man. I got you, boo. Um, yeah, I think it's important because when you're in the music business, you have to, one of the reasons that people liked hanging out with me is because I could go watch them or help them as they made their deals with a record uh, company. Because we would, for example, if you're doing, um, a group that's similar to other groups. Sometimes what a record company would do was they would gather, they would sign the other groups that were similar to it. And they would say, Oh, we're going to do a record and you're going to do, and they'd spend all this time with them and money, but they wouldn't 
put their album out until that fad was almost over until it was starting to, to go down because they didn't want the competition for their, the group they already had. So I could go in and watch these meetings wow. and say, these people want to help you and these people don't want to help you. And so there were a couple of acts that I worked with that we, we really scored well because it, it, because we figured, we figured that my skill set in that was what could help us with that. So it's very, it's very like, but like acting or like anything else, in business and a lot of times i get asked to or i get hired to go into a business situation and pretend like i work for this company and just watch them talk i don't have to say anything or i'll have questions for them to ask but if i'll have my hand on the table and if i go one finger up like that then they'll know or i'll go like that they'll know this means this question if i go like that it means another question so mm. then, i think it's really important to to be able to um to, to use that skill as you're pitching your act and to see what's going on on the other side of the table, most importantly. Eric, there's a great question from somebody named Ali C. 1970. I've got it queued up. Oh, got it queued up already. Good deal. <laughs> question for the panel: If someone was abused to the point where they have come to the point to come to the point they question themselves, how does that play into being able to read their behavior? Everybody has a baseline, and whether you're questioning yourself or not, you have to start from that baseline. You have to get enough data about the person to figure out what's changing. Remember, if all you do is read absolutes, you, then everybody's going to jail because everybody scratches their nose when you ask them a question is guilty if you think absolutes. But if you talk to a person who is timid and who is closed and who is second guessing themselves and suddenly they come out of that or suddenly they get worse, it means something. That's what we all do is we, we, we try to put people at ease. As, as horrific as most people think interrogation is, it's really about trust and getting people at ease so they will start opening up to you. And you can see it in people who've been abused or in people who may be boisterous and over the top. You see deviation in that baseline. I think it's, uh, and I've spent a long time studying mind control for the government, brainwashing stuff. And I think someone who is abused on a regular basis at a young age becomes an expert unconsciously at something called dissociation. And dissociation is common in all mammals that we know of now undergoing something uh, traumatic. A zebra gets bitten by a crocodile. The part of the brain that's conscious and that's basically hitting the record button on memories goes mm -hmm. somewhere else. It backs away. So I've noticed over the years, somebody, people who have had an experience or many experiences of being abused when they were younger, they dissociate easier, which makes it harder for stressful situations for them to be more self-aware of their own behaviors because of that dissociative process. What I find ironic is the disassociation right now with your video signal. Is it slowing down? Kind of keep, it can, you come in and out, in and out, and you're talking about disassociation. I'm like, it's an interesting parallel here. Well, welcome to my I'm electronic cell today. <laughs> yeah. I'm not getting any of that from Chase. All right. Oh, really? On your end, I think. It looked good up from here. Yeah. yeah. Eric, it okay. might be I yours. Recording. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. usually pay. You got to pay that extra $16 from Verizon. No, you yeah. got to get space, the space. Take some of that four, four pounds 99 that was paid for. <laughs> well, I know. And he brings it back around. Oh, uh, Internet. <laughs> good close. <laughs> Scott, yes. Your thoughts? Oh, my! What I've what I've learned from people <laughs> who've, been, who've been abused and in those situations, especially when they have a narcissistic parent, those people become extremely good at reading body language and reading human behavior, and they can see as as they expect what's going to happen. Narcissist and and psychopaths, of course, you know, it's one of my favorite things in the world. But when you when you talk to someone or you meet someone who's done that, you can almost spot that person by the way they describe other people. And the way they say, uh, women, I always say women have the most powerful um, secret power in the world, which is women's intuition. Yep. And how they mm -hmm. can spot somebody watching for two minutes and go, I don't like that guy or I don't like that girl. That girl's trouble. This guy's trouble, whatever it is. But you'll, if you'll start paying attention, you may not know a person who has a narcissistic parent. But once you do, you'll say, they, they sure can spot a lot of this stuff that I'm spotting, you know, if you're a, 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 in the business we're in. And you'll start noticing that from various other ones as well that you know, or that you'll say, once you get to know them, you talk about their parents, or they may be one of those people that are, you know, vocal about it. But I'll tell you, they are powerful um, 
grabbers of these big things that, that tell you something's right, something's not wrong uh, with, with a person. I have a question on that too. You mentioned narcissism and all that. Have any of you, and Mark, you're not off the hook on this one either. Um, any of you notice a difference between single children versus children with siblings? And I'm asking it because typically single children tend to be more selfish focused, if you will, because they've always been on their own since they were a child, so to speak, versus children with siblings tend to say we more or think we more. Have you guys noticed any of that or would that factor into what you do? Can I go first here on this, guys, you, sure. if you don't mind? Yeah. People who grew up with a lot of older siblings, especially more than one, are more protective over their personal property. Their phone on the table will be closer to them. Their purse will be closer to them. It'll be zipped up. The handles won't be hang out. It'll be closer, uh, uh, further away from the public. We'll see a lot of that behavior in people with a lot of older siblings. People who are only children, I think that's a phrase, yep. Yep. will be a little bit more open and carefree with pieces of property that they have. So how we interact with objects definitely changes. And I think our other behaviors are, are affected too. And I'll let other people answer that part. Yeah, yeah, I would say, Chase, I'm, it depends on birth order, right? If you have a bunch of siblings, you may be the youngest and you're protective of your stuff. So is the oldest because he has a bunch of little kids around jacking around with his stuff. So right. I think that happens on both extremes. If you're an only child, usually you engage older people in a, in a different fashion than like somebody who is around a lot of kids, has a lot of kid banter, that kind of thing. But if you're an only child, you're mostly around adults, except for when you go out. And you know, there's so many people on my bell curve, there's so many different variables in this. I think it's hard to brand anybody with the same iron. You just have to poke and prod and pick and figure out exactly what causes it. Mark, Scott? Yeah, I, I can't get over that at the moment, Chase, you look like a Jehovah's Witness that might not. <laughs> not <my door. laughs> <laughs> it's like, what are you? Let me tell you what he's doing. Hang on, hang, yeah. hang on a bit. About <laughs> God, <laughs> the first ever copy printed of Think and Grow Rich. I thought, oh nice. Be- oh God, cool. I didn't nice. know that. Very cool. <laughs> is it really? It first is. edition, huh? I'm going to figure out what I'm reading now. But I, I think uh, that, um, yeah, certainly I know, for, like I've got, I've, got, um, I've got an older sister and, and a younger brother and sister who are 10 and 13 years younger than me. And um, certainly, like, they had to protect their food because if they <laughs> ever took their eyes off it, it was like, that's mine. Um, yeah, there wasn't much food in the house, and, 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 and there was a, a general pecking order. So... Uh, so yeah, I can totally see. I've, I've never really thought about that. In, in so it's really got my mind um, thinking, and I don't know where I'd get any hard data uh, on it. But it's an interesting question, interesting area. Okay, and there's the abuse question, Mark, that you never got to. Uh, what was it that the pe- people who have been abused to the point uh, where they question themselves. Well, you know, I just concur with what Greg said, which is yes, everybody has a baseline, so you're going to have to go from go from that. Yeah, I'd, I'd concur with that answer. All right, and Scott, on I don't remember only the question. Children. Chase is messing with you. That's why I keep getting the shits and giggles. <laughs> what, was your, well, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, cute. Only children. Have you noticed a uh, difference between only children? versus those who have multiple siblings in terms of an only child sometimes being maybe coming off as more narcissistic or more selfish because they've always been independent or on their own. They're thinking of themselves. I think a lot of times they want to be parts of groups. They want to be a part of a group because they're not used to having a group and they'll, and they'll say things. I wish I had a sister or they'll call people who aren't their sister, their sister or their brother. They're more uh, along that, uh, you know, the, to say my brother so and so or my sister so and so, we're like sisters. They're, they're more apt to say those types of things because they never had those. And a lot of times, they are as well good at at, at spotting body language because their their head, their their mind is wide open at the house. When I grew up, my brother and I had the same room. My sister had her own room, and so we were all the time yammering and talking and stuff. But we had a friend of ours who who was who didn't who was a, an only child, and he was he was different all the way around because. It, 
to, as a, you know, to children, we really don't give that big a deal. But for some reason, when I was little, I was into watching people's behaviors and his, and his whole thing was becoming part of, of becoming a part of a group and being a part of something. And he would, he could easily figure out how to easily fit into groups. Sometimes you have the same type of a single, uh, uh, um, child where they don't fit into groups because they didn't learn those interactions with, with family members or, or as children. So you see, you see that a lot as well. They, they don't, they don't, they can't incorporate themselves into a mm -hmm. group as well. And they, they, and that can cause problems later on because you, they, they feel lonely. They, you know, they'll get depressed because they can't get into um, the groups it can, because they simply don't know how, especially with a narcissistic parent, it's hard for them because they won't have learned how and, the, and that person wouldn't have helped them. To do, to do to learn how to do that. Hey, what's your guys' birth order? I've never asked you that. I'm middle. Uh, second of four. I'm actually uh, first. Me too. Yep, oldest. Yeah, this I'm the middle. Of, I'm the middle of three. I don't know if this is true or not, but somebody wrote in: all NASA astronauts were firstborn children. If that's true, that's badass. Yeah. How the twins do it? Right there. I'd like well, to know. Well, firstborn kids are often the guys who try to organize everything they come in contact with, just in the, in your nature. Is nobody hey, seeing this stuff? With, hold on a second. Is nobody seeing this shit with Chase? All the stuff he's, he's been he, jacking around. Yeah, he's been held up different pins as we go along. Yeah. Pins, he's held up like nine pins. Next thing you know, they'll have a firearm or utensil of some kind out. I think we should tell the uh, people that's... on the live and then ask them not to comment about it on the YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Let me tell you what he does. If you see me getting the shits and giggles on here, then I'll, then I'll take my pen and scratch my face with it. Because yeah. every time he holds up a new pen, a different colored pen, then I'll scratch my face with a pen because so, to let him know that I know that's what's going on. So, and to, throughout our, yeah. <laughs> yeah, throughout our videos uh, through, on our YouTube channel, thebehaviorpanel.com, Yes, check it out. You'll see him use different. He'll pick up and talk about different. Uh, use different pens as he's talking, and different colored ones as we go through the through the videos. So, and that's what he's doing now. He's he's messing with me because uh, video. Yeah. So, guys, if yeah. you go back and watch our videos, we'll probably one day have a contest. So, don't tell anybody. Yeah, don't don't comment about it. If you're in the live, don't comment about it. And that's why I wanted to make it extreme and then like start gesturing with a, with see, a, The only thing I could find was this to be, and I was like, scratch my. Well, everything Just close today. by me is not appropriate. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. What kind of image is that conjurer? Um, what about adopted oh, children? children? Do you think they carry a lot of trauma? This is from Astro Essex Girl. Guys, I mean, the, the problem with making generalities around that is every one of their experiences will have been different, you know, depending on where they come from, adoption, where they're born, at birth, separate. There's all kinds of stuff associated with that and how much love they're given by their parents. Remember, nature and nurture matter. So it's hard to put all that into one thing. I'll tell you, I've been in places, and Chase, I know you have too, where people are separated from their parents because of war. And it's amazing how resilient some people are. They're just, you can't even predict it there. So it's tough to say if a person separated from their parents and adopted by loving people, that they're gonna be different. I think it's just tough to call that. Yeah, we had a guy on, on my uh, two deployments ago, back when I was on active duty, we had one guy that uh, was really fragile, felt really fragile. He was an adopted person, turned out to be a very good uh, gunfighter, for lack of a better term. Had another guy that was a legitimate UFC fighter uh, that, that urinated on himself the first time he got into a fight. So, I mean, that's that's not a predictor of, of future right. behavior. We don't know what's going to happen until it happens. And then the situation we find ourselves in, we may be more authoritative or less responsible or concerned with the other person or empathetic based on situation or just based on the day that we've had. Yep. So, I, mean, I think uh, making generalities might be a little irresponsible. Well, it. to that point, uh, Chase, that's why often personality tests and those kind of categorizations around personality yeah. don't impress me very much. They're very much Barnum statements, very much horoscopes, because, you know, put somebody in a different situation and a whole bunch of other behaviors will cascade out that you weren't expecting from that particular personality. Sorting tool. They're just sorting tools for putting your head around somebody and figuring out how they function. For me, you know, I worked in a stress lab, one of the best on earth, and I watched some of the <laughs> smartest and toughest people on earth come apart in weird ways. 
So if, if you want to know what you're dealing with, put people under high stress, it's amazing what happens. I saw a note I would respond to, is there a test for keeping psychopaths from becoming general officers? Yes, it's called the Army or the Navy or the Marines because mm. you get peered out by, <laughs> that's the whole system is how you get promoted by being ahead of your peers and one of the best. And they can make or break you as well. The military is a very, uh, is a very complex organization and culture. There's a there's a comment here from Lori Miller. Has anyone from your YouTube channel come up to you in public yet? Yeah, hmm. <laughs> me too. Oh, oh, you mean uh, anybody who's who's been in the uh, in the? No, no, not to me. No, no, no. I mean from like uh, any of our YouTube. And recognized you. Yeah. Uh, I was, yes, yes. Me yeah, too. Yeah. Where yeah. did it happen to you, Mark? Right, I, I was on my porch. I was literally sitting on my porch with a glass of wine, and this couple walked by, and the, and the guy goes, <laughs> and I go, because oh, I think, hey, it's just a local. And he is local, but he recognized me from the show. And he's like, you, you're on that, that show, the behavior panel. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I have to Hattie B's. I no, got me a, a Delta Sky Lounge in Atlanta Airport at a layover. This is just a few weeks ago, and an older woman had to be in her mid seventies. I had a mask on, a mask on my face, and she came up to me and she said, "Are you the boy from the behavior <laughs> show on uh, on YouTube?" And man, that was incredible. That even with a mask on in the Delta Lounge, we had someone find Chase's phone number and call and ask, "Were we okay?" Because we were late with the video last week. Yes. That's yeah. Right. From Hawaii. Karen is her name from Hawaii, I think. From Hawaii, yes. Yeah. Mine you know, happened at, at Hattie B's Hot Chicken. I'd, I'd been down remember the other day when I said I've been eating a bunch of hot chicken, and Chase was like, Do you feel okay, man? I was like, Yeah, I've been eating a bunch of chicken, I ate too much. Anyway, so that's when my, that was the day mine happened when I was sitting in the line, and there's two people, there's the line outside where they're all, you know, space and stuff, but I was sitting in the car because I'd ordered from the phone. They're getting ready to bring it out. I know some talking about me. I thought, Well, I haven't, hope I haven't worked with these people before. Remember yeah, me? You'll know what that means. And then, uh, then I, and then, and then some guy goes, goes, "Hey, man!" And I was like, yeah, "Here we go." He goes, "I saw your show, the Behavior Panel." I was like, "Ah, that's great, man. That's great, great, great." He goes, "When's the next one coming out?" I said, "Thursday, Thursday, every Thursday." Said, ah, yeah, all right. Well, I'm and a car guy, it. and I had the same thing. I went in to get something done to my car, and the guys in the place were looking at me, and they said, "Hey, we watch true crime all the time on TV, and aren't you that?" Yeah, it's pretty cool to see. Right. It's great. Wow. I'm yeah. a poor, very, very I, famous. I think she could tell she could tell who you were just from how smooth the skin was on your forehead. Yep. I think so too. It's his eyes. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> I don't know. It's well, I don't know. Austin Penn was the pen. Was the it's probably the pen. Kind of. Comment from May Britt Muller. When I was between four and seven, I was Mine. apparently excellent. Mine. Oh, I guess you know. I was apparently excellent at spotting bad men. No abuse apart from being a woman. Is it uh, very normal for children to have a great radar? Depends on the child. Yes. Yeah, I really yeah. do. I think I think we come equipped with a lot of things that get knocked out of us. Because when you're a child, man, you're wide open. You're just like, boom. And everything that comes in. And you pay attention. People don't pay attention to you as a child because mine started as a child. And I remember thinking about what I was seeing in these people. And if, if your parents are talking to someone or an older person talks to someone and somebody comes in and speaks with them, they will ignore you and think that, you know, they can not that they can ignore you and do whatever they want, but they, they don't really focus on being that person that they're being to your parents or someone else in front of you. And that's and, and I think that I think that's potent. I think a lot of times. We're just, we're wide open as children. I think yeah. it depends on the person though, because plenty of children get into bad situations because they're poor judges of character. So it, it depends on the person. I think if you have a natural talent for it, it's much stronger when you're young. I always say we all are born capable of reading body language. We turn it off to be polite. That's right. And I think as kids, the reason kids are so good at it is when we grow up, we're social animals. Kids are not social animals. Yeah. Kids are in front of their eyes in a conversation, and we spend our lives behind our eyes in a conversation. Yeah, kids only get that that social part. The social mammalian brain really starts kicking in, you know, quite late. Really, kind of, you know, six to eight. Yes. Sometimes even later with some. So yeah. 
you know, for everybody out there who maybe has had a had a kid and seen them develop, there's there's a period where they are just sociopaths. I know that's maybe not the right term, but ultimately no, no, they learn empathy. Care about yes. anything else? Me, me, me. Anything else? My, my, my. Yeah. Oh, my voice down because I'm going to talk about my daughter. Um, it wasn't really until the age of about above eight, maybe even nine, that she was able to keep a deal. You do a deal with her. You go, well, if you know, if if I give you this, then you will do this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you do it, and you go. So will you do the thing? She's like, no. <laughs> I, but, but we made a deal. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm. When we, you're breaking, <laughs> yeah, 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 it doesn't matter. Yeah, and then I go. Um, Sounds okay. like a politician. Yeah, you know, you know, there'll be a problem next time we come to make a deal. I won't be able to trust you. And she go, I don't care. We'll, we'll deal with that next time, right? <laughs> but you could not negotiate with her because the the social part of the brain had not really developed enough to go. Oh, you actually need that other person. You need to make deals with them and keep deals with them hadn't kicked in and of course because you know i love her i wasn't retracting food resource and heat and you know there was no penalty for being antisocial. so wow you're thinking way into that mark we talked <laughs> no, about i think he's projecting survey. that we I'd probably like to ask you some would. questions <laughs> <laughs> all right your thoughts scott i you know I don't even remember the question. I'm too busy waiting for I think Chase he to do something. started that one. It was, uh, are they are they more perceptive? You know, do they have the ability? Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. you did. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right, this one's got to be for Chase. He can uh, put, hold up a pen. Uh, Kevin Walker again. Any thoughts on the police slash military using hypnosis to obtain information and its reliability? Okay, let's. I'll, I'll give you a short answer here. Uh, thoughts on the police using hypnosis to obtain information. Hypnosis. The veracity of hypnosis is 100% dependent on the operator, the person doing the hypnosis. False memories can be created in as little as 20 seconds. And if you think about a false memory of your 10th birthday, if I put a giant T-Rex, a three-foot-tall plastic T-Rex statue at your third birthday party or 10th birthday party, that false memory, when you go back next time and look at it, it's a memory. It's a fact. So those hmm. things can be very, very influential when it comes to memory retrieval. Hmm. Hypnotically retrieved memory is not admissible in court, but it can be very useful to get details of a crime scene from witnesses and from people who knew details about maybe the crime scene or the area that it happened, but it's typically never and and, and in, in good measure, it's not used with suspect memory retrieval. It's typically used with other people's memory retrieval. And as far as hypnosis and interrogation, that's a completely different subject that I will absolutely not even touch. Interestingly, you don't need to hypnotize most people to improve their memory. Good, solid questioning improves memory. There's a so interrogators in the operations world are also debriefers, and what that means is when you come back from a mission, we ask you questions about where you were, sometimes to get information that you might not even notice. And you'll I'll say, for example, hey, how many green diamonds did you see in the building you're in? None. Then I walk you down the hall. Have you tell me what you saw? Oh yeah, I saw a green diamond on that door. Questioning is a powerful tool because it structures a way for people to recover information. Yep, behavioral interviewing. All right. Yep. Yeah. Scott. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, that one, I don't know anything about hypnotizing. I don't really... All right. <laughs> I got nothing. Scott, I got yes. nothing on that. All right. Only thing hey. I do, I sometimes I question Chase's ability to do that, or, or not his ability, but when he's doing it, because I don't know if you guys are doing this too, but like twice a day, I send him $40 on Venmo. <laughs> Is that? <laughs> That's just you. Is it just okay? Just, I don't know about that, and, and I have the audio recording, so it's fine. Yeah, well, I saw a really good question on there about drugs in in interrogation. Lots of experiments with that in the sixties and seventies. Lots of it. And what we do know is lowering your inhibitions is good. A good drink is a great opportunity to get people to talk. That's one of the things you know. Too much alcohol, yeah, then you start running stuff together. But you know, I think Scott, you gave me a bottle one time that says truth serum on it. 
for scotch. <laughs> it's exactly yeah. one of the best truth serums there is. It's true. This um, then would be a good one to start with Scott on. Professional HR person with imposter syndrome and extreme interview anxiety. I'm qualified but can't cope. Any tips? So this is Garden Witch. I can jump yeah. on this. I was going to say, let's go to Chase because we've talked about this with Chase in depth for about uh, three weeks now. And I'm I'm an open book. I'm the same person off camera as I am on YouTube. I'm not. I'm no different. Uh, I I consulted their help the other day. I just finished and doing an article for Vogue magazine. I was just called by I don't know if I could say his name yet, but the number one TV personality in America prob- called us the best in the world. And Im- imposter syndrome is still there. I think for for most of us, I, I won't speak for the panel, but I think for a lot of people, it stays for a long time. I've I've well past the 20, maybe 25,000 hour mark in my profession. And I still get up on stage and think, do I know enough to be standing here? And that's up to you to decide at the end of the day. I'm, I published the number one best selling book in my field. And I have all these things that prove to me or might prove to someone else that I'm, I'm uh, a, the credible expert, maybe the leading expert in the world even. And still I feel, is there something else I should have done before speaking to these people or should I be on this stage? And I still feel that way to this day. So I think it's a natural thing. And I think you just got to get over it and say that it's okay. We're de- if you're delivering value, you're delivering value from uh, Garden Witch. So that was the most exposed I've ever been on YouTube. I think I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I have imposter syndrome right now, just being in, in your presence. <laughs> no, I think every, a, a lot of people get that. And I think it's natural yeah. because when, you, when you're really passionate about something, it means, and you realize that it means more to you than a lot of the people you're dealing with in that business. Then you go, well, I can't believe I'm the, I sold more of these records or whatever it is than, than this guy did. You know, you got to be kidding me. And they hand you a big old thing with like five of these platinum records on it. And you go, Holy smokes. I can, and you're watching everybody and they give you yours too in the little ceremony thing. You're like, holy, I don't need to be, I shouldn't be here. Yeah, that last for me, it didn't last that long in that business because everybody, you know, because of that business for the music business. But once you, once that starts happening after a while, you get used to it. And I think you, and you'll get past it. But especially when you start getting a whole lot of heat at once, when you've done some things and all of a sudden, bam, a bunch of stuff comes on you goes, they're going to find out this isn't that I'm fake. They're going to, they're going to know, they're going to know. They go, no, I'm not fake. I went because I went through I went through that when I was a kid too, Chase. So I, I, hear, I hear you. Every one of us has been through that. And as I said, the same yeah. thing, Chase, especially in this business where you can be here and not have gone to school X or Y. I mean, yeah, if you go punch your ticket at an Ivy League school, you know what you've gotten. But when you get here to this business, the way you get here to this business, it's probably more, there are probably more imposter syndrome issues with us than there is any other. And then the last thing I will say is it's a good sign that you're that you're having that because malignant narcissists don't have that. <laughs> they're, they're I, I, literally just uh, an hour and a half ago, I got off the call with a probably I think the second highest paid female actress in America still has the same syndrome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She's at the top of the food chain as far yeah. as that is concerned and still has the same exact syndrome. Yeah, so I work I work constantly with people who are what I would call high performers, top performers, and they all have imposter syndrome. And and that would include people who literally have gold medals. Like it, it's unequivocal that they are the fastest or the jump the highest, or it's like it's like you've got a gold medal. It's like, yeah, but I, I'm worried that people, you know, will will question that. You can't quit it's a gold medal, you can't question it. It's only you have it for that event that that every four years, you know. <laughs> so it, I think it's usually quite a good sign of a top performer, somebody who cares so much about being good and being invested in it that uh, they're constantly worried that um, that they won't they don't know enough. Mm-hmm. And it's a good thing. Are you familiar with the Dunning Kruger effect? Yeah. Oh yeah. I feel like that that ties my first book by talking about the Dunning Kruger effect. Yeah, Yeah. we love talking about it. Yeah, Yeah. we talk about it all the time. We see people go, "Yep, there it is." You want a poster? We can give you one. How about uh, Gelman Amnesia? While we're throwing them out there, 
Don't know. Yep. Is that a, a, the name of somebody? Uh, Gelman, Murray Gelman came up with it. Uh, Michael Crichton brought it up a lot. What that is, is you guys are all experts in your field, right? And you'll read an article, let's say, in the paper, and you'd be like, these people have it completely wrong. They're idiots. They don't know what they're talking about, you know, well, whatever your expertise is. But then you read another article, and you don't know the subject. You're like, how dare such and such do such and such? Because you have amnesia about the fact you already know that the people who are writing the articles are idiots, or they may be getting their facts wrong. Mm -hmm. But you forget about it and don't apply that same principle to other articles that aren't on a subject you necessarily know. That's mm -hmm. the amnesia. Lack of frame of reference, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, because we have a habit of doing that. I mean, we know people are wrong. And I'm going to close out with one more. I know that Scott, I think, has a hard out. And I think this is a, a <laughs> great one to finish on. Got to get out and get that chicken. He loves his chicken, does Scott. Yeah, he does. <laughs> loves his chicken. Cindy Callahan. <laughs> How do we follow our instincts and remain socially appropriate in both of our private and professional lives? Don't. I think we started with this one. The same advice we gave the politicians. Use your instinct. But take a second, be compassionate, pay attention to the other person. And it, if you do that, you can still use all this stuff. All of us have to do this in daily life. We all see body language that screams, hey, this guy's an idiot. But we don't say, you're an idiot. We, we just back <laughs> down. And if you wait long, if somebody's an idiot in your life, if you wait long enough, they'll have a billboard around their neck. Mm -hmm. It'll happen. So don't worry about it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a mammalian part of our brain which moderates our instinctual behaviors and if that moderation isn't hasn't been uh, socially primed or it's not working properly you've got somebody who is antisocial uh, and it can suddenly burst out suddenly burst out or they're just antisocial all the time and it's just a weird person to be around and sometimes sometimes you know you drink enough or you take some drugs and you know that moderator will and it's like now you're doing weird you know naughty stuff so we, we've got a we've got a whole system for this. You have it. We have instincts, and we have moderators of those instincts. And uh, you would never want your instinct to take over all your behavior. It would be mayhem, especially if you like your testosterone or estrogen levels were up. Sure. Imagine, imagine my, my, you know, one of my kids who are, who their testosterone or estrogen levels are all over the place at the moment, and they hadn't got a good moderator. They would be ripping the place apart. At the moment as it is they're just kind of breaking it lightly but without without that moderating brain they'd be tearing the place up so we, we moderate all the time hey somebody asked if we'd be open to having judy james on the panel do you, any of you guys know her personally i d don't know her personally no uh, judy james is the i uh, i think the english um lady who writes i think for the daily mail on oh so we know that mark's down for this have another brit <laughs> no, it's two in two. What's yeah. happening? You never want Sorry. two in the room. They'll start wanting your country back in there. It's going to be a coup. Yeah, it's going to be a coup. <laughs> Behavior yeah. coup. They didn't even want him back. They put him in Canada. Well, we know what happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, just thank you guys for listening to us today. Oh, well, there you go. Well, folks, this has been really wonderful. And I want to get you guys to commit on the camera. Are you coming back? Always. Yeah, yeah. Great yeah, fun. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. You don't have to ask us. We're, we'll, we'll, whatever you need. Awesome. Well, I plan to have everybody back in any which way, and everybody uh, smash the like, whatever that, you know. Sure. Um, please hit subscribe. Thank you. Thank everybody for coming, and we'll see you next time. Everybody who is watching, now I'm waiting for the number to go in. So before I set up the baseline, why don't you guys introduce yourself? because it's always fun with Greg and on down the line. I'll start. I guess you want to start. We're used to Greg, win. Well, Scott. this is how we usually go. I'm yeah, Scott Rouse, and I'm a body language expert and analyst and a trained law enforcement in the military and interrogation and body language. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes, did 20 years in the U.S. military, wrote the number one best-selling book on behavior profiling, interrogation, persuasion, and influence. Greg? 
I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, and I spend most of my time on Wall Street or corporate America. Okay, good. And now I see that people have rolled in because it takes time to get this rolling. Um, as I said before, I want to give everybody or as many people as possible an opportunity to get a question in in the chat. But thing. obviously the chat is going to be chatting amongst themselves. So to help me in my quest, folks, please type in the word question. And it can be all caps, it can be smaller, just a flag so I know that, hey, this is a question for the panel. And then if you would, please specify whom you would prefer to answer, because it will take a while to get through all the questions, and I want to get as many as I can, and going one, two, three, four for every question will add a lot of time that won't be fair to people. One last thing, Super Chats, I deeply, deeply appreciate it, but if I can't get to them. There's no guarantee that it's going to get asked if it's a super chat and I don't want anybody upset. So if you want to do super chat, just to make sure you donate and I'll do the best I can. I appreciate it, but please don't donate if it's going to bother you. So on that note, Mark has a dead camera battery. <laughs> We're starting there. So yeah, let's see if I can get another camera back in. How about that? Okay, no worries. While we're waiting on that, wh what's the show this week, guys? Well, it's going to yeah. be this guy named Gable Tosti, and he was, um, even though he was acquitted, his his the his Tinder date jumped off the fourteenth floor balcony of his apartment after they had a big fuss, and he was uh, wrestling around with her, uh -oh. and so that's what we're talking about. His so we're back to just murder or mayhem instead of a lot of everything else this week okay yeah. so a little less on the dr phil front and things like that okay yeah. cool got the, some questions coming in first off question i really want to know if greg or scott can answer what it is with women who are moms doing the sway when standing in groups well that people will it, it's part of matching and mirroring they sort of lock into each other and so they'll both start going back and forth and it's not always the the, the same I, i've seen that video you're talking about it's not always they're always not locked up together but everybody who's bored is going to stand there and sway back and forth uh, quite often but if they're if they're good friends and they're hanging out and they've been talking and stuff they're probably the one who can see the other one is is in that case i think one is just ahead of the other one they'll sort of sway back and forth together greg what do you got yeah two things well, a lot of women who are mothers have done that with a child to calm the child so it becomes kind of a, a soothing thing for them the second is if you're part of a group you tomorrow can introduce some weird gesture, weird illustrator, and the rest of the group will pick it up. It's just the nature of humans. All right. And this one's for Scott. There will be a time limit. Scott, what got you interested in psychopaths? Uh, <laughs> dealing Music. with so many of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really. Dealing with so many of them and not understanding why that person was acting the way they were or, be or behaving the way they were. And I, and I started reading about them. And there wasn't a lot of information about it what we know as a psychopath, what people call a psychopath. But that that's what I did. It was just being fascinated by how they acted and how they didn't care about a lot of things that, that normal people would be empathetic toward. And I couldn't understand why they were like that, and I've just never gotten past it. Okay, this is this person didn't label, and I'm not following the rules. But, okay, what's the best episode? Who's going to rat out their favorite child? Uh, Prince Andrew. Oh, yeah. By okay. far. That's good... We did too. <laughs> I kind of like the Alec Baldwin. Yeah. Today's was my favorite because I think there was a lot of hidden stuff there and it shows that somebody who might have that uh, potential uh, could still go free. All right. Um, question. How do you disconnect from the horrible things you hear in interrogations? Greg, Scott, Chase, draw straws. Well, I, I think you're there for a purpose and each of us probably should take a quick shot, but you're there for a purpose and you should have a box around yourself when you go in there. Anyway, you're there to get information and to figure out what happened and to hand that over. So it's a job. That's just the way you got to treat it T tomorrow. Guys who pick up garbage, don't take that home. None of the rest of us are doing that either. You have to be able to isolate. There's certainly a, an impact, but you have to be able to isolate. 
Chase, you, you're more recently in the hot box than most of us. So. Um, I think in, in any interrogation that you, is, I'm, I'm not a compartmentalizer. So I just kind of change it, just kind of reshape the way I view the world, that this is just something that happens. And it's, this is just something that happens in the world. And that's just kind of the way that I see it. Scott? What? I, I think when you go in, I agree with Greg, you have a job to do. And so you can't let your emotions get a part of that. Sometimes you do, and, and, and you, you may make a couple of decisions that later on you'll think, well, that could have gone wrong if I, if, if, you know, if thank God it worked out the right way. But it's, you have a job to do, and you do that, and that's it. And you leave that there. You can't bring that to the house. Because as soon as you do that, and things start getting weird. All right. Uh, I'm going to go with Ziggy. And Ziggy Shrug, I'm going to interrupt and steal time because – Ziggy Shrug made this for me. Wow. Oh, how nice. That's cool. And oh, nice. I oh, yeah. cannot tell. It actually goes in the transom above my door there. It was a really, really nice. kind gesture. Um, she's on my locals, but her question is for Greg. Greg, when you suspect there is something that is being hidden, what is a sure telltale, telltale sign that they don't want you to ask about it? My, my favorite indicator, because I'm very auditory, is when someone speeds up to get past a topic. So they're normally talking slowly. I ask a question, they think it's past and they speed up their cadence. That's my best indicator. That means I want to slow down. Well, hold, hold on a minute. Do, do a Columbo. Well, hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's just exactly how I like to do it. Okay. I love this one. I'm. It's for anyone, but I'm going to go with Mark because he's been very quiet. All right. Can you detect narcissism? I'm going to say with just audio with just audio well you, you're going to be able to detect it from the words that people use but can you can you in you know and the ideas that they have and um you know within some certain boundaries but could you pick it up from the inflection and tonality of their voice not to my understanding no uh, it's going to be in the language and and how self self-referential uh it is so it's something it's not immediate. You kind of have to get a little bit more exposure. You can't just pick it up in a five-minute conversation necessarily. Well, the right five-minute conversation, yeah. No, yeah. If you, you know, if you, if you, if you can, if you can get get onto a subject matter whereby it would most likely uh, trigger some uh, the narcissistic complex to express itself faster, quicker, more boldly, then absolutely. But but uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether the question there was, uh, can you can you provoke somebody into a situation where they're more likely to express their 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 narcissism? Yes. Can you pick it up from the tune of their voice? You know, the vocal fry, the whatever it might be. To my knowledge, no. OK. OK. And I might be picking the order of the questions, so I don't know if I'll read anything <laughs> into this or not. But um, Chase, please give us a rundown on what is motivating Binger. At the Rittenhouse trial. Which one is Binger? He is the <laughs> chief prosecutor. Uh, I think it's just, uh, it looks to me that like his behavior suggests a strong desire for personal achievement, a feeling of social significance and power. Okay. And let me so see. a lawyer then. <laughs> <laughs> a prosecuting attorney. Does Mark look like with that jacket on? Does Mark look like a, a manager of like a metal band from the eighties? Is it just me? No, I, I was thinking he was working on his super criminal status for the next Batman thing. I thought it was a good look. <laughs> that or a, a magic show. You know, I still get comments about Mark's that. first appearance, saying he owns a T-shirt. Yeah, I've dressed I, up for you tonight, Eric. I, I, and I, I, I don't need this kind of. I don't need, need this. No, I, 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 hold on, hold on. I dressed up. I'm wearing my Tiger King shoulder special. There you go. And, That's, uh, oh I, yeah. I even framed the, the book. So I couldn't believe I that. Up. That's funny. I couldn't believe somebody sent me that, Famous and then shoulders. you sent me that. That was so. That was so. Weird. Of course, I went upstairs and ran upstairs and turned on Netflix and watched it. Yeah, yeah I, I did said, too. I had the, the quickest turnaround minutes. ever. It's like, wait, I made the. Oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> That worked, yeah. yeah. Okay, Weird, so oh uh, which one of you guys would be worse face under an interrogation? Don't understand Greg. Worse to face? The worst to face? God almighty, I wouldn't have Greg asking me questions. 
You kidding I, I me? I think it depends on what you've done and See, how it's already started. Yeah, it depends. This is the way they do depends. it. Just depends. Yeah. Right. If it's a yeah. sex crime, it'd probably be me. I think it just depends on the person and <laughs> what you've done and where, whether we would be aggressive psychologically. Yeah, it seems like he's smiling real big and all that. Oh, yeah, it'd be okay. I'm sure, be, I'm sure it would. If things would be okay, I'm here to help you, man. I want to help you get out of this. Man, I wish I could read I, it. I care. Yeah. I do care. I really do care. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is a good one. Um, I I love the Pareto principle, but is there one behavior that alone gives an eighty twenty rule in Ideen li Ideen lying or deceit? I can do that. Yeah. Cool. Uh, is it different than the person's normal behavior? And does does it directly answer the question? That's it. Those those two things would probably be the highest leverage. Things that I won't speak for the other dudes here, but I I would give that advice as the highest leverage. I think it's a great way to sum it up because there isn't a single behavior; it's anything that stands out. Okay, is that like the Nabarro rule that um you're looking for discomfort from a baseline? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, yeah. you're looking, looking for, for change. It doesn't discomfort. have to be discomfort. Right. You're just okay. looking for anything that could signal that there is some some difference there. So not, I don't think necessarily discomfort is the, um, is exactly the thing to go for, though it's though it's probably more prevalent. Yeah, I, I did an interrogation. The the guy comes in the room, calling me bro and dude the whole time, yeah. and then all of a sudden I start asking about missing money, and he's like, "Oh, sir, no, sir, absolutely not, sir, no, sir. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, no, sir." Mm. Well, so, I, I love I love when you go. Yeah, that's when a change. you go to another. When you go to another country and people learned English from watching TV, their speech patterns oh. can be so weird. It's just yeah. strange the way they talk to you. So sometimes you could have Sean Penn of Fast Times talking to you, or the Brady Bunch, <laughs> or yeah, oh, God. So or a combination. I would love that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I don't know what this is, but have you ever interviewed anyone associated with facilitated communication? Don't know that term. I, I do think you need uh, to clarify an, facilitated an communication. Greg and I probably have, if you count interpreters. Is that what yeah. you mean by that? Because I you have plenty of interpreters. Or do they mean like the one of the voice box things? Yeah. Don't know what Maybe means. both. Can either of you I answer on that? I don't know. Well, interpreter, there's a process. I mean, we teach. There's a process. You know me. Everything's a process. If you are going to work with an interpreter, there more, there's more than one method you use. You can use simultaneous or you can use alternate. And there's a process to doing that, how you ask the question, how you set up your next question, how you look, watch for body language, how you retrieve information while they're doing it. And even if you speak a foreign language, like my Arabic was decent once upon a time, I still want an interpreter because it gives me free time to think while that interpreter is asking the question. So, yeah, it, there's certainly a process to do it. And it's repeatable. I mean, I can, we can put something up to show you. I'm going to throw mine in there too. It's one of my favorites. What about reading the interpreter themselves? Part of the job. We One of our jobs, especially with people who already speak Arabic or whichever the other language you're in, is to vet the terp. You got to make sure the interpreter, the interpreter is saying what the person is saying. You just don't tell them you know. And then when you come out, you fire them if, they, if they're doing something crooked. I had a situation come up where I was dealing with... with uh, a couple of Chinese guys, they're businessmen. Let's just leave it at that. And so I called Greg. I was like, Hey man, I, I, I've never worked with an interpreter before. And, and Greg told me, make sure you tell the interpreter to tell, to tell you exactly what they say. Don't dread, don't change it. Don't make it shorter. Don't make it longer. Tell them ex exactly what you said. Translate it. Even if it sounds odd, translate it that way. Word for and, word. Yeah. And, and don't change pronouns. Don't say he says, if he says I, you say I. We force the interpreter to use exact language because we lose nuance otherwise. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Because then it's interpretive. Um, okay, this one, uh, back to Scott. Scott, everybody wants you and psychopaths and it, psychopathy. I, I don't know, man. Chaff and redirect. All right. So, Greg's phrase, trying to be all, I got a haircut. <laughs> it's like, look more like Chase, and I'm trying to be like a. Scott, you're going to love this question. Yeah. How do you tell what the difference it? between someone who's just introverted from a psychopath with no there's emotion? A, there's a huge difference there. Introverts don't act, don't act like that. They're, introverts most likely aren't going to be um, narcissistic. They're just going to be quieter. They're not going to go out and do a lot of 
uh, that person, personality type isn't one to go out a lot, isn't one to be a lot, around a lot of people, doesn't want to go out and do anything really that, that's fun. They might want to do fun things, but not as, as um, actionable with a bunch of people, whereas the psychopath is going to want to be around a lot of people because they need that adrenaline rush. They, need, they don't have any feelings. They don't get anything except from sex, drugs, and adrenaline. And you probably get the adrenaline from both of those, uh, from the first two. So an introvert, it's, I see where you're coming from because they seem like they're quiet and they're just looking around and, and not saying much. But that's, that's the opposite most of, most of the time of a psychopath because they want to be part of something. They want to be, they want to find the spot they can get in and take advantage of or, and get whatever they need and or want from that person. So there's, there's really, really big difference in that. So, so don't confuse that because you're dealing with narcissistic personality. All psychopaths are narcissists, but not all narcissists are psychopaths. I got to say that part of it. And the introvert is, is most likely isn't going to display many of those behaviors you'll see from a psychopath at all when they're, when they're in public, or when they're doing things, even if it's just a small group of people together, uh, the introvert's still going to, they'll be a little bit more talkative and, and, and relate a little bit more, but the psychopath will be the one who is, who will take the alpha role or try to anyway. And that'll be the, that, that would be the difference. One of them's not going to do a whole lot. The other one's going to do a whole lot. Okay. I've got one and I want to put it out there because of the Elliot Smith coverage that we're doing and things like that. What about, and this can be to any of you, somebody who's an addict who is on drugs and has that flat affect like a heroin addict or something like that. How do you cope with that type of situation when you have, um, you know, some sort of adulterating substance with their behavior? You wait. I mean, that's a super ridiculously short answer, but I think that would be the, the solution for everything is just waiting it out. But if you if they're not arrested, you don't necessarily have that right. opportunity. They can go get another fix. So I I, I mean I'm just kind of yeah. I mean you got to be you want to be really specific about the situation because because um, because you know addicts and users and can do all kinds of things in all kinds of situations. They mm -hmm. they don't have just one set of behaviors. You put them in one situation, they'll behave in such and such a way. They'll be you know they, they put them in another situation, they'll be very very different. If they've just taken you know, a hit, they'll fall asleep. It's, it's and, and in, in some circumstances, if, if they're on drugs, they can't enter into a, a confession that that stuff is, is many times has been thrown out in court because they were on drugs or high on something uh, besides pot and noose. And they made the, <laughs> but if you are, if you are looking for, an answer from an interrogator in an interrogation where our hands are tied in certain situations in intelligence. We don't have that problem. We just put them back in the box and leave them for a while. But if you're talking about in, in your daily life, I think Chase is right. If they're going to come down, then you got to wait. Otherwise you've got to learn what's baseline for that person in that situation and look for what's different. Some people never change. We dealt with someone recently that you could tell drinks a hell of a lot, a hell of a lot. And when you're talking to them, you could see that they're either hung over or the best part was all the bleaching of the eyes and that kind of stuff. When you're dealing with those folks, your eyes look unnaturally white and all that kind of stuff. And we could tell, but you can't do anything about it. We've got a window to talk to this person. Everybody's different. I've met some super functional crack addicts who, who you just wouldn't know, but they're consistent users at a certain dosage level. Totally fine running running good organizations in some cases so it's just often difficult to to tell i'm okay. a corporate guy there's plenty of high functioning alcoholics there well uh, and military too yeah um okay uh gavin everybody knows gavin and yeah. he wanted to say hi earlier so he's saying hi, hi now but hey gavin hey man um can you tell us the best way to deal with biases when you're close to someone well, I think it doesn't matter whether you are close or you're at a distance. You need to try to disprove whatever it is you think. I will tell you, in recent, two of the recent things we've covered, and I won't go into detail, but in two of the recent things we covered, if I had gone with bias, I would have had a very different opinion than I walked away with. And you just got to challenge why you think that at every turn and look for reasons why what you believe is wrong. And if you do that, it's almost like you're doing a, an experiment anyway. You'll either find the evidence to support what you're doing or the other way. Sometimes it just jumps off the plate at you. 
I'll tell you the one with that uh, young woman in Australia, your gut automatically goes to the mother is the parents are involved. You uh, your gut goes there and you have to look and seeing just that body language tell me something different was powerful. And another one recently, same thing. So, so the very simple technique that I use and train other people in is you is you got this little voice in your head that will talk about people. So you see that 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 mother and the parent the the, the step parent of the kid, and your instinct will go well. Obviously X Y Z, and all you do is put the word in your mind perhaps at the end of it. Just put perhaps at the mm. end, yeah, and and then you start to explore. So I, I do that with all people. You try and do that with most people most of the time is that they'll be talking to me and I'll have this judgment going on in my head and I just put perhaps at the end. If I want to do the work of suspending judgment and if I don't, I make my judgment and on I go with life. It's a lot quicker. It's a lot quicker to make the judgment. It's much slower and more expensive to do critical thinking and use perhaps. And, and if, if you ask yourself, have you ever been wrong? If you've never been wrong, you've been wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, that answer yeah. right there would be wrong, right? I mean, exactly. exactly. Yeah, it, it, we we all make yeah. mistakes. Yep. So usually this, a strong awareness of your own psychology is typically the best steering wheel away from bias. A strong awareness of bias and understanding there could be bias here. This guy looks like me. His name is the first. He has a first, first name is me. And just a, a strong awareness, I think, is usually for me the best steering wheel uh, away from yeah. Yeah, just every meeting you walk into, every situation you walk into, you say to yourself, I'm biased. How am I going to manage that? That's all. You don't walk in going, well, I'm not a judgmental person because you just made a judgment about yourself. You just got into your own tautology and, and destroyed your own idea. So I'm biased. And how am I going to manage that is, is, is the first step, I would say. Awesome. We got a fan for you here, Mark. Um, they love your video where you're in soccer pitches. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I encourage everyone to check that out. Uh, Mark has a very spirited runner. Yes. Um, let me see. I have Indeed. one. Oh. Okay. This is a great one. Who have you done a video on that you didn't expect to believe, but did? McCann's. Yeah. I, I would say that. I'd also say Cleo Smith's parents. Okay, and you're still getting flack about the McCanns, aren't you? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Every day. Yeah, I mean Every that day. that's that's one of my favorite payroll. things. We're on payroll. Uh, I, oh, I yeah. love um, I, I love the um, the fact that everybody's commenting because it adds engagement. But it's like you, Peter Hyatt said, blah blah blah, and it, it's like they're trying to get this little cage match between Peter Hyatt and you guys, and it's like. I don't think anybody disagrees. Nah. And you've been on with him, but it, it is a very fun oh, he's thing. He's a great guy, man. Yeah. Oh, he likes that. That's a fun guy. And at Lisa Smith, you um, guys, you know, kind of won. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that had to feel pretty good. I'm sure that everybody rushed back to apologize for their earlier comment, right? Oh, yeah. Well, the thing yeah, is, so we were I showing you the red flags that were popping up and saying, this doesn't look right to me. And here's why it doesn't look right. It's still okay at that point. Yeah, yeah. Because I learned, and they'll see what they learn is red flags, and they'll 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 just stick by those and go, oh, this means this, and they'll stick right by it because they think they see something. And well, they won't wait a while and listen and, and go with it and see what happens next, or take into consideration what that situation is. Well, the That's whole idea of a red flag is, is, is probably a really bad metaphor anyway in in any analysis. Because it's so binary, it's either a red flag or there's nothing at all, rather than there might be a whole bunch of gradations mm -hmm. in, in between. Yellow. It's like, whoa, red flag. All right, everybody run around like headless chickens because there's a red flag. It's like, it's probably the whole metaphor of red flags is probably just a bad idea. We, we use it as much as anybody else does, though. Because it's because it's fun, isn't it? Because it's like, well, you can just go red flag and, and done, dusted, onto the next one. But it's not yeah, it, a great idea. Well, interrogations about getting the most information in the shortest period of time. We're watching a video and we're looking for what would I dig into if I were sitting across from this person? Why would I suspect this person? And then you have to take that apart. I think the funniest, Eric, is that, yes, even though we were right, now people come back and say, well, you should have never, you should have never analyzed her in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, we would have a pretty boring channel if we didn't analyze folks who were <laughs> under question. All right, now, I hate questions like these, but I have to be fair and bring it up. What's my tell? 
Eric has no tells. No, yes, he does. I'm going to tell you what it is. Go for it, man. I don't care. Well, Eric still blushes, so that's a good thing. Okay, Eric, you ready? Sure. What you do is when you're not sure about something or you said something you shouldn't have, you start talking. And you talk about that you'll you'll say something to to ping the person you're talking to is what their subject is and relate it to what you what you just talked about. But you'll talk all around that and then move on to the next move on through it. That's why so I think I've you seen mean your way. shirt is what you're saying. Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Doesn't so everybody have to redirect? <laughs> I mean, well, that's uh, yours. That's okay. Yours. Well, I mean, but doesn't everybody do that, including you? you. Get, but you get all <laughs> animated and stuff when you when you do too. I've watched okay. a lot of your shows, man. Eric's Eric's number one physical tell would be a postural retreat. A what? I would agree with that. Yeah. What uh, is that? So like yes. what like what Greg just did. Like oh. just kind of, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. No. Um, all right, cool. Uh da, 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 da. let's see. And then of course uh, losing my place for the next thing. All right, Lisa Franceschi. Uh, yeah, I think I said the right. Do you all always agree or sometimes have different opinions considering the behavioral profiles have the same meaning? Obviously, I know this answer. Sometimes we disagree, you know? Yeah. Sometimes we do. Yeah, we don't. The thing is, we don't if have a we meeting. What are we, what are we going to think about this? We wouldn't be experts say. if we didn't. I would yeah. say we would be faking it if, if we That's didn't right. disagree. Yeah, and, we had some. There were, we, Recently, we had a couple. I mean, where something yeah. comes up where one of us says this, another person says, I don't see that. When you hear us say, I don't see that, that is disagreement, guys. It doesn't mean that we think the other person's an idiot because they see something differently than we do. That's the piece that I, I love about this group is we respect each other's opinions and where we're coming from and how we got here. But we don't always agree on everything. Yeah, Greg had a pretty strong disagreement with me in this video we did that came out today. Hmm. I love that. I mean, if we didn't disagree with each other, we would not have science. We wouldn't have right. medicine. So that's where it comes from. I think that's why I like hanging out with lawyers. Because is that it? Is you like to disagree? Like it's almost more entertaining when you do have some degree of friction and you can learn or be like, yeah. well, wait a I minute. I think what? that sharpens. I think iron sharpens iron. So, you know, we're in there disagreeing and then that leads to a debate that wouldn't would not have otherwise occurred uh, without that disagreement. Yeah, I think what we're doing is is we're not shying away from disagreement uh, and we're not trying to create it because it might be dramatic. I mean, the thing about our, our, our show is that the drama's already there. There's already usually somebody's been killed or some, mm. some, something really bad has happened. So the drama's already there. We don't really need to create another drama. What we're doing is trying to explore and think about what might be going on. And if there's some slight differences, that's OK. And if there's strong differences, that's OK as well. We're not going to uh, agree with each other just because it would be better. But I guess our disagreement isn't going to be a violent one just because it might make a great bit of YouTube for, for everybody. I think we kind of think that wouldn't be great YouTube if we were violently disagreeing. But we could, you know, we could try a show like that while we were no, we on could, purposely Mark. violently we disagree. Yes, we, no, could. we could. That's stupid. No, we could. Come on. Chase, Don't be a fool, Scott. I Get think we need me. to do one episode where we're in person and we and we all pass around a bottle of whiskey and about hour three, then we film the episode. And we oh, yeah, that'd be a fun one. Drunk profiling. <laughs> uh, yeah. As soon as I'm finished throwing up. That would be called confession through projection. Um, <laughs> on that note... <laughs> And, and this is a good question because you mentioned good YouTube, good entertainment. Obviously, you may have started with just the intention of, oh, we get a chance to hang out together, and that may still be there. However, you are growing a channel. You are a brand. You are doing something. So do you approach both subject matter? And I know Greg, I think, does a lot of the picking out. But also, in your explanations, are you now aware that, okay, I can't get two in the weeds here i need to make things understandable to the lay person any of you please answer i think as we go as we, as as we develop we do because man those first ones we were in there talking about research papers and getting all and i was going way too deep and I, i'll just say it myself i was going way too deep now i try to to reel it back 
and make it so my mom could understand it, my dad could understand what I'm talking about without getting into the minutia of it. I'm under the impression there are a lot of people out there that, that are into the minutia, but there's a lot more people that aren't. So on, on my part, I try to keep it just really basic and to, to the point each time. Yeah, I would say for my part, I don't try and steer away from anything that I wouldn't that I'm not interested in myself. It's like it's like when you uh, when you write Thanks, Robert uh, when you write children's theater, okay, or children's books. You write it for adults and then you don't let them in. You you <laughs> you go to the highest because for kids, there's only really one one thing I think that really kids cannot deal with, and that's sexual violence. And, and everything else is 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 actually that th there's a capacity to deal with it, and so you can create for kids all kinds of worlds that you create for adults, and then you just don't invite the adults. <laughs> and so for me, it's the same. It's the same for this. I'm going to make a show which I would like to attend, but I don't invite people like me. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like the Groucho that Mark. Be, that would be so tedious and annoying. Uh, you know, I invite people like everybody who's shown up for this, you know, cause that's, they're more fun. That sounds like Groucho like Marx. I'd never go to a club who would have me. Yeah, for sure. Remember, yeah. Sure. I'd never go to a convention where I'm speaking at it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I have to, cause you know, they pay me. Well, and, and in terms of what we select, I have a list of 50 names. A lot of them come from people on the show who put in comments during a show. We'll dig through those. I have a list of 50 names that we keep in reserve. And some of those you'd recognize right off, some like Bernardo and folks like that. So we keep those on the back burner and we pay attention to the news because people want to know what's going on in the news. So yeah. are we paying attention to what people care about? Sure. But we also do it because we are interested in what's going on. Now, I'm not going to tell you I'm interested in a lot of pop culture stuff, but it just makes such good discussion when we bring it up and we see a person doing something really foolish that we enjoy it. So, yeah, we do pay attention. We are probably a little bit more succinct than we were in the beginning. But we don't. We still want to keep that level of detail on the show in a way that if we had a TV show, we wouldn't be allowed to do. If that makes sense to you. I sometimes do this, and I'm curious if you do too. And that's like, okay, I've given you, the viewers, the last five episodes. This one's for me. This guest is for me. And I hope everybody likes this guest or whatever it is, but this one's for me. Do you guys do that with cases sometimes where you're like, yeah, this one may not go over, but you know what? I want to know, or we, you want to know. Yeah, the we've got a few, one. and we yeah, we brought Jim Smith on. That was yeah, for Jim. nobody else. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Okay, and now Sadie has a question. Hi, and Sadie. Hey, Sadie. I definitely, and I, I want to qualify this one too because I think it's an awesome one. I want all four of you to answer, and it can be on the show. Or in real life, you don't have to name names, but I think everybody would probably really want to know that. What was the most difficult case slash person you have analyzed to date? Let's just one of us answer that. We've got a. That's your show, Eric. Sorry. <laughs> so okay, who's got the best answer? I mean, I, I love that. Are you mind melded? Can you tell me who's got the most powerful answer out of the lot? Scott probably has the best. Go, Scott. See, he says that because he knows that none of us want to say what it is because it's going to be different than the other ones. And the other ones are going to go, are you kidding me? That was easy because we haven't talked about that before. No. <laughs> so if we say who it is, my fear is they'll go, are you kidding me? That was fairly easy. That was an easy one. Well, you got you got knocked in the face once. I think that was a... I know, but I don't talk Probably about a toughie. <laughs> oh, then that's the one everybody wants to hear. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm talking about... I'm, I'm leaving all, all these on the show. Hmm. Yeah, I'm talking about from the from the from the ones on the show. All right, let's do the ones on the show since everybody doesn't want to say what's in real life. I didn't like this last guy, Gable Tosti. He's tough. That was the more, yeah. That's just he's such a goof and he's such a goob, you know. And he was just he would sit there and, and I I talked about it, so he was like a TikTok chicken when he would move his head would stay still but his body would move around just odd oh, dude. I I didn't like I didn't like this one. I didn't. That's the one that for me was the toughest because having to watch him and listen to him talk without being able to reach through there and just, you know, no, he killed that me interviewer talking to him like a, like a dad. You were strained to Gable. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a shock. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. But you'll notice nobody else is, is piping up about what they, the ones that they don't like. See, that's what I was talking about. 
Yeah, no, I, I think this one is among the hardest because he's little facial expression and it's just, yeah. 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 yeah I mean, out of let's, I, this one was a hard one. There's, there's the, the, the third, third or fourth video with the screaming in that's probably the most harrowing video I would say we've, we've looked at. And that woman, and that who was, was the one that sound. killed her children. Who's that woman? The one that killed her children and called 911. That was Chase's one who Darlie killed her parents. Oh, did you say right, Chase? No, Darlie killed her parents. No, Darlie killed her kids. No, she killed her kids, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she killed her kids. Oh, yeah. right. I know these yeah, cases because yeah. they're all on my hard drive right here. Yeah, I thought that's See, one of the, the creepy about Chase. If, if Greg ever gets in trouble where the cops have to go and see and look at his. Uh, I'm computer, in trouble. Search history. He's done. He's done. <laughs> Search history. Yeah. And no, he bought himself a Chromebook just for the purpose. And when the cops come, they'll be throwing out the window. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, yeah, I'm in trouble for sure. If anything ever happens. Have you guys watched any of the written house? Because I, this is a question. It, it's from somebody who asked a question before. I'm not going to do a lot of repeats, but I, I think it is a good one. And it's Kyle. Did he demonstrate the grief muscle when he cried in court? And I don't know if you saw that segment when he was in under direct and started to um, break down. So we are, we are avoiding a lot of commentary on the Rittenhouse case intentionally. Okay. I'll okay. Just leave it at that. If that's okay with you. No, I'm, I'm yeah. no, I'm going to hold a gun to your head and say, <laughs> you will tell I'm me. Still not easy to kill. Her. Was, <laughs> he was grieved. Yeah. No, we, we just rather <laughs> leave that one alone for the moment. For the moment. All right. No, no worries. All right. So, um, Gavin Stone, thank you very much for the super chat. And let's see. Five English pounds there, sterling, Gavin. That, that's a pint. That's very exactly. kind of you. Well, is that why you moved to Canada, Mark? Is because your your currency well, the, the was even more expensive. Buy more no. beer. <laughs> One more flips than I did. <laughs> it's like... All right. Um, Char B, question to Jerry. Mark or Scott. When a person Ooh, of else. interest gives a timeline of events, is there a way to quickly assess them for time blindness due to disability during questioning? I'll go with Mark. Time blindness due to disability. Yeah, I mean, you you just... you you go over that timeline and see how distorted it gets or frustrated they they get with it i would i would start looking for frustration as you go over the timeline and 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 now you're going to have to suspend your judgment around frustration might be them being deceptive about that timeline so now you've got to work out well why am i even checking for the timeline so all of these things, I would suggest you've got to you, you've got to work out. There's there's pluses and minuses to going down any of these these routes. That's that's what I'd say about it, Scott. What do you think? I'd have them talk about it backwards. I'd have them start the end of the. You you start asking yeah. questions at the backwards. end of the story, but you don't say now. Tell me the whole thing backwards. But you ask them questions that would make those sections of the story stay in the same structure as they were when you went through. Because when you tell a story, when something happens. These things are, are connected by the emotions, the things that, that happens because there's something emotional going on most of the time if it's something important, big and important. So the, they should be able to tell the story backwards just as easily as forwards. They should know the story backwards and forwards. There shouldn't be a lot of, well, let me think. They should be able to say, oh, before that, he, he, before, they, you know, before he pulled out the gun, I, I did this. You know, after that happened, this happened. And when this happened, this happened. And it should just click right back that way but you don't say tell it to me backwards a lot of people say tell me the story backwards right. but you have to do it so they don't realize that's what you're doing so that would be my my suggestion but i think in this particular if i got if, if i have it right in this particular question the question is about somebody who has With a blindness disability to that who has a disability around around yeah. timeline oh, so they yeah they would show so like, like legitimately, legitimately have a problem they would that. genuinely go Oh, I see what um, you're yeah, like I am with left and right. If you went, well, did you turn left and right? I'm going, I don't know. And, but people and show that in their baseline. People show that in their baseline. So yeah. when a person talks, they're going to talk about time, event, or sequence is what I refer to it as. An event person might say, I went to the barn yesterday. A time person may say at 2 o'clock, I went to the barn yesterday. At 4 o'clock, I came home. 
And then a sequence person will just give you an order. And that's their baseline. So when you hear it, you know that they're not going to use time. So you have to work differently then. That's human nature. On that asking um, things backward, do you ever ask the wrong question backward? Like if they told told you a sequence, you'd say, okay, so that was on your way back from the store. And if they don't correct you and say, no, um, I was doing Greg's that. Greg's good at that. Greg, Is that a, another way that you would um, sell yeah, out Eric, a story? exactly what you do is you want to let them think that they're winning telling you the story backward. And then you may ask something out of place to break their sequence so that anything, anybody who knows a story and they're telling you the truth. Remember, I always say we knew this a long time ago. It's the reason people say they knew their story forward and backward because mm -hmm. it, it falls together naturally. You may not get the times exactly say, well, hell it was, I don't know. I left it two thirty. It was about two ten when it, you know, you may have that kind of, that kind of vagueness, but usually it will not break the story by any stretch if they're telling the truth, because all they have to do is think instead of make up something and try to untangle it. And at the same time, now you've got to be careful of your status with them, because if you have high status for them, they will placate you and they'll, they'll agree mm. with you, not because they're trying to be deceptive, but because right. they're in a situation where they feel like agreeing with you is, is a, is a better option. So it's so complex that um, that you've got to take every situation on its own merit and 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 play the instrument as you're as you're there in the room. There isn't a, there is there's not really though there are forms. There's no kind of sheet music for for every individual. Yeah, good analogy. Okay, on this one, since we're doing this, um, Greg, do you use a basic template type checklist when baselining people quickly? You know, I don't. I look at the person. I ask a handful of questions just build rapport, talk to them. When we talk to Candace, for example, I just talk to her about her and get a smile, get them started moving and talking. And that's where you get a baseline from. Let the person talk about something not stressful. It can be anything. If I walk into a CEO's office, it's what's on his wall. I ask Chase, what's the thing behind him? You get in this conversation just to find a baseline for the person and realize that when you're actually in an interrogation, no one behaves normally. So the baseline is skewed to start with. You're just working from a skewed baseline to a new baseline. Okay, I'm going to ask this one because it's not actually going to force you to say anything about the current trial. But what was your experience like in doing behavior tests for jury selection? What do you look for in jury selection? That's a good generalized question. There's a lot of things you look for. And Chase can explain a lot better than I can. Um, but there, there are so many different things you look for as, as, you go, as you go through specific things as well. Chase, talk about that a little bit. You're, you're... He's quiet. <laughs> Number one thing that we're looking for is locus of control. Some cases I want an external locus of control, which means the world pretty much happens to me. In some cases, I want an internal locus of control, meaning I create my own, my own life, and my own outcomes in life. The second thing that I prioritize is similarity to my client. So locus of control similarity to my client and finally uh, their viewpoints about the archetype of my client so if my client is super wealthy how do they view those type of people and and what do they what emotions do they have around those type of people so i would prioritize those three things if you just lined up those three things perfectly with the jury You'd be about 80% done with the case, give or take. I'm not an attorney. You'd have to ask Barnsey. <laughs> Barnsey. See, see what he would say. <laughs> Sounds like a football player. Barnsey. All right, Barnsey. Yeah, I know. Hey, wait, wait, oh, Barnes. Hey. I know Barnes is in the chat, and then Greg took off. I don't know if he's still there. I had a question. Uh, yeah, no, I'm here. I, my battery was dying. I had to go adjust something. Oh, good, because this one's for you. Um, and I think it's an interesting question. Somebody, they think it was you, Greg, who said you can be truthful without being honest. They yes. want to know what you meant by that. So if I ask you a question and you know what I'm trying to get and you give me the answer because the question was open-ended enough for you to get away with it and you give me a truthful answer and knowing what I wanted and avoiding, people do it all the time to you. If you don't ask exactly to the letter what they think you should ask, they avoid the question they're being resistant to telling the truth. Yeah. So they're being truthful with facts, but they're not honest. Yeah. Greg asked me what I did uh, yesterday afternoon. Yeah. What'd you do yesterday? 
Well, uh, every single day I go, I leave the office, I go straight home. Just about every single day. Set up, Scott, set up straight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> chat and redirect. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, guys, that, that's, that's exactly it. And you may ask, Hey, were you, was there anyone else with you when this happened? Yes or no. And you know, I'm looking for something else, but you avoid the actual question by giving me the answer to the question I asked. And then usually what they'll do is speed up to get away from the topic back to that question that someone asked in the very beginning, their cadence will speed up so they can get away from the topic. Now, do you, do you immediately dig into that or do you ask a couple more questions, let them think they're getting away and then kind of swing back to it? Well, one more, one more thing, just one more thing. What you do is you let them roll, you let them run down shaft and redirect, and then you pick where you redirect, not them. And you bring them right back to the topic at the most opportune time. And it becomes kind of a verbal slap in the face and they realize you've been tolerating their, their BS for that long. You come right back to it. Who's the puppy, Chase? This is Allie or mm -hmm. Allison. I have a cute dog. That's a cute dog. Hiccups. Uh, I have an <laughs> Allison as a partner on News with Booze. Okay. This is an interesting. I'm not sure where they're going with this. Um, do you need a psychopathic tendency to enlist in the military with the knowledge that you may kill other people? Or is that more like a cult member psych? That's I don't think it's person. either. I don't yeah, think it's I either, don't either. But... Well, becoming a surgeon a nurse, a paramedic, a police officer, or just about any other job that helps people uh, entails you might actually kill people. So that would make about a third of our country a potential psychopath at that point. Well, and, and I always try to remind people, lots of soldiers put their life on the line for people from other countries, not, not even their own, just to protect them from harm's way. I mean, mm -hmm. there are many soldiers who do that every day and who do humanitarian missions and all that. I think if you're, if you judge it to be psychopathic, to be willing to lay your life down to protect somebody, then yeah, we are. But if you're, if you're thinking about what we do, deterrence is the greatest military force possible. The, the more dangerous we are as a nation, the less likely we are to go to war. That's human nature. And certainly to, to Chase's point there, I've worked with a lot of surgeons and many of them you would, would come out as being psychopathic and those are the ones that you would want to do your operation because they will be dispassionate about you but they will be absolutely accurate with the scalpel and they will they love the accolade of that they love and the narcissism for the reputation will be very important too totally they it's for the award it's like you, you just go into their you just look at the certificates and the awards and the and the black tie events that they're going to show up to and it's like yeah the they want to get it right for them, not for you, for them. And they're really good at it. And it's like, well, who cares at one. the end of the day? <laughs> give, me that, give me that one. They have zero bedside manner. Right. Well, that's why you're under. You, know, <laughs> right. yeah, you, know. <laughs> you, know, you don't care. You, you know. want them to think of you as like a car or something. And, or a and, and, and if, they're about, if they're about to die under the knife, you know, it's such fine detail. Their hands are not shaking. They are rock steady because they they just don't care. They breathe easy. They sleep well at night. They're the All ones right. you want. I think I already know the answer to this one, but um, or at least one answer, and that's uh, talk to Jim Pyle. But this is a good one for all of you. How do you go about learning how to ask good questions? I think you answered it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jim. Jim's Jim is one of the best. I go to Jim number one. The, the, Really, they're, it's very simple. Basic interrogatives. It's who, what, when, where, why, how, how else, what else, and huh. If you figure unless, those out. Unless you're yeah. making small talk. Yeah. <laughs> well, then it's a different story. <laughs> so I would good say you've got, you got those. You've got, you've got those. And then the next level is the, the value system. You know, what, what is most? What is most important about that? You've got who, but who's most important? And then how do you feel about that is another level. And then what does that say about you is the next level of self-reflection. So there is, there's, the, there's the questions that will get you data. Then there's the questions that will uncover a value system. Then the emotions that are people are feeling and then how they think about themselves. So there's, there's, a, there's a, a lot to it. But, but ultimately learning personally how to be curious is... is be, be more interested in people. It's curiosity. 
you can come up with your own questions easily so long as you stay curious. Well, right. I, I think you hit dead on. That's what makes Pyle the best questioner I know is because he's got this intellectual curiosity he never gives up. It's interesting. All right. Now, thanks for the super chat, a fuzzy creature. Um, I'm not asking you about the trial, but the Rittenhouse trial gave you guys the potential to blitz ass assess people. Do you guys look forward to trials like others love trivia night, seeing what you can find in quick order? I'm yes, more of a so fan when I was of... young, I... go ahead, please, Chase. I get more excited about watching Shark Tank and see if I can predict who's going to win, who's not, which one's going to pitch before the person even finishes their first sentence. Hmm. I get more excited about that because there's less drama, there's less nastiness. We've already got plenty of that. So I'd, I'd just rather stick to Shark What's your record? I don't keep score. Are you usually right? Yeah. Okay. And just, just based on the stuff, like people who subscribe to the behavior panel, you watch a few of those episodes and just take three or four of those little tips and tricks, and you'll, you'd be very surprised how much you can predict as, as far as human behavior is concerned. Just getting brilliant on the basics will make you more uh, dangerous oh, yeah. than anybody else in the room. Well, isn't that the law of diminishing returns, too? I, I would guess that... You know, if, if you learn, I don't know, whatever the basics are, that takes you 85 to 95 percent of their the way there. And then it takes 20 years to get that last five percent. Or am I incorrect? I would say you're incorrect. OK, well, I think you can get a hell of a lot fairly quickly as long as you are consistent and you're looking for baseline deviation. I think it takes a, a long time to get the mechanics of all the facial movement and those kinds of things and which muscle means this right. or that. I mean, Ekman's book is that thick. If you're going to use the facial action coding system, you're going to, it's going to take a long time, but you should in fairly quick order have the ability to recognize deviation from baseline. And that's a chunk. So in that way, Eric, I think you're right. If you're talking about the subtlety of it, I think yeah. Chase is dead on. There you go. See, they disagreed. <laughs> yeah, we do. Got we do disagree. Too. What? It got ugly too. Oh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting right here. <laughs> it was the worst. Well, you saw Chase started to like kind of slink down a little bit more because uh, Greg, he's pretty intimidating. Yeah, no, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> All right, to Mark, discuss what the common folks wouldn't think of that you train the elite on. This is open ended because he'd like you or. I'd like you to decide the direction of the answer. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Wouldn't think that he trains the elite on. Well, the same as I train everybody else on, because that's the idea of, well, they're elite, so they must have something very, very different. And they really don't. They, they, they bleed and cry and get upset and, and worry and are crushed by the ideas of other people's judgments around them just the same as everybody else. It's just, you know, if it's, if it's somebody who's leading a country, they're worried about that leader over there. <laughs> Probably not. Or they're worried about, uh, you know, who's going to knife them in the back. So they have all the same problems as everybody else. So I don't train them in anything different than I would you if you came along and went, hey, give me some help. All, all I do is go, so what are you most worried about today? That's all, like I do with them. Get in the room with them, and I go, so what am I doing here? What are you most worried about today? And then I fix that, just the same as everybody else. That might be a di bit disappointing. Um, well, if that is be. disappointing, I'll just say, I have some really secret stuff that I teach them, which I can't tell you about. Okay? <laughs> there, what's okay. That? I was going to say, could it also be that they have the budget to – uh, ah. Keep keep getting more and more training over time. <laughs> no. Potentially, no. Oh. They're okay. trophies. They're trophies. They have. They have. They have so little power to to move money around. So you would not honestly. You wouldn't believe how little they're protected. How little money they can get hold of. How they're super worried about about everything it's just like hang on you're running a country and you can't even do that it's it's extraordinary it's extraordinary i was with one and and i went to go to the bathroom and he was in the bathroom 
and and the secret service were outside and i said oh i'm sorry i just wanted to go to the bathroom i know i, I, I can't go in there and they went ah go on in you go <laughs> all right all right it's just me and him in the bathroom then is it all right <laughs> okay <laughs> right. they didn't care at all oh that's funny okay that's um funny. this is actually i think a really important question and maybe all of you should answer this one um what is the biggest difference when questioning a child? Height dominance. <laughs> okay. Pithy answer to Mark. No, it's true. Height dominance. Like, get down on your knees. Okay. Like, we, most likely, if you question a child, I mean, I, I'm talking about, I'm talking about in, in the general world when I got to ask this child a question, I need an answer from them and I need a, an honest answer from them. You are most likely to height dominate them. And so they're most likely to shut down. Yeah. First thing you do is do not height dominate them. Let them height dominate you. Mm. Then start asking you questions. Nobody else? I like to I goof around throw. with them for a few minutes first. You what? I like to goof around with them for a few minutes first. Get them giggling. Tell them something. Ask them a couple of questions about themselves or something that's weird. You know? Get in, get them that way. That way they connect with you. Then once you can, you, you find out how they see the world or they talk about things or, you know, are they interested in dinosaur? It depends on the, on the age of, of course, but what are they into? And then once you figure that out, then they're much easier to talk to, especially if you can make them laugh and giggle for a minute. Even if, if it's a serious situation, that sort of, that sort of puts them to the side a little bit of all the horrible stuff and you can get, you can talk to them, um, I think a little cleaner and clearer at that point or get to them a lot easier. All right. Chase. Sorry, Chase. I think uh, depending on what, what we're doing with the child, if I want information out of them about something that happened versus me communicating to someone who could potentially did something are two very different scenarios. Uh, but I think with children, it's a, uh, it, it relies I would say tenfold more heavily on your ability to generate and maintain that child's focus and uh, attention during the conversation. So exactly what Scott said, ask them questions and get them talking about things that they're absolutely passionate about is the mm. number one way to generate and maintain focus. Is that kind of a baseline too? I mean, not to question whether there's lying, but if if it's something they're into, then they're not going to waver on it or whatever. You you should definitely be even if the person's not a suspect child. You should we should still be looking to see if they're telling the truth or not, all the time. All right, Greg. Yeah, and I think children are less sophisticated. Everything we talk about with adults, most adults have gotten better over time. Most children are not sophisticated. They're poor liars. So you get a pretty good baseline pretty quickly. But I do think you, what you just hit on is important. You got to make them comfortable. That's Mark's first step. Make the person comfortable so you don't have height dominance. Get them to talk about something that makes them comfortable, something they want to talk about. And just what both of you said is getting a baseline. And then when you start to see something deviate, in children, it's often much more pronounced than it is in an adult because we just lay down layer after layer after layer if you're talking about a very small child, they're learning to do all of those deceptive moves. They're learning to use words in a certain way. They're learning to use their body to cover things up. And so they're more likely to be more pronounced than an adult. Hmm. And I'm curious, too, if I mean, I, obviously, it's it's good. You know, if a typical adult liar or whatever is to dig into things. But are there times that maybe as a child you can see the deviation from the baseline, but it may not be healthy to go there. Just take note of it later to go into investigation or whatever else, rather than confronting them directly. I don't, I don't know if that's getting too into psychology or not, but I'm curious. Well, I think it depends on what you're doing, right? If you've got a child in your life and you think something is going on, you definitely need to dig into whatever that is to make sure, sure. that it doesn't progress if it's something bad for the child or that. If it's somebody else's child, you probably need to be very careful how much treading you do on any other person's child. If you're an investigative or you're a psychologist, different story. But yeah, I think it depends, right? All right. <laughs> All right, I got a new fan here. 
Um, <laughs> thank you, Pamela. Everybody's a critic. Everybody's a critic. <laughs> yeah, hey, just let, let, let me say this out loud. If you're listening and you're not a subscriber, subscribe to Eric's channel now. Yeah, do yeah. it. Yeah, so especially like now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now you've had that uh, that review. Uh, and the thing about Eric, you gotta you gotta realize, Pam, is that we know him. It's it's not like somebody we're talking to for the first time. And so we're sort of uh going by the seat of our pants here as far as, yeah. as what we're doing. Boy, so it's not really a big fan. Anything. I'm telling you, thank you, Pamela. <laughs> I, I should just you know recruit you to uh, do my Come publicity. In on you Come on, yeah, go again, look. Pamela. Hit him again. Come on. Yeah, please. Yeah, what do you Come got? On. Take him down. Take him down. Say something about his headphones. Make him, make him cry. I know. Hey, all right. That's, uh, that's pretty much all I got. Pamela, what do you got? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I, I don't even know where that's to go with this. Uh, I appreciate the super chat. I don't know if we want to answer or not. No, uh, let's get that. Let me get that out of here. Uh, yep. Dr. Jack Brown on Twitter. I, I shared a tweet of his that I found completely disgusting. And oh yeah, he, he seems to be making uh, stuff. I'm, up. I'm projecting. No, he's projecting like I am. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you, do you guys want to answer that or no. I, all I saw is absolutist. You know, there are two schools of thought. They're baseliners and absolutist. Absolutists believe whatever. If I do this, it means that. If I do this, it means something. And we are all looking for deviations from baseline. So we're all we're all going to be different than a person who's an absolutist. I'll leave it at that and be polite. I've never seen the research on that. Yeah. yeah. I would just say yeah. Jimmy Crackcorn, I don't care. So, so yeah, there we go. <laughs> all right. Thanks for, tenor, mate. Thanks for your tenor. Thank you, Julia Blair. Thank you, yes. Julia. Their Thanks, videos Julia. are the best. Hey, we, we, did yeah, you see you got you 200 know. bucks in there? Uh, that's 200 ago. 200 uh, that was 200 um I, I think it was another current Danish kroner yeah, oh. i think yeah i think it's uh, about 10 if it's red red is like um getting up on the higher it was orange all money is good uh, oh no 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 question i mean and i don't know what some of the currencies are like this one um any yeah. thoughts on how siblings handle trauma rough home differently or children of narcissistic parents sounds like scott I I don't have no, no I, I know it's down in my, I thought you were going to say my parents are narcissistic. No, they're not. No. Um, no, that's my, uh, yeah, no, it's sort of down my lane. Uh, what was the question again? I'm sorry, I ADD'd out there on you just for a second. Any thoughts on how siblings handle trauma slash a rough home differently or children narcissistic parents? Yeah, that's not really a specific question, though, on, on how siblings handle trauma. I mean, it's. Yeah, that's. A, we're organisms, guys. Gotta, and we're organisms. Trauma, one thing that's traumatic to one person might not be to another or the level of trauma. Every one of us is wired differently. Thank God. Yeah. All right. Here's an easy one. Chase, what happened to the MK Ultra documents you were planning on sharing? They are on my site, on my website. Are they? Is it in a super quick answer? Oh, okay. Are they organized in an easy searchable manner? or how, how Absolutely they... not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Chaseuse.com. All right. Uh, question for anyone. Does telling the story many times make telling the lie easier? It makes it more comfortable. Hmm. Yeah. But how is it for you guys? Much. Does it make it's it more sometimes... difficult for you guys? It's, you can tell when it's happened. You can, you can tell when somebody's told the same thing over and over and over. A lot of the videos we're seeing, if we see someone who's told the story a thousand times, then you can you can see that on you can hear them they just slide right through it and there'll be little things they leave out, you know. So you have to go back through and if you can talk to them and get the and get those little things. But when, when we're watching videos where, uh, of people, we can just tell they've told the story a thousand times. Truthful events, you go back, ask them to kind of tell you again, and they'll they'll say, "Oh, I also remember." They'll add in things. Yeah, I, I think when a person has rehearsed something, they know which details matter. And to, to Chase's point, they add them in as they're talking. They don't go back and add something. They go, it was Tuesday. It was raining. Dick, 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 dick. It becomes a digital story. Mm. So what do you do about again. it? <laughs> That's when you start the backward. Remember, it depends on the life. It's a live omission. You go backward past, you'll pick it up because people can't hide information 
in, in that backward pass. If it's a life commission, meaning they're making something out of plain cloth, your life is a photo album. Everything in that photo album ties together. If this incident doesn't tie together, then you got to go and say, what the hell is he talking about? There's a doctor recently that I was looking at the case, um, Dr. Kaufman, who had his wife killed somewhere up around you guys, if I remember right. I think it was around Virginia Beach. Anyway, the guy told everybody he was a Green Beret and he was a this and he was a that, but he'd never gone through any training, never disappeared for two years. So how the hell is he a Green Beret? You know, so that kind of thing, that photo album approach would take that story apart. Mark, what were you laughing at down there? Oh, just, 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 it's a great question here, which is, which is, have you ever interviewed interrogated twins or triplets? And I just don't mm. understand why not go for quadruplets? Why not, why not like double down <laughs> and go, come on, let's, let's go for quadruplets. It's that is a great question. So super, it's just so super yeah. niche. But anyway, and then it, it did come to mind, uh, not that I ever talked to them, but if you, there are plenty of interviews of the Crays out there, the Cray brothers, Cray, mm. Cray twins, and they're really interesting. Um, to to watch, very interesting. What, what is that? I don't know. The Crays. Oh, they're the organized yeah. figures in England. Yeah, yeah. the big, biggest, the biggest names in London gangland ever in in history of the UK. Legendary, mm. legendary. Just to do them, that would yeah, be great. Nasty, nasty, nasty bits of work. What I about mean, the brothers, the Menendez? Were they twins? No, Menendez uh, brothers. No, no, they're just brothers. No, they're not twins. They're not oh, twins. okay. Okay. Huh, interesting. Um, okay, I, I don't know. Question, would Candace talk to you off air? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Would she? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Hmm. Caleb Crow, have you ever seen had someone try to monkey with their own baseline or bait you into thinking they are lying when they are not? You've never been married, Caleb. <laughs> Yeah, people do that all the time because they come up to they come up to us and go, "Well, can you tell if I'm lying?" And it's like, yeah, and they and they try and pull one on you, and it's like, I'd like, and you're like, "Oh, so you think nobody's ever tried to do this before, don't you? You think you're the first one. You you think you've got some grand scheme of how you're going to play this one out." So yeah, people people try and do that all the time. Yeah, and uh, it doesn't work very well. Yeah, the two truths and a lie game. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure about this one. Um, do any of you use symbolic logic when you're looking at someone else's argument? Mark, mm. what do you? I, I don't know. What, I don't know what he means by symbolic. I, I don't know either. But if, if he wants may to know. clarify symbolic logic, then uh... yeah, the symbolic logic uh, means that we're turning the other person's words into a fallacy by using kind of what Mark talks about a lot, like uh, the symbols, the uh, an archetype. So uh, I think this is what this means. Uh, we're using this archetype. We, I could take a Disney princess or any kind of Disney story and ruin anyone's story by saying, this is just like this. They're telling you a story. And here's what happens next. But that's uh, pretty common. But uh, there's not a lot of arguing in the interrogation room. If there is, you're, it's probably not a good interrogator. Yeah, so for me, that if, if that's if that's the nature of the question, if that's the spirit of the question, then then that is, do you ever do you ever use and pay attention to people's symbolism when they're talking to you? And it's like, yeah, absolutely, because that is the symbols that they're creating and the way that they're placing those symbols are are a result of the culture that they're in, and 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 well, which is usually more a result of the culture that they're in because they're social mammals. So they've, they've come up with this stuff by listening to other people and using, as Chase was saying, these, these archetypal symbols. But, th but then would I start playing around with the logic of it? Well, yeah, I guess you could, you could start creating logical arguments and start to destroy the f potential fallacies of their, of their, of, of their archetypes. Yeah. But, but I'm I'm trying to make sense of the question. I'm I'm trying to help with the question here and make and make it into a question I could understand. And it may not be your sure. question. So so it's very interesting to me. But you might be sitting there going, Mark, what on Man. earth are you talking about? That's not what you I'm talking about. Yeah. Deep in that one, Mark. You well, this one's good for <laughs> Scott um, because you've already got the shirt. Um, how do you? Um, let me see. Someone you know is lying. How do you keep them from getting defensive? You don't question about the lie. You want as much information as you can get so you don't go, what are you talking about? Wait a minute. Don't stop them. Let them lie. Get as much information as you can because pretty soon you're going to start asking about it and they're going to 
push against you most likely. Or you can so say something like, you know what, uh, Eric, I, I've known you a very long time and we've talked to each other a thousand times. If there's one thing I can tell when you and I are talking, it's when I'm not getting the whole story. So was there something that upset you or you were, you didn't want to talk about because you were afraid it was going to hurt my feelings. So I'll basically do a confrontation that way. So you still confront them if you need to, I'd say, or how is it? Yeah. How is it? I've never heard that story. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see. Question for all. Do you ever just interview people at length for the purpose of paralleling them to, sus to subjects in the future? Um, do you have a library eclipse of regional accents and movements? I'm going to go to Mark. Yeah. Do you ever into, uh, yeah. So I guess the question there is, would I, wow. would I, or we collect, I guess, content that we'd be able to use when stuff comes up? Yeah. I think, I, I don't know. I can't, I don't. That's um, how the brain works. Yeah. So I got a head full of the stuff. And so in my mind, I go, Oh, I saw this thing. I remember this thing and it's in my head and I'll, I'll, I'll describe it. Do I have a collection of regional accents? Well, yeah, in, in my, in my head, I mean, I'm from Britain, from the UK where, where an accent will change over just several miles in a very, very small country. And so you absolutely need to know, the accent that you're hearing so you understand how you're going to be judged and how you're most likely going to judge them because it will place you in a certain class, a certain specific area. I understand we had a civil war not, not that long ago where neighbor killed neighbor across the whole country. So you really have to understand who am I listening to uh, because there's though the, it might, might not be true that you're going to get killed by your neighbor, there is still a culture of that. Or do not trust the person in the village next door. So... So, yeah, I mean, because of my culture, I have all of that filed away in my head of who to watch out for and who's your friend and who's your who's your enemy. That's all I can say. A good say. example or a good thing to add to this was, was yesterday we were talking about or whenever we did this last show, we were all talking and, and Chase and I were all trying, trying to do our British accents. And Mark goes, well, that sounds like it's from this place. I can't do a very good one, but yeah. Chase can do a pretty good one. And so he'll, he'll start doing not only that accent, but the accent of the people that live around that accent. It's the weirdest. He came up and just shot out like 12 of them. This one's this one. He goes, and there's that accent. And here's this one, mate. And mm. Does that one. And, and so he always has gas does... between. Sorry, say that again, Eric. He always farts in between. No, I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's Birmingham. That's a Birmingham accent. They do, you know, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Birmingham. Sorry, Birmingham. Oh, well, there goes that subscriber a lot. <laughs> I didn't mean Birmingham. I meant Wolverhampton, obviously. Uh, oh, okay, and name a few like, more. Oh, much more, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Wolverhampton. Just keep digging. <laughs> Sorry, Wolverhampton. We'll eventually get the whole country. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, on that note, um, it, this is just a general one. Uh, have any of you just met a character and you're like, I need to talk to this person more because I've never met anybody quite like this? Or or there's somebody you've always envisioned or wondered about and you just hang out with them just to experience what they're like? Yeah. Yeah, that's... 40% of my friends are that way. Just characters. I mean, that's, that's those, those, they're fascinating in the way they approach things, the way they talk about things and describe things. Yeah. That's and 20 yeah, of them I, are Kyle Dunnigan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great, perfect example. Perfect example. You know? So yeah, it's, yeah, I, lo I love, I love those types of people who are just zoned in on one thing. And that's Kyle isn't that way, but, but people who have have one, they're a character. They are a, and everything they are and do revolves around that thing. But they can't help it because that's what they are. Dang it, I love that. It's one of my favorite things, and I seek them out. It's <laughs> horrible as that sounds. No, I mean, all right. Um, question for Greg and Chase: How would you go about interrogating a person who has similar experience slash training to you? You gotta you gotta lean heavy on evidence. Or print out a bunch of fake evidence, but then it's it's pretty that. difficult. <laughs> Is that have everybody watch the Russell Williams interview with Jim Smith, essentially? Well, yeah, but I will tell you this. He was not an interrogator trained, he was just resistance trained. When you add the mm. two, we know what we're looking at when we're talking to somebody, and it's a constant dance. If you were, if I were interrogating someone, if Chase and I were interrogating each other, 
he's dead on. We'd have to use facts. We'd have to use a tremendous amount of backstory and all of that to try to figure it out. The closest I got was there was an Iraqi interrogator held by the resistance in Kuwait. And I wanted my hands on that guy so bad. They wouldn't let me have him. So yeah. Heavy evidence or heavy theater. Yep. Which would be a whole nother discussion, but yeah. And, and then that guy should be able to recognize the theater. The two of us would recognize it from a, a mile away and you would, you know what to look for. You know what the approaches are. You know what the, what resistance techniques, all of that, that the person's going to try to use. So I think you're dead on chase. It would take a lot of mechanics to make it work. That'd be fun to watch. <laughs> would be a dance. <clears throat> All right, Brilliant on the Basics was a Navy MCON, MC pawn program that failed miserably in the goat locker. Okay. This sounds I, dirty. Thank thank sounds like it's for time. Chase. I think Chase knows <laughs> what it is. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I, I think the phrase is fantastic. I have no idea how it affected the Navy, and I don't give a crap. But I think the, fa the phrase is fantastic, that just mastering these things that are the foundational, the base of the pyramid, we need to master that first and then start moving up. Okay, hold on. Let me see if this is. Um, I mean, that's not really a question; it's a statement. Thank you for the super chat, though. Um, well, I'm under pressure. Pamela's going to yell at me because yeah, I have yeah, a question. Come on, Pamela. Like, get him. Get Come him. on, Pamela. What do you he's got? Ridiculous, Eric. It. Come on, Pamela. Get in there. I head. know. Look, he's down. He's he's down. I know. I'm chase. Uh, I'm taking forever here. Um, is it strange that someone is upset about you? What have the same hobbies or like hobbies, the same color? Think, yeah. Is it strange someone is upset about you? Oh, I see what yeah. she's saying. Is it like if if oh, chase habits. and I both like sales or you know sailboats or something? Oh, like, okay, would I mean, feel weird about chase habit, like habits, the same things I do. Like Cialdini, like if, if the salesperson's coming up to you and everything you say, I guess um, they go, oh, yeah, my cousin is. Da, da, no, she's da, da, da. what she's talking about is this. She's saying, oh. is, 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 see, um, yes, that's strange. is it odd if somebody likes the very same things you do, likes the very, likes the very same food you do, the same colors, everything, I think when you first meet them. So wow. that that would be a bunch of things to watch out for. That's why. Oh, it is Cialdini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, well, okay. yeah, and also at the same point, you got to understand that it, part of part of a relationship process is usually infatuation at the start, and unconsciously you will start liking what the other person likes, and it'll happen really, really quickly. And then, and then only over time you'll realize that you have you're now in a relationship with a complete alien, and now. And, and now you have to manage that situation because the brain is designed to, to match up with people and to, and to resonate. To, so, so don't always expect that just because somebody is unconsciously liking the same things as you're liking, that there's something nefarious going on. There's just something often human going on. Hmm. Well, yeah, yeah. you're not going to pick um, if somebody's into football, you'd be like, oh, I hate football. That's the worst sport in the world. Golf is the best thing. Is that what you're saying? You, kind you of will unconsciously start to like football. And then, and then, uh, you know, six months, a year into it, when you're in this stronger relationship, you'll go, would you want to go to the football? And the other person will go, actually, I don't like it very much. And you'll go, well, I thought you loved football. <laughs> It's like, no, I, I really, well, why did you tell me that then? Well, I don't know why I told you. I don't know. Well, how can I trust anything you say? Well, I don't, I don't understand. It's just like, you, you just, you're just dealing with the unconscious mind, which is designed to get on with people more than it's designed not to get on with them, especially when you're trying to find a mate. So, so this happens in relationships I like that. all the time. It's called infatuation. That little... <laughs> it comes, with a, comes with a sound as well, Chase. And the sound is free. That costs. Sound is free with it. Well, I've got you, Mark. Question for Mark. Yeah. What do you think about Toastmasters for body language communication? Um, I, I, I don't particularly rate it for body language communication because in my experience, what I've seen in sessions or meetings that I have been invited along to is it is for my money, overly prescriptive around, around that and prescriptive of some elements which I think are not helpful. However, mm. what I think it is really good at is getting a group together on a regular basis to tackle 
the, the, the trouble with public speaking, which is social, social pressure and anxiety. And if you can get together in a group on a regular basis to deal with your fears, that's a really, really good thing. So I think it's, it's more useful than it is unuseful. But if I was looking for specifically body language training, I would not be going to Toastmasters for specifically that. That's more for a presentation or practicing speaking and that sort of thing, right? Well, but body language is part of that. Nonverbal is a super important part. Sure. I mean, you know, otherwise I wouldn't have a job. I had, I would have that. <laughs> so obviously, I'm a little bit biased around this. I just think it's fair to say, from my point of view, that Toastmasters doesn't do that very, very well. But I, I personally don't get together groups of people on a regular basis to tackle this, and they do, and that's actually super useful uh really useful i don't do that because i'm not the kind of person that can organize that kind of thing or likes to be around a lot of people on a regular basis to be honest. but is there a worry and i guess where i go with it is you know sometimes you can learn bad habits from something is that is toastmaster something that you'll have to wind up getting people to unlearn or have to train them out of, or is it relatively harmless? You're saying it's not to be all end all, but it's a good start for. No, I've, I've gone position. along to. I've been invited along to Toastmasters things, and I've gone along because I want to see what these things are like. And I've and I've stood up and I've said, "Hey, let me show you some stuff about body language." And they've gone, "Oh, wow, that is like the total opposite of what we're being told to do." And I go, mm -hmm. "Yeah, you're right. Who do you prefer? Me doing what you." been told to do or me doing what I'm saying you should do and they go well it's much better when we do what you're doing and I go okay we'll do that then and that's all the training they need like you can see which is better do what is better you don't need to unlearn anything just do okay. the better thing I'm not saying what you're doing is bad I'm just saying what I'm telling you to do it's better and you know that so do that there's no unlearning required it's just right. it's just empirical obviousness all right this has popped up quite a bit and I think it's a probably an important one here for dating. Are there any great questions to ask to find red flags or anything to look for in um, social media, dating profiles, things like that? Uh, types of pets, no family photos, selfies, etc. If somebody has a horse, run. It's going to take yeah, all your yeah. money. Pictures, <laughs> pictures of people, hands on a horse is always. Yeah. <laughs> it take all your money. The, the biggest thing I go ahead. No, go ahead, Greg. Right. I just stepped on you. Yeah, no, the biggest thing I think you find with people, the thing I'm always cautious of with red flags, and I don't mean just romantic relationships, is anyone who falls in love like that with you, be careful, be very careful. And I don't mean just in a romantic relationship. I know people who in platonic relationships are in love that quickly, and they just overwhelm the person because they need so much from that person. They're probably good folks who do that, but most of those relationships implode under the pressure fairly quickly. So and then I would say most of their friends don't live in that city or most of their friends are in another state. So they don't have any nearby close friends. They don't reflect empathy on their face. If you're excited, their eyebrows don't move. If you're talking about your sick aunt, they don't show any sadness on their face. And most of all, watch very closely. If the only time they get hyper focused or very interested in the conversation is when you're discussing something vulnerable about yourself that's probably going to be weaponized later. I'd it's say watch out for people who, who give you, who have too many selfies of themselves. Cause there've been a couple of studies on, on narcissists and uh, people who do a lot of selfies. So I'd, I'd pay attention to that. Make sure they don't have a whole ton of those. I have one. I don't know if it's good, but um, I always say, watch how they treat the staff like waiters and other yeah, people sure. when you're out. Sure. Yep. Um, Congrats to the behavior panel. You passed 30 million views total. Amazing. Right. Wow. Happened today. We, I didn't even know that. Yeah. I didn't either. I didn't either. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I, Thanks, listen, I, I wrote it down on Thanks. a note to say, look, we got to we got to let people know that we did 30 million views. And and, Thanks, and Mark. Dan. Thanks, Dan. Going, hey. Thank you, you Dan. 30 million. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, hey, Thanks, hey guys. Dan. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a fun ride. And thank you, Eric, for getting us all together. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm honored to know you. Um, oh, this is a good one for Chase. Ever use background music or sound in, inter in interrogatories? Yes, I typically will go to a. This will get. I'll see if I can wrap this into sixty seconds. <laughs> There's something called binaural beats. 
Oh yeah, I have to. to use this, you need headphones on. So, mm -hmm. which you probably won't have in an interrogation room. And it's more binaural beats are not very effective for interrogation. You're more likely to be beneficial from a neuroscience perspective using something called isochronic tones, which turns on and off at a certain frequency. But the frequency that's that's playing turning on and off is called the carrier frequency. And you want to talk into an app, figure out the frequency of your voice and make that the carrier of that isochronic tone. Right. Chase Hughes, that's all, that's all Chase Hughes. And now, yeah, yeah. Now I'm sitting here going, okay, so um, everybody take notes, rewind it four times, go start looking up the definitions of every word, and <laughs> we'll go on to the next one, which is an important one, actually. Chase, remind me to tell you a story. This has started your show. Mm -hmm. Will you be doing the Tiger King 2? Tiger King 1 is how you started. I think I we should have so. Carol Baskin on as a guest panelist. Carol, that if you're good. watching, <laughs> give us a join us. I, I can reach out to her. Yeah, yeah you, you, can. Can. you can. You can. How can. to get a hold of Chase? I have my shoulder to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> well, who right. would we who would we analyze if we brought her on? Maybe we could Joe Exotic. Who cares? We could analyze him with her on. That would be fun. Oh, that would be wild. Well, thank you, Sadie R. This is not panel. Hi, Sadie. Thanks, Sadie. Uh, all right. Thanks. So great show as always. Thank you. Trying to make sure there's no somewhere for chats. I'm looking to see if there's one question. Come on, Pam. Pam uh, here's the on. uh the twins or triplets. Yeah, I love that one. The cray footage for sure. That's a great yeah, we should look at that. Yeah. I, and I wonder if there are any who were ever arrested. That would be an inter and that would be a question too. Would you interview them together or separately or do both? Because twins react off each other in different ways yeah. than we're used to right and i don't know i i, I okay I, I want to delve into that a little bit and just question with you because if you're dealing with twins would you want to have more than one interrogator also so you could both be observing one or the other to maybe because it's hard to track everything that's going on at the same time correct well two things number one most interrogations are best separated when you bring them back together it's for a purpose a very specific purpose and you typically don't interrogate people together just because um, there are times that you might bring some of them together and force them to conflict and go at each other's stories especially though especially somebody who knows someone as well as a twin would know the other person because now the subtlety of their relationship and the microculture they can talk we talk to each other with our hands across the screen they can talk in ways you can't see and they can share details that way. So you'd be very cautious bringing people together in that interview. That's it'd just be a nightmare, nightmare for prisoners' dilemma too. Thinking so about this, if you were to go down the line of of which some twins feel, which is they are one entity, they are one person in two, you could go down the line that says you're never really interviewing any one of them unless you interview both. Mm. But that would be just a way of thinking about it, which could be true or false. But certainly to critically think this, there is an argument that says if you only interview one of them, you've interviewed none of them. <laughs> okay, so maybe interview them separately and then bring them in together and interview them together to see how they yeah. react. Yeah, and then and then like add something else for fun. Like, you know. Like a monkey, just for like our <laughs> balloon animals. <laughs> yeah, okay, but yeah. but if it's quadruplets, then you give up because you run no, out. I think I, just I think I think all bets are off now. Now it's now it's a three a.m. milk run. If it's if it's <laughs> if it's quadruplets, it's like I'm getting in the car. Let's go get milk. Uh, Carol, super Mark did not mean to say that. We're happy to have you. <laughs> yeah, on. Carol, I will not. Yeah. It is, honestly, if you come on, I will not mention the three a.m. milk run. I'll bring my. Own You'll milk. be on his best behavior. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mark, will you give her $200 worth of milk as she comes on? I totally will. Oh, I totally <laughs> will. I totally will. There I'll deliver it myself. You've been challenged. <laughs> All right, Carol, All right, let's um, do this. You've been challenged. The Investigation Discovery Channel apparently has a long series on evil twins. So you wow. can maybe get there material there. There you go. Greg, take right. note. I did already. Uh, all right. Um, thank you, guys. Answered exactly what I was curious about. Okay. To hell with absolutists. That's I good. agree with Jimmy Cracking Corn. Yeah. And let's see. Let's see if we can get one more question. <laughs> I got to do this one. Right. We'll close on this. Question to whomever. 
What's up with the way Robert Barnes sits in his oversized leather chair, arms outstretched, never moves them, always stationary? He thinks he's that Captain lets you... Kirk. That's the thing. He thinks that he's lets... Captain Kirk and, and the guy from from uh, the... the... <laughs> yeah. No, that lets you know you never want him to be against you. You want to friend up with that guy. Trust me. You want to be friends with Barnes. Whatever it takes, send him cigars, whatever it is. That that says you don't ever want to be on the other side of the table from that guy. And yeah, we've had dinner with Barnes three or four times. We've we've eaten with Barnes a lot. He's like that in real life. He'll sit across yeah. the table yeah. the exact same way. Yeah, man. And so like me and Chase just, are like there's this. No act. No, and Chase and I are like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, I've never met Barnes. Hi there, Barnes. Uh, but but in my view, it is it is Captain Kirk and Hannibal from the A team. That's what he's doing. He's doing both of those together. It's fantastic. It's a great rouse. You're, you're gonna love him. You're gonna love him. He may not Unless see me a... now. He may not want to meet me now. I've said that. No more oh, sidebar for Mark Bowden. No. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Greg. Exactly. You, you have an answer? Yeah. No. Yeah. I think it's just. Everybody has an image. Everybody gets to where they get and comfortable in who they are, and that's his. That's confidence. Yeah. Yeah, I'll go with the joy catcher on that. Well, maybe he just he's himself and makes chair. no maybe apologies. He just had that chair. Yeah. He's he's just comfortable like, in who he is. He's yeah. Got a chair. You just know you just nailed it. Uh the joy catcher. He he knows who he is. That's for dang sure. And makes no apologies. And on that note. Mm -hmm. We don't know who you are, but we know who your channel is. And thank you all so very, very much. And if you ha if you haven't subscribed to these guys, you're completely crazy, all 999 of you. <laughs> and got one more super chat. Thank you. Somebody's hey, up at 3 a.m. Hey, we know Kay. Well played. Thanks, Kay. Hi, Kay. Thank you. Thanks, and Kay. All of you, thank you. Thanks, man.